TV here on C-SPAN 2. On Capitol Hill yesterday, the House Government Reform Committee held another hearing into subpoenaed White House email. The panel is examining a computer glitch in the archiving system at the White House and why some email was never turned over to investigators. Testifying from the White House, the director of the Office of Administration and a computer specialist. Also, Assistant Attorney General Robert Rabin. Today's hearing was 5 hours and 20 minutes. everybody take their seats please good morning a quorum being present the committee on government reform will come to order i ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record without objection so ordered i ask unanimous consent that all articles exhibits and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record without objection so ordered i ask unanimous consent that the binder of exhibits that have been prepared for the hearing and shared with minority staff prior to the hearing be entered into the record and without objection so ordered I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between majority and minority and without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes divided equally between the majority and minority, without objection, so order. This week, we will hold our third and fourth days of hearings into the White House's failure to deal with the email problem and their failure to comply with subpoenas. Today, we will focus on what was happening in the Office of Administration. Tomorrow, we will focus on what was happening at the White House Counsel's Office. We just had a two-week recess, but we're pushing ahead with this investigation. We're conducting interviews, we're reviewing documents, we're learning more as we go along. We've been working on this investigation for a little over two months now, and it's very interesting to watch how the White House behaves in these situations. The White House is behaving exactly the way they do when they know they've done something wrong and they've been caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They're dusting off all of their old tricks that they used in 1997 and 1998 during the illegal campaign fundraising investigation. They turn over embarrassing documents late on Friday evening. They selectively leak problem documents over the weekend. It just happened again last weekend. They claim bogus privileges over the documents as a stalling tactic. People refuse to be interviewed prior to hearings. You may not admire their tactics, but you have to admire their consistency. When we held our first hearing with the Northrop Grumman and contractors, I tried to put this email problem into context. I went through a whole litany of the White House stalling tactics that we had endured, refusing to turn over documents until we got fed up and scheduled a contempt vote the failure to turn over the White House videotapes, withholding documents in the White House database investigation, claiming false privileges to delay document production. Instead of going through the whole laundry list again today, I think what I'll do is just let them speak for themselves in their own words. A new book has just come out, Truth at Any Cost. It was written by a Washington Post reporter and a Time Magazine reporter. They found out a lot about the way the White House operated. Harold Ickes, who was the deputy chief of staff, is quoted as calling the White House approach a foot-dragging, screw-you attitude approach. He apparently said it, said it with a great deal of admiration. And I cleaned up that quote just a little bit for the hearing room. But I think you get the picture. So they drag their feet, they try to run out the clock, and then they blame the investigators for being partisan and taking so long. There was another book about the White House written by Elizabeth Drew. She quoted another White House lawyer Don Goldberg, here's what he had to say, quote, it's an obvious strategy. On the Hill, if you don't have much to go on, you decry the partisanship, and the print reporters will write in the first or second paragraph, and the TV stories will begin, 
in a hearing mired in partisanship, and then they get to the subject of the hearing, and you won. That's damage control 101. He goes on to say, quote, in a hearing, if you're playing defense, the goal is not to get your message out. The goal is to keep the other side from getting their message out. Then you won. Well, that may be damage control 101, but it's not public service 101. What I don't understand is, is why it is that the White House spends so much time figuring out how to spin things when the facts aren't on their side and so little time trying to do things right in the first place. I'm going to spend more time talking about this tomorrow. We have four White House lawyers on the schedule to testify. Former White House Counsel Charles Ruff, former Deputy Counsel Cheryl Mills, Mark Lindsay from the Office of Administration, and Associate Counsel Dimitri Neonakis. But today we're going to focus on the Office of Administration. We've reviewed a lot of documents at this point. We've interviewed some people. We haven't been able to interview others. We're starting to piece together the threads of what was happening. Hopefully by the end of this hearing we'll have a clearer picture. Here are a few of the key points that are starting to emerge. Point number one, the Northrop Grumman employees were threatened. This is becoming more and more clear. On March 23rd, five Northrop Grumman employees testified here. They said they were called to a meeting right after they discovered that thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of emails hadn't been searched for subpoena compliance. So they, said, they said they were ordered to keep it a secret. They said they were ordered not even to tell their supervisors or, or spouses. Some said they were threatened. One said he was told that there was a jail cell with his name on it. The White House officials, Laura Callahan, or formerly Laura Crabtree, and Mark Lindsay denied all of that. On Monday, we interviewed a higher level Northrop Grumman supervisor this past Monday, Joseph Lucente. He was three rungs up the ladder from the Northrop Grumman employees at the White House. In September 1998, he met with three of the contractors who were at the meeting with Mrs. Callahan and Mr. Lindsay. They had a long discussion about what happened. This was about three months later. So we asked Mr. Lucente, did your employees feel threatened? And last Monday, he said yes. Were they prevented from talking to their superiors? Last Monday, he said yes. Were they concerned that documents weren't being searched to comply with subpoenas? Last Monday, he said yes. So once again, we have contemporaneous testimony that what, was, what they said was true. Point number two, we're getting more and more evidence that people wanted to get this problem fixed, and they couldn't get anyone to approve fixing it. Northrop Grumman was trying to get it fixed. Tony Berry was trying to get it fixed. Other people wanted to get, to get it fixed, but they couldn't get anyone higher up in the food chain to approve it. We have a whole series of emails from Tony Berry. He was frustrated. I'm going to read a couple of the messages. August 13th, 1998, quote, as far as I can tell, there's no movement underway to fix the problem and recover the lost records from the backup tapes. Tapes, does that sound familiar? I am not at all clear what my role should be. I feel that the records must be recreated and any searches need to be reperformed if the requesters feel it is necessary. This seems like a daunting proposition, but I do not see any other alternative, end quote. September 10th, 1998, quote, I am growing increasingly concerned about the seemingly lack of movement on the mail two problem. Do you know where the holdup is? We have known about this problem for four months now, and not a single record has been passed to arms. Even worse, the root problem has not been fixed." End quote. September 25th, 1998. Quote, it has been about two weeks since I sent my last concern memo regarding the mail two problem, and I'm still not seeing any movement on fixing the problem. I need to know for my own sanity, sanity, exactly what my role in this project should be, end quote. It seems clear that Mr. Berry knew that the Presidential Records Act wasn't being followed, and he was trying to get someone to pay attention to it. He was also the guy who was responsible for conducting email searches when subpoenas came in, and he knew they weren't being done correctly, and he was probably worried about that and the compliance with the subpoenas. Point number three. There was a hearing coming up before the Appropriations Committee in March of 1999, and they were not sure how to handle it. Mark Lindsay, the director of the Office of Administration, testified at that hearing in 1999. The White House email problem never came up, but the documents seemed to indicate that there was a long debate over whether to ask Congress for money to fix the problem. 
if they asked for the money and they got it, then they could get the problem fixed. But it was a double-edged sword. If they revealed the problem by asking for the money, then Congress would know that document requests and subpoenas had not been complied with. We have a copy of an email from Carl Heisner, who's here today. And I hope you'll put uh, exhibit number 81 up on the screen. And here's what it says, quote, while I'll be glad to write up something related to the information request channeled to us via White House counsel in response to various requests from Congress and litigants against the government, we may not want to call undue attention to the issue by bringing the issue to the attention of Congress because, and then the sentence kind of ends, there's no period, and it looks like there may be some words erased there, but it says we may not want to bring the issue bringing the issue to the attention of Congress because, and then it kind of drifts off, and then the sentence ends, and then the next paragraph it states, quote, last year's hours consumed by SID staff amounts to only a little over 500. This year's hours consumed so far amounts to only 65, and the level of requests appears to be declining. And then he concludes by saying, let sleeping dogs lie. I think translated that means let's keep a lid on this and don't let Congress or the independent councils know about it. Well, I don't like the sound of that. When I hear that kind of talk from a political appointee, it's disappointing, but I've come to expect it. When I hear it from a career employee, something's wrong. So we'd like to know what Mr. Heisner was talking about here. And then there was a lot of flack, a lot, a lot of back and forth on, on the talking points. Mark Lindsay would use if, uh, if this came up at a hearing. It seems that some versions were more candid than others. We have another email from Mr. Heisner. He's offering some edits to the talking points. And I'd like to have Exhibit 92 put up on the screen. Hope we can see that. My gosh, it's small. Wonder why we can't get that stuff blown up. At first, he basically states, here's the current, listen to this. At first, he basically states, here's the current version of the talking points, and then he lists it. Then he states, there's the more nearly accurate version. The more nearly accurate version. Well, who's putting together inaccurate talking points? And if this, if this is the more nearly accurate version, where's the really accurate version? The bigger, more important question is, why didn't the White House just come clean and tell Congress about the problem, as well as the independent counsels? Now Carl Heisner was not the decision maker in all this. I don't know him. We haven't been able to interview him. I'm just going to assume that he's a great human being and a dedicated public servant. But there are some serious issues here that need to be addressed. There was a lot going on, and we need to understand it. Point number four, the White House Counsel's Office got a second briefing on the email problem. During the last hearing we held, we learned that Mr. Ruff got a briefing on the email problem from Mark Lindsay on June 19th of 1998. We talked to Mr. Ruff. We've had testimony from Beth Nolan. We've been told there was a, quote, disconnect. Mr. Ruff and the counsel's office did not understand how serious the problem was. Now get that. Subpoenas have been issued by our committee, by other committees, and the independent counsels, but they didn't understand how serious all these missing emails were. Last week we interviewed Mark Lyle. He's now the director of the Office of Administration. He moved up to Mark Lindsay's job when Mark Lindsay got a promotion. Mr. Lyle told us that there was a second briefing for the counsel's office, but that was news to us. He stated that in the spring of 1999, he was informed of the second email problem, the letter D problem. He told, told Mark Lindsay about it. Mark Lindsay told him that he had briefed the counsel's office. Who did he talk to at the counsel's office? We don't know yet. Mr. Lindsay will be back tomorrow and we'll ask him. But the point is there was a second briefing in less than a year and still no action was taken to correct the problem to inform Congress or the Justice Department or the independent councils. So there's a second briefing, you know, and they still didn't tell anybody about it. Was there a second disconnect? Did the council's office understand it the second time around and just decide not to do anything about it? Those are questions I hope we can resolve tomorrow. Now let me just end up by concluding in my opening statement that for almost two years the White House knew that the subpoenas weren't being complied with and nothing was done about it until it appeared on the front page of the Washington Times and my committee started interviewing people. Somebody should be accountable for that. You know, Richard Nixon was run out of office 
for 18 and a half minutes of tapes. We had a president run out of office because of the missing tapes, 18 and a half minutes. Here we have hundreds of thousands of emails, and the White House has stonewalled the Justice Department, the Congress, several independent counsels, all of whom were interested in what might be in those emails. And not only did the White House know about them, but they've covered it up over the past two years. And there was not just one meeting about this, there were two meetings at different times. The American people ought to be outraged. If Richard Nixon was run out of office for 18 minutes of tapes, what does that mean about the media and the reporting of all this when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of emails? And the White House is now saying, well, it may take six or eight months for them to get a contractor to get all this whipped into shape. We believe in a matter of weeks we could hire a contractor to pick out specific words and names and get these emails, the ones that are relevant to various investigations, to the various independent councils, the Justice Department, and our committee in a short period of time. But the White House has said they've hired contractors and it's going to take six to eight months. Do you know when the election is? It's in November. And so they're going to try to once again run out the clock. Mr. Heisner and Mr. Lyle, I want to thank you for being here. I'm sure that you'd rather be someplace else. However, I hope that you'll be direct and straightforward and try to help us understand what's going on. We'll also hear from Assistant Attorney General Robert Ra Raven on our second panel. We have a number of questions for Mr. Rabin about the Justice Department's role in this matters and subpoenas we've issued for Justice Department documents. I hope we can make some headway with Mr. Rabin today. I now yield to Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, in the spirit of trying to expedite these hearings, I won't make an opening statement. It's certainly nowhere near an opening statement the length of that, you, that which you just delivered. But I do want to point out before we begin that your opening statement was filled with inaccuracies and omissions that I think distort the uh, facts of the issue before us today. And I, and I, was, I was taken aback by your, your close because not only are you rewriting the events with regard to the White House emails, you've rewritten history with regard to why Richard Nixon was impeached by the House and forced to resign. It was not because of 18 uh, minutes of missing tape. Now, I, I know that there are many people who are disappointed you can't run this president out of the White House because the Constitution requires you have a reason to do it more than the fact that you dislike him enormously. I, I look forward to the testimony of our witness today. I, I, want, I want us to get the facts, and then we'll see what the conclusions we can draw from the facts. What we've heard were a lot of conclusions and I know you're trying to see if the facts will fit your conclusions, but let's evaluate it uh, on uh, the testimony we're to receive. And I look forward to hearing from our, our witness. Yield back to my uh, time. We'll now welcome our first panel to the witness table, Carl Heisner and Marco Lyle. Would you please stand and raise your right hand, please? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I'll be I do. Do either one of you have an opening statement? Mr. Heisner, you want to start? I had an opening statement which I delivered to uh, deliver Can you yesterday. pull the mic a little closer uh, to you, Mr. You, Heisner, please? I'm sorry. I have an opening statement which I delivered uh, to the committee yesterday, uh, which you included in the uh, in your record. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for me to read it unless you wish me to. So you want to let your uh, prepared statement uh, speak for itself? Correct, sir. Okay. Mr. Lyle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. I do not have a written opening statement that I submitted, but I do want to emphasize to you that um, I have cooperated with your committee, as has my staff. Uh, I participated in a almost four-hour interview with five of your attorneys uh, before I came here to this committee uh, to testify here again, and I'm prepared to answer any questions uh, that you may have in an effort to cooperate uh, in, in this matter. Uh, I know that my uh, staff members, at least 10 maybe 12 members of my staff have also been requested for interviews, and I know that they are working with your attorneys to do that. So I, I want to emphasize to you that um, we are working and endeavoring to cooperate with you as best we can. Does that conclude your opening statement? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Heisner, uh, 
I appreciate that you aren't a political appointee. Uh, this isn't easy, and I want to thank you for being here. We're hoping that uh, you would be available for an interview before this hearing, but uh, evidently he was not available for a hearing, is that, or for an interview, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, could we, uh, could I ask you to identify uh, the third party at the table, uh, who he is, who, if he's representing yes, uh, somebody? Yes, uh, are you the legal counsel for Mr. Heisner? My name is John Swirling, and I'm legal counsel for Mr. Heisner. Okay, thank you. Uh, explain well, to anyhow, him. Mr. Heisner evidently was not available for, uh, for uh, questioning by the uh, counsel for the committee. Uh, let's get right to the question. Sometime in November of 1998, you were given the responsibilities of uh, managing phase two of the mail two project. Uh, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Pull the mic as uh, close we, to you I'm as you sorry. can, because it doesn't pick up very well. Uh, we, uh, a number of us uh, that were involved or had uh, responsibilities related to that particular uh, issue uh, met, and it was agreed that the responsibility for the recovery for developing the software to perform the recovery of unrecords managed records uh, would be a responsibility of the Systems Integration and Development Branch, uh, which I was heading at the time. So that was in November 1998? That's correct, sir. Well, what was uh, phase two of the Mail 2 project? Uh, they, they, when, when you take a look at the record, there are a number of phases, one, twos, and threes. I believe uh, at that instance, uh, in that instance, the uh, phase two was understood to be the development of an application of software, of a system that would uh, take the backup tapes that had been taken over previous uh, months and years, uh, would take those backup tapes and bring them back onto a computer and then extract from the data that was restored the email messages which had not been records managed. Was it not also to uh, make sure that future e incoming uh, emails were archived? Uh, that particular project would not address the uh, ensuring that, that future records would be archived. That was a separate process. The White House took steps to meet its legal obligations uh, to produce documents only after this committee began to investigate. Why did Congress have to hold hearings to get the White House to uh, give us those inf that information and do the right thing? I have no knowledge of the rationale behind that, sir. Well, you were the chief technician. Did you ever feel frustrated that the White House didn't do anything in 1998 or 1999 to comply with our subpoenas and give us the information? I have, it's difficult for me to, to imagine that we didn't uh, comply with subpoenas. At the time, the uh, recovery of the records was a responsibility of mine, and uh, at the time, my concerns were that we would develop an application that would uh, recover the data. Uh, the concern subsequently became to make sure that the backup tapes which had been taken uh, were not being recycled or reused uh, so that the data eventually could be recovered. Eventually? Yes, sir. Did you feel that a lot of progress was being made to solve the problem in 1999? Uh, by 1999, the uh, the problem of those 400, 500 accounts which had not been encoded properly and uh, therefore the incoming email that was coming in from outside the complex had not been records managed, uh, had been corrected. Uh, at the time, the uh, contractor staff, uh, Northrop Grumman staff, was involved in developing some software that would make sure that the system functioned properly and there would be no more on records, non records managed uh, emails. Can you tell me why it took congressional hearings to force the White House to make an effort to solve the email problem? No, sir, I can't. Uh, put up Exhibit 81 on the screen, please. Oh, excuse me. Before we get that, Mr. Lyle. Can you tell me why it took congressional hearings to force the White House to make an effort to solve the email problem? Uh, I don't believe that it took congressional hearings uh, to have the White House solve any email problem, sir. Why wasn't Congress notified about the email problem? Why didn't we get any of the information we subpoenaed? And why didn't the independent counsel? And why didn't the Justice Department? 
I'm not aware of the communications that occurred between the White House Counsel's Office and this committee relative to... You didn't know anything about the subpoenas that we'd sent for all kinds of information involving a number of investigations? Sir, I joined the Executive Office of the President in November of 1998, so I have no personal knowledge Did you that. have any communication at all with the, with the uh, Counsel's Office? During what time frame, sir? During the, since you were hired. Since I've been hired? Well, That's certainly I've been. had communications with White House counsels. Well, you knew there was an email problem. Did you ever ask, or did they, did they ever, uh, you talked to them about the email problem, didn't you? My, um, my most vivid recollection of learning about the email two uh, problem that you're referring to uh, yeah. was in around April of 1999, in connection, as you mentioned in your opening statement, sir, with, with the letter D issue. Yeah. That's in the context of that particular discussion. Or I know, but did you talk to the to the to the uh, council's office at all about the email problem? At Anybody any in the council's office? I have had communication. Okay, well, if you talk to the people in the council's office, did did they say anything about subpoenaed documents from any of the independent councils or our committee or justice? There was a briefing that I participated in in January of this year, January 2000. So, where, so where when I did you, discussed when did you, that issue, sir. When did you come to work for them? For the for executive the office House? of the president, yeah. I joined in November of 1998. In 98? And yes, when sir. did you assume the position that you had? I assumed that position on January 30th of this year. But you were in, involved in the email problem when? The, the email two problem I learned about, as I said, in about April of 1999 in connection with, as I recall, the letter. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a year ago. And, and, and you communicated with the, the counsel's office? No, sir. You did not communicate with the counsel's office? I did not. They knew about the email problem. Did they not talk to you about it at all? I conveyed, as you said in your, your opening statement, I conveyed the information concerning the uh, letter D issue to my superior, Mark Lindsay, who um, okay. spoke with the counsel's office. Uh, put, put up Exhibit 81 on the screen, please. This document was produced to the committee by the White House after our first two hearings on the subject and three weeks past the due date of our subpoenas. As usual, the White House sent it to us late on a Friday night. It appears to be an email from you, Mr. Heisner, but the document lists no recipient. It's dated February 5th, 1998, and there are two lines labeled issue. One reads, mail to reconstruction. The other reads, information requests. Who was the original recipient of this email? Sir, um, I think Exhibit 82 uh, shows to whom this email was sent. The copy that you're looking at in Exhibit 1 uh, was a result of pressing the send key before I had entered the subject and the recipient. Uh, that happened at uh, 0906 on the 5th of February. Uh, on Exhibit 82 is the message that actually was sent to uh, Mrs. Cleo. Mm -hmm. uh, at 0908, and it has the uh, recipient and it has a uh, subject line. And was that the original recipient, Ms. Cleo? That's correct. She was the original yes. recipient. In, how in about, the, in how the about email it? system, Mr. Sir, sir, in the email system we have, it's possible, it's a flaw in the system, it's possible to send an email which has no recipient. Well, why is the recipient not listed on that document? Because it was a mistake. I pressed the send key before I had entered the uh, recipient's name. It was a mistake? Yes, sir. Did you send a blind carbon copy uh, of this email to anyone? Not to my knowledge, sir, no. Not to your knowledge? No, I, I can't tell by looking at this, sir, but I'm certain I didn't send a blind copy to anyone. You're sure you didn't send a blind copy to anyone? I can't be totally sure without looking at the original. The well, it's pretty important because yes, you may is. have I sent one you know, to the counsel's office or something. We just want to know, did, did you send a copy to anybody besides her? To the best of my knowledge, no, sir. You know how many times we've heard, I can't recall, and to the best of my knowledge from witnesses from the White House, I'm, I'm, we ought to get a number of that. It must be in the hundreds. Did anyone else get a copy of this email? Would that be from me, sir, or from anybody else? Well, from you, or from do you, you know if anybody else got a copy of the email? It could have been passed forwarded by the recipient. That's possible, and I would not know if that happened, sir. Did you discuss this email with anyone else? At that time that it was sent, sir? 
Yeah. Frankly, I don't, I don't recall. You don't recall? No. The first paragraph of the document reads, while I'll be glad to write up something related to the information request channel to us, VIA White House counsel in response to various requests from Congress and litigants against the government, we may not want to call, you, you say, we may not want to call undue attention to the issue by bringing the issue to the attention of Congress because, and then it kind of drifts off, the sentence is incomplete. What does that mean? Can, can you get down, uh, please? That particular uh, paragraph, sir, is addressing the uh, issue of information requests uh, during uh, 1997, 98, uh, 99, we had received many requests for information related, related to the White House database. In uh, 1997, we uh, expended on the order of 3,000 or more hours of staff time to uh, retrieve information and make it available and, uh, in response to uh, subpoenas. Uh, during that year, I had spent well over 1,000 hours, at least I recorded over 1,000 hours, and I probably were more, right. in responding to these requests, as you may recall. So what I'm addressing in the issue information requests is the, uh, the question was, should we bring to the attention of Congress, if we're spending an, an enormous amount of time uh, responding to subpoenas and other requests for information related to HUDB, uh, and my re response was, well, we don't really need to bring this issue up again because, and the way this was the original uh, reads, and it doesn't show here, they're bullets, they're little bullets in front of each of those three sentences that start with last year's, this year's, and the level. So the, the uh, memorandum, or the, the uh, text here, had the intention of saying, let's not raise this, we don't need to have things stirred up and have more requests coming in that's really necessary. That, 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 sir, that isn't going to wash because we had already sent subpoenas to the, to the White House, to the Council's office on a whole host of issues, and the law requires that you respond to subpoenas. And for you to say, we may not want to call undue attention to the issue by bringing the issue to the attention of Congress because, and then it drifts off, we had already issued subpoenas. Why is that sentence not complete? Uh, sir, uh, the sentence is complete because it uh, has a because clause and three bullets, which don't show here, a period, and then the uh, infamous uh, quote, still let sleeping dogs lie. Well, tell me, uh, 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 where are the bullet points? We don't see them on it. They don't show on this particular document. Upon why, why don't they show? If, you, if, if the sentence ends at because and there's no bullet points, I mean, and, and there's two vacant lines there. Why is it the bullet points aren't in there? The uh, retrieval mechanism of records managed records does not retrieve all the graphics that are present in the original. There's no period at the end of the sentence. There's no other mark that would indicate that there's three bullet points. No, it, does, it doesn't show in the, in the retreat records. The original does show there's a bullet there, either a lowercase O, in some cases the uh, word I wonder why we the... didn't get that. Why didn't we get that? It, it, we... it is part of the mechanism of retreat. Why didn't we the... get that? You don't know? I don't know. Uh, who asked you to write up something related to information requests? As I recall, I received a telephone call during that week to address these two issues, mail through reconstruction and information requests. From whom? Uh, best I remember, it was the person to whom I was reporting at the time, Mrs. Cleo, Dottie Cleo, who is the associate director for information systems. Why did you want to avoid, uh, you, I think you've answered this, but you said, why did you want to avoid bringing the issue to the attention of Congress because it was going to in involve more work? Uh, my perception was that uh, these uh, requests for information that we received, and, and we certainly executed faithfully the requests, uh, were detracting from our regular work, and if we uh, had fewer of those, we could get the work done that we were there to do. Uh, it wasn't an attempt to say, don't provide the information, it was just say, let's raise this issue. We have, these, these requests have declined, we have not, uh, we did not spend we have not, have not needed to spend more time to respond to them, and I think we're fine here. We what, don't need to ask for money to okay, do okay. pay for this. Let, let's take a minute and go over what we know. People at the White House Office of Administration were concerned that this email problem was not giving, getting solved. Employees felt threatened and intimidated. They were told they couldn't even speak to their bosses, and one was threatened, he thought, with jail.
and two were, as a matter of fact. One was so scared that she said she'd rather be insubordinate than go to jail. Another said there was a jail cell with his name on it. Northrop Grumman wrote several memoranda saying they couldn't proceed without direction from the White House. The president's deputy chief of staff was told about the problem. The counsel to the president, Chuck Ruff, was told about the problem. Later, Mr. Lindsay, who's now an assistant to the president, went back to the White House counsel's office and told them about another problem where documents were not being retrieved. In the White House, this problem was not a secret, but people were threatened and felt scared to talk about it. So I want to know the answer to the one really important question. Why not tell Congress about the problem, number one, and then what do you mean by let sleeping dogs lie? What I meant by that was that uh, since we, since the, the number of inquiries, the number of subpoenas related to uh, information uh, residing in the White House database had diminished, uh, we don't need to go to Congress to ask for funding to uh, pay for the cost of performing these information requests. Excuse me, the White House database wasn't the only thing that was under subpoena. That's you know, perfect. there's a whole host of subpoenas that were asked on a whole bunch of issues. The, the espionage issue, the campaign finance issue, Waco, a whole bunch of things. Did you know anything about those? It wasn't just Hootie B. Uh, I was aware of many of those requests. You were aware? I was aware of many of the requests because the requests would be sent to uh, ISNT staff through email and we would respond to them. But the uh, primary time consumer of requests had to do with the uh, White House Office database. Well, in any event, you said let sleeping dogs lie. You knew about all these subpoenas. You knew this information was legally requested and should have been given to the Congress of the United States. And you sent a memo around saying, hey, let's let sleeping dogs lie. And, and the subpoenas were not complied with. And this is two years ago. And, uh, you know, I don't know what we're going to do to hold you responsible for that. But the fact of the matter is, you knew those subpoenas were in order. You knew that information should go forward. And you said in a memo, let sleeping dogs lie. I'm now going to yield to uh, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think you've asked a very relevant question. If, uh, uh, during the time that I served as a U.S. attorney, uh, if uh, we had uh, sent a, a subpoena to a witness or a custodian of records uh, and they replied uh, back, either directly or in this case indirectly, let sleeping dogs lie, uh, that would be considered evidence of obstruction of justice. Uh, does that concern you, Mr. Heisner? It certainly does. Uh, there was no uh, intention or attempt to obstruct justice in any form. Well, I'm sure that neither you nor other people, or I would presume, you didn't have a thought process and, and the words, I am going to obstruct justice, went through your mind. I certainly would hope not. Uh, but if, in fact, as the chairman has indicated, uh, the, you were aware, as you were, of these probes, you were aware of a problem, you were aware that this problem entailed information that was being sought by various entities, in this case, an independent counsel, uh, more than two or at least two committees of the Congress, uh, and your directive is to let sleeping dogs lie, which in, uh, in, in common parlance uh, means disregard this, ignore it, don't worry about it, uh, that can be evidence of obstruction of justice. The intention of this sentence was to not request, not to raise the issue of information requests and the effect it had on the staff of ISNT uh, as an issue of asking for additional funding. The, the uh, effect of the requests having to do with the White House, White House office with the HUDB database had been significant upon our staff. And that was uppermost in my mind as other requests would arrive, uh, all of us, including myself, would look at those requests, would uh, consider if the information requested was on our, uh, in our records. Uh, if it was, we would provide that information through channels. 
uh, that was a normal process. And in most cases, those requests uh, involved information about individuals, uh, which in the environment in which we found ourselves and the kinds of things that we did, we would not have any information about individuals. Uh, your service in, in the government spans several different administrations, including That's the administration of, of George Bush uh, and uh, his counsel, uh, Mr. C. Boyd and Gray. Uh, it seems like not just a, a decade ago, but ages ago, that we had an administration whose thought process placed uppermost in their minds scrupulous adherence to the law and to err on the side always of providing more information rather than less, more information rather than what might be strictly technically required by looking at the four corners of a subpoena or some other documentation. Can you pinpoint when we moved from that notion of public service and compliance with the public interest to something else being foremost in the minds of those to whom subpoenas are directed or who have custody over government or records subject to subpoena? Uh, no, sir. I have no idea when that change happened. It is not in an area that I deal with. My area is a technical uh, it, area. It, it is because you said you told us what was uppermost in your mind. What I'm saying is there used to be a day, and hopefully that day will come again, uh, when a public official at the White House always keeps foremost in their mind not the cost of something as an excuse for not complying or not furnishing information, but what can I do to make sure that the public interest is respected to the degree so that we are going to go the extra mile not to cover up, not to not furnish information, but to furnish information. And I don't know when that change took place, but it has taken place. And it is relevant for purposes of your appearance here today because you use those words, what was uppermost in your mind or foremost in your mind. Uh, and to see something written, uh, to let sleeping dogs lie is, is very, very disturbing both from a public policy standpoint as well as from the standpoint, and I don't know what Robert Ray is looking at, but from the standpoint of possible obstruction of justice. Uh, and if I were you, and, and uh, I don't know whether your counsel has any concern about this, but it, it raises very troubling questions in our mind about obstruction of justice, and I suspect that's why the independent counsel may be looking at this as well. And I think the, the chairman, uh, despite uh, the, the constant efforts to downplay and denigrate the work of this committee by uh, the folks on the other side uh, has asked a very legitimate question and simply saying that, uh, well, something relating to the cost. We heard this from uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay uh, that uh, trying to try to say this was an issue of cost or whatnot, uh, rather than scrupulous uh, effort to comply. Uh, I think is a very legitimate question and one that ought to ought to concern you. It, it certainly is, sir, but uh, as I'm looking at this memorandum, uh, maybe I need to explain that there are two issues that are being addressed. <clears throat> the issue, if you take a look in the uh, paragraph that starts with note, colon, issue mail to reconstruction, document attached, and then below the uh, dash at the uh, dotted line, it will say issue to mail reconstruction and provides a background and definition of the problem uh, for Mrs. Cleo, the uh, paragraphs which you are questioning are related to a request for information from Mrs. Cleo about the, the effect that uh, various information requests are having on the ISNT staff and uh, whether uh, it should be brought up as an issue that uh, might perhaps warrant uh, additional funding for the organization. And my response was, well, the, the level of effort uh, required to accommodate these requests and the requests are declining. And uh, at this point, uh, we don't need to ask for additional funding. So let's not even mention that we need funding for this because we don't need it right now. Not for the purpose of answering information requests. So there are two topics on this and uh, maybe that's the confusion, sir. Well, it would, it would be nice if, uh, if it were just a matter of confusion. Uh yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. I, th I think it, it, it illustrates and, and may be evidence of a mindset that uh, disturbs the chairman very greatly and, and legitimately.
and uh, about you know, which we're going to inquire further, and as I say, I suspect that the independent counsel is uh, as well. Uh, Mr. Lyle, if I could go back to ask some, some fairly specific background checks, uh, questions. When was it that you first learned about the mail to problem? My most vivid recollection is in April of 1999, thereabouts, in connection with the letter D problem, um, uh, the second anomaly that we've been discussing. And this was approximately six months after you began your work in the, the, uh, the uh, Office of Administration? Yes, sir. And where were you just prior to your work in the Office of Administration? I was uh, in private practice uh, in Chicago. Uh, what research have you done to satisfy yourself, as I'm sure as a public servant you would, uh, when this issue first came to the attention of the Office of Administration? Uh, which issue, sir? The issue of the mail to problem. The uh, discussions that uh, I had in connection with the letter D uh, matter were with Mr. Lindsay. Uh, and other members of my staff. And in the course of those discussions, as I said, I learned about the email, too, is my most vivid recollection of that. Uh, and um, he had explained that in dealing with the mail to uh, issue, that he had had communicated that issue to, I'm sorry, the email to, did I say email to? The email to problem, he had communicated that to uh, the White House Counsel's Office and that he had handled uh, that matter. Uh, and uh, I was satisfied that uh, Mr. Lindsay, who had, was my predecessor in my position, who was my superior, and who I have known for a long time, um, had taken steps to convey the information uh, for the White House counsel to uh, handle. And when did he indicate to you that had taken place? In that April 1999 uh, meeting and when did he communicate to you that he first became aware of the mail to problem? As I recall it, it was in uh, June of 1998 time frame that he uh, became aware of it, as I, as I recall what he said. And you are aware, uh, at least as you sit here today, uh, that the Office of Administration became aware of the problem in very early 1998 initially? Uh, I know that there were some reports uh, about uh, the, the problem. I don't know January of 1990. I don't know exactly when that was. And I, uh, you're, you're aware of the fact, certainly, through following these proceedings, as I'm sure you have in preparation, uh, therefore, uh, that uh, January 98 was the time at which there was actual, actually communications. I like uh, all I can tell you from my personal knowledge, sir, is, is that um, in, the, in uh, the meeting that I had in April of 1999, when I was learning about more about the email two issue, that um, I was told that my understanding is, is that Mr. Lindsay was aware in the June of 98 time frame about it, what happened in January of 98. I know that others have discussed that, but I, as I sit here, cannot tell you what, the, what that was. Now, when you discussed with Mr. Lindsay how this in, their communication of this information to the White House counsel, Yes. Uh, what manner was that communicated to White House counsel and to whom were the records themselves delivered? Uh, in my meeting with Mr. Lindsay, he conveyed to me that um, he had uh, uh, met with White House counsel. Um, at that time, it would have been um, Mr. Ruff. Um, and uh, I, I, as far as documentation, I believe that there was some uh, a memo that um, he had submitted to his superior, Mr. Lindsay had submitted to his superior, uh, concerning the email to uh, issue. How about the, uh, the uh, group of, of missing and then reconstructed emails delivered to the White House Counsel's Office? Uh, when, did, when did Mr. Lindsay indicate that took place and to whom were those delivered? I don't believe we discussed that in the um, meeting. Okay. Did you discuss that at a later date? I have. Would that not have been relevant? Well, uh, again, I was learning more about it from a background point of view because we were addressing the letter D issue in that time frame, and so I don't I don't recall that having been raised at all. Uh, so I I can't say uh, any details about what happened and and 
I'm not sure which documents actually, sir, you're referring to. After the problem was initially discovered by the Northrop employees, and this was the subject of uh, some extended discussion here on, in, uh, uh, in the March 23rd hearing, uh, there At was this a, year. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, there was a very large group of uh, documents uh, that were pulled up, emails, uh, after a search, initial search was conducted of certain names in order to verify, presumably, the extent of the problem. Those were delivered to the White House and have mysteriously disappeared. I'm wondering if you ever had any discussion with Mr. Lindsay about those documents, those emails. No, sir, I did not. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I am aware since based on what you're talking about, that Mr. Lindsay did, as I understand it, deliver documents to the White House Counsel's Office, and I think you talked to him about it in, in your hearing with him that you're referring to in March of this, of this year. My, my time's expired, Mr. Barr. We'll Thank get back you, Mr. Chairman. You. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Heisner, Mr. Lyle, I appreciate your being here to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Heisner, you indicated in your opening, your written statement, that uh, you're not a political appointee, are you? That's correct, sir. Uh, tell us about what you've been doing and how long you've been there. Well, I've been working for the federal government for almost 25 years. I started uh, with OMB, uh, worked during the uh, uh, Ford administration. Carter administration, and subsequently right on through the Clinton administration, uh, the uh, majority of my time uh, was in support of OMB's budget preparation system. Uh, when OMB went to uh, go to contractors for support, then I served as the database administrator for the uh, uh, Office of Administration Data Center, EOP Data Center. These have been all technical uh, Position, which is where my interests and my expertise lie. Well, I, I'm just shocked at the questioning that you've had so far from the chairman of the committee and Mr. Barr, because I think they've impugned your integrity. I don't think they have any basis for it, any justification for it. And it seems to me their complaint is you're not giving them the answers they would like you to give, because they want to go after this administration, they want to paint a certain picture, and you're not. Uh, giving them testimony to fit. Now, that's no reason to act as if you're uh, lying to this committee. Are you lying to this committee? No, sir. Absolutely not. You know you're under oath. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, let, let, let's, let's try to sort through what the real facts are uh, on this issue. It's sort of Orwellian that Chairman has this exhibit up of your email, and everything is highlighted except one line, and that is the issue. The issue is information requests. Because that email didn't have to do with missing emails from the mail to system. It had to do with information requests from the Congress. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And that had to do from to prepare uh, Mr. Lindsay, who you worked for, to go before the House Appropriations Committee or the Senate Appropriations Committee to talk about the budget. And as I understand what you're telling us is that you suggested, rather than complain about all the requests that you've been getting for information from the Congress, and I must say particularly from this committee, you didn't want to suggest that perhaps those information requests had been reduced, because if you suggested the information requests might be fewer than they had been in the past, it might trigger the Congress to start sending more information requests. Is that, is that what you meant by let sleeping dogs lie? That's exactly correct, sir. Now, now, people may not realize it, but this committee has caused you, as a technical person having worked for many administrations, to spend, I don't know, six months, is the estimate I got, of your time simply answering requests from this committee on the White House database. Is that, is that accurate? That's accurate, sir. Now, the White House database has nothing to do with the emails. That's the, correct, The sir. White House database investigation was an investigation that um, uh, Congressman McIntosh conducted. And he wanted to find out whether the, something was really rotten with the White House database because 
Christmas cards were going out, using that database, and he made all sorts of accusations. I think he even accused people of, of breaking the law. And then after spending a year or two years on that investigation, causing you to spend thousands of hours, many months of your time, all paid for the, by the taxpayers, there was nothing to show for that investigation. So requests were sent for more information and more information and more information, and the Congress just kept on fishing around to see if they could find some scandal. They found none. And you were alluding to in that, uh, as I understand that, that particular document, that when your superior goes to the Appropriations Committee, don't raise the issue that we got a lot of requests before and fewer now. Let sleeping dogs lie. Maybe they won't have their attention drawn to the, drawn to the fact that they ought to be asking for more information. Is that what we're talking about? That's correct, sir. Now, that's a different issue than what they're talking about on this committee, which is the mail-to-retrieval system, which is the archiving of emails at the White House. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Now, um, in your, um, let me just ask you some bottom line questions. Let's just get this, this right on the record. Uh, there seems to be an allegation that the White House was trying to cover up damaging emails. At our first hearing, the chairman said that the White House basically had two choices. They could face up to the problem, tell the Justice Department and Congress what happened, get it fixed, or they could throw a blanket over the whole problem, ignore it, and hope nobody would find out. And the chairman says, it looks like they chose to cover it up. Uh, Mr. Heisner, did anyone ever ask you to conceal the existence of the computer glitch that caused the missing email problem? No, sir. Mr. Lyle, did anyone ask you to do that? No, sir. Uh, did anyone ask Mr. Heisner uh, you to conceal the email problem from Congress? No, sir. And Mr. Lyle? No, sir. A that's pretty ironic to ask you to conceal the problem from the Congress, because in December of 1998, which was two months before your email, which they look now as the smoking gun of the White House cover-up, it was reported in Insight magazine that the Congress of the United States, in fact, this committee, had information that some emails were missing. So we already knew some emails had been missing from the White House database system. You probably know nothing about that particular publication, but it's interesting that in the public, a public document, a newspaper, they were talking about how this committee already knew that they weren't getting all the White House emails because of some glitch in the system. Um, so that, you, you are telling us you weren't trying to conceal this problem from the Congress? That's correct. Did anyone ever ask you not to report the email problems to the Congress? No, sir. Mr. Lyle? No, sir. Now, um, Mr. Heisner, let's go back to that email, which is the topic of this whole hearing today. Uh, there's been some confusion about this document, and so let's try to clear up the confusion. You sent the document. Um, uh, let's be sure we're working off the same document. There's a version that, that with with the bait stamp E3865-3866, and the doc document indicates that you sent this email to Dorothy Cleal. Who is uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Cleal? Mrs. Cleal was the associate director of the Information Systems and Technology Division. She was the person to whom I was reporting directly. And next to the subject heading of the email, it says, issue papers for appropriations hearing. What does that refer to? Uh, that refers to a request for information uh, that was going to be passed on to uh, Mr. Lindsay for uh, appropriation hearings. And I understand you were asked to prepare briefing materials on two issues. What were those two issues? That's correct, sir. The two issues were mail to reconstruction, and the second one was called information requests. Okay, the email contains a discussion of both of these issues. Uh, continuing with the text of the email, it goes on to say, quote, issue uh, mail to reconstruction, document attached in parenthesis. Uh, below that it says, quote, issue information requests. Are these two issues related to one, uh, one another at all? No, sir, they're separate. They're completely separate issues. Uh, after the section dealing with the information requests, there's a divider and then a section labeled, quote, mail to reconstruction, end quote. Below that heading, there's a fairly detailed description of the history of the mail to problem and efforts to investigate and fix it. 
Now, let, let me ask you, did you want to prevent Congress from finding out about the mail two problem? No, sir. When you wrote, let sleeping dogs lie, were you referring to the mail two problem? No, sir. Um, I think we, uh, we know what mail two reconstruction refers to, but what does information requests mean? Uh, information requests refers to the issue uh, that uh, was going to be perhaps discussed, or at least would be considered for discussion, the issue having to do with the level of effort that was required to respond to requests for information from different sources, uh, uh, and in particular, the uh, level of effort that had been required to respond uh, to information requests related to the HUDB database. Uh, did you want to hide information from Congress? No, sir. And looking, looking at the text that follows, what did you mean when you wrote, quote, let sleeping dogs lie? What I meant by that was, I don't think we need to draw undue attention to the issue of uh, requested information related to the HUDB database. Uh, since the requests uh, are declining, we provided all the information that was requested of us. We spent a considerable level of effort in uh, responding to these requests. Uh, we ran many queries. They were done very, very carefully to be sure that the information that was requested was made available. And it had a uh, negative effect on the operations because it took away a considerable uh, time from uh, a very small staff. Well, let me just underscore what that means when you say it took away time from a small staff. It took away resources that the taxpayer, taxpayers paid to ha have people work for the government in all sorts of capacities to just answer a flood of requests for, of information from the Congress, and this committee's probably guiltier than any other. This committee just kept on sending requests for more and more documents, more and more requests, uh, and that meant more and more people had to work on it. We have spent taxpayers' dollars just to fund this committee at, I don't know, how many millions? And then I don't know how many millions had to be spent just to answer the requests from this committee. And then when this committee gets documents and information that doesn't fit into the accusations of scandal, witnesses like you are treated with the back of, your, uh, back of their hand. They act as if you're trying to uh, cover up for Bill and Hillary Clinton's misdeeds. And you're not a political appointee. You're a career civil servant working in a technical area. I, I just find it, uh, I, I find it astonishing, I guess is the best word to use, but I find it even more troublesome than astonishing. I find it unprofessional. Now, um, let, let me ask um, Mr. Lyle some questions so we can get some of this on the record. I want to ask you about the mail two problem. When did you, you first arrived at the office administration when? In, in November of 1998. So you were not at the Office of, of uh, Administration at the time period that the mail two problem was found and then fixed prospectively, is that right? That's correct. Okay, let me just take a minute so that people who are watching this hearing or the press, because they're not thinking about this issue, to go through a timeline. An arms system, which is a, a retrieval system for emails, was set up at taxpayers' expense at the White House and at all the executive office buildings so that they, a historical record of all the emails could be captured. Is that right? There was an, an automated records management system known as ARMS that was established within the executive office of the president. I, I can't tell you what other government agencies have done, but I can okay. tell well, you what happened in the executive, executive office. Executive office of the president is what yes, sir. this is all about. Yes, sir. And uh, that system, uh, uh, as of uh, June 1998, uh, was discovered to not be operating uh, in complete compliance with the goals and what the contractor, which was uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, I think, uh, what they envisioned. So they discovered in June 1998 that uh, some emails, and I think mainly emails that were being sent from the outside in, were not on this ARM system. Uh, you weren't there in June 1998. That's correct, sir. By November 1998, they fixed the system. And they fixed it yes, for the future. Correct. So that every time 
uh, anybody sent an email either into the White House executive office or internally or from the office uh, out, that was all going to be on the retrieval system. They found there was a problem and they corrected it. And that was in November 1998. In December 1998, in the Insight, Insight is it called? Insight magazine, I think it's a publication of the Washington Times, they reported that this committee, the Congress, knew there was a problem of some of the retroactive emails not getting picked up. You, you, did you know about that? I, I know of the report. Uh, before I came to Washington, I had never heard of Insight magazine. But okay. since I've been here, I, I am now familiar with it. I don't know when I learned of the article. Well, when were you first informed about the Mail 2 uh, problem? The Mail 2 problem was in April of, of 1999, thereabouts, as, I, as I've said, it's my most vivid recollection of, of learning about it in the context of the letter D um, anomaly. Did you have reason to th any reason to think there was an ongoing or potential problem with documented production to meet the request from all the investigators uh, because of the Mail 2 issue? No, sir. When you did learn that the Mail 2 issue may have affected the production of documents by the White House in response to congressional and independent counsel subpoenas, uh, wh when you did learn that, wh that was April? That was in that April meeting that I described earlier for uh, Congressman Barr. Okay, so if there was not a, a, a perceived problem regarding document production, why was the Office of Administration concerned about the Mail 2 reconstruction? In, in April of 1999? The, the mail to reconstruction issue had been uh, dealt with, but you still have uh, archival issues um, uh, that need to be addressed. Federal Records Act, Presidential Records Act, uh, the Armstrong litigation, um, all of those uh, precedents uh, control uh, records that need to be um, stored for historical purposes. So uh, the focus, um, um, uh, as far as it related to email, two issue um, d during my tenure has been on the federal records compliance issues, the, the Presidential Records Act and the things that I've talked about so that uh, you have a historical record that can be transferred uh, to the National Archives Records Administration and also to the Presidential Library. When the Office of Administration did see the mail to problem as something that needed to be fixed for these archival reasons relating to presidential records, why did the office not begin the Mail 2 reconstruction project in 1999? At the time, in 1999, and when you're talking about in the April of 99 time frame, in 1999, we were in the midst of one of the uh, most difficult uh, information systems and technology challenges facing the executive office of the president. Um, it was the Y2K crisis. It not only confronted the White House, it confronted the rest of the country, and in fact, the rest of the world. Uh, it was an extraordinary uh, undertaking. There were many systems that needed to be Y2K compliant uh, to ensure that when the year 2000 came, that the presidency would have computer systems that worked. Um, there were I can just interrupt you for yes, a second. Sir. This Congress has done pretty much nothing on any important issue. Uh, we have a lot of recesses. We have short week time frames to do basically nothing because we're deadlocked. But I want to inform everybody that yesterday the House of Representatives voted unanimously to praise everybody who worked on correcting the Y2K problem because when the, 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 the calendar clicked over into this uh, new uh, millennium, all the fears that we had about Y2K uh, did not come up about and we praised all the people that worked on it so uh, I yes. assume you were included in that. I, I appreciate that and I know that my staff will appreciate it too. There was a small number of people in the information systems and technology division, only 40, 45 people. They worked very, very hard with our contractors to uh, achieve a success that was uh, I would describe as nearly an impossible task and it was only as a result of their hard work and the support that we received that we are ultimately able so to So were you trying to decide how much money to spend on making sure you complied with Y2K and then or how much you could divert to deal with the Mail 2 problem? Our number one purpose was ensuring Y2K compliance. And as I, uh, as I said, this was a huge undertaking. It was drawing every personnel resource we had available um, in the IT uh, information technology area. All of our staff was working very, very hard on that project in one form or another. 
Um, and it was, uh, a, a, as I said, a huge task that we're very proud we achieved. And when did your office start to focus on the MAIL-2 pro project? Um, after the Y2K uh, issue uh, was behind us. Um, we started looking at it in the February, January, February, March time frame. Um, of this year? Of this year, of, of 2000, remembering that February 29th was also a Y2K issue in terms of the leap year uh, component. Um, so it's, it's in this time frame that um, we had a comfort level that we could uh, proceed with uh, some of the projects that we were not, weren't able to get to while we were focused on this, the largest, I would say the largest computer renovation in the history of the White House, and I would dare say other places as well. We have um, briefing papers which demonstrate that Beth Nolan, who's the White House counsel, was told about the project at a January 2000 briefing about current records management issues. And this was before the press stories about the mail two began appearing in mid-February. So is it accurate to say that the Office of Administration started addressing the mail two re reconstruction issue before those stories first appeared? That's correct, sir. Did you attend the briefing uh, for Ms. Nolan? Yes, I did. And what was the purpose of that briefing? Uh, there was a meeting that was coming um, with the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, uh, in preparation for the presidential uh, transition. And uh, we had gone to uh, White House Counsel to explain to them the um, um, information that we knew relative to uh, the anomalies and uh, where we were with respect to those from a records management point of view. It was for purposes and in preparation of a, of a meeting with NARA. Uh, and we discussed uh, a variety of issues um, uh, with respect to the email two and the letter D uh, anomalies in the records management context. Uh, uh, after the briefing, what steps did the Office of Administration uh, take to make sure that mail two emails were reconstructed? Following that briefing, a number of things uh, took place. Uh, first, we l looked into uh, the uh, costs uh, associated with doing uh, an email to reconstruction. Uh, we needed to do a marketplace survey or, and develop cost assessments so that we could determine um, what contractors would be available to do the project, how it would be done. I instructed my information technology staff to prepare a plan that pr could be considered by contractors in a bidding process so that we could get moving on. We needed cost estimates for the project so that we could um, uh, seek appropriate funding from our appropriators in connection with that uh, uh, effort. Uh, and all of those uh, steps needed to be taken. I received ultimately a um, cost assessment proposal from my IT information technology staff, I believe around March 14th of this year. Uh, and it's from that that we began um, uh, deliberate steps in that area. We're going to hear tomorrow from the uh, White House counsels themselves, uh, and uh, they're going to tell us about their role in all of this. But as I recall uh, from Beth Nolan's testimony several weeks ago, that the system was found to have this problem that it wasn't getting all the the outside emails on the central system. They found out about it and they fixed it prospectively. And then their question came up, well, what about the retroactive emails that might have fallen through the cracks? And uh, there was some test done on the individual computers of some of the people involved with Monica Lewinsky. And they found that some of those emails that weren't on the centralized system were, in fact, on the computer systems of the um, Ms. Curry and others. And those had all been turned over to the investigators. So she testified that as far as the White House Counsel's Office knew, the, everybody was getting the information they requested on emails as well as everything else. Uh, and uh, now we're finding out that might not have been the case, but they believe that to be the case. Do you have any information on, on those issues? I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I do not. That wasn't your area. But right. uh, we'll hear from them tomorrow, because that sort of addresses the other part of this conspiracy that's being uh, painted uh, before us by uh, this committee's series of hearings on this 
single issue. And one of my ongoing concerns about congressional investigations regarding the campaign finance issues, uh, this issue and any others that cost millions of dollars to the taxpayers without producing substantial benefits. For example, I asked the GAO to do a survey uh, in 1998 that underscored the burden that congressional campaign finance investigations, just that investigation, uh, placed on the federal agencies. And that has nothing to do with this particular issue. But 21 federal agencies reported that in the 18-month period between October 1, 1996 and March 31, 1998, they received 1,156 campaign finance inquiries from Congress. And GAO calculated the cost of responding to the, these inquiries cost the taxpayers $8,767,753. That money could have been used for a lot of important purposes. Uh, you noted in your testimony you were involved with responding to requests related to the investigation of the White House database known as the WHODB. Is that what it's called? WHODB? That's correct, sir. Uh, that investigation conducted by this committee spent over two years examining whether anyone stole the president's holiday card list and whether disclosing who attended White House social events constitute theft of government property. Can you imagine? We spent all that time trying to figure out if there was theft of government property. And the investigation involved depositions of over 35 witnesses, the production of over 43,000 pages of documents. One witness from the Office of Administration estimated that he spent about 1,500 hours, the equivalent of over 37 work weeks, between June 1996 and September 1997, responding to WHODB information requests. WHODB is a different issue than mail too. And on that issue, they spent all of this time and money to find that there was nothing there. Mr. Heisner, can you estimate how much time you spent responding to the requests on the WhoDB investigation? I, I asked you before, and, and I th maybe you could tell us if you've done any estimate on it. Yes, sir. Uh, we tracked the uh, number of hours reported to have been spent on WhoDB. And to best of my recollection, for the year of 19, fiscal year 1997, uh, the uh, ISNT staff reported over 3,000 hours during that year. And of those 3,000 hours, somewhat over 1,000 uh, were attributable to the work that I did. Um, I, I think it's important to have congressional oversight. Uh, but I think it's clear this committee frequently goes too far. Uh, Mr. Lyle. Um, Mr. Burton suggested that um, the White House was trying to um, run out the clock by delaying production of the mail to reconstructed emails until after the election. Is that accurate? No, sir. Uh, why not? We are working very hard to reconstruct these emails as quickly as we can. We have a contractor uh, on board. We have an independent validation and verification contractor that we will be having on board. Uh, within uh, days uh, and proceeding uh, as quickly as we can to reconstruct uh, the emails. I, I just want to close the time I have here by m making a comment. Uh, I'm st as strongly against obstruction of justice as any member of the Congress. I, I don't look back at the uh, time of President Nixon and, and President Bush as the golden age of this country. Uh, I don't think President Nixon was forced out of office because simply 18 minutes of a tape was missing. He was forced out of office because he misused the office of the presidency to uh, go after American citizens, to uh, obstruct justice in a very genuine way. And the Congress found that, uh, at least the House found, that he was guilty of obstruction of justice and brought impeachment charges against him. And I can recall personally, having been in the Congress, uh, uh, over the uh, years of President Bush, how many times we requested information when we were told that executive privilege would preclude them from giving us important information. I thought that was often used inappropriately, uh, but we certainly didn't go out and do the kinds of things that are being done now by the uh, Republican-led uh, Congress. If there is credible information that anyone obstructed justice or intentionally concealed information, then I want to do everything, and I will do everything 
that uh, I can to ensure prosecutions are brought. I don't care if it's a Republican. I don't care if it's a Democrat. If anybody's obstructing justice, they ought to be prosecuted. But I'm equally opposed to frivolous charges of obstruction of justice or unsubstantiated allegations that unfairly damage the reputations of people of integrity and good character. I resent it. I think it's unprofessional. I think it's un-American when people misuse their positions of power, whether it was President Nixon or members of Congress, to make unsubstantiated allegations, smear people, accuse them of obstruction of justice, accuse them of criminal wrongdoing, frivolously sending letters to the Justice Department asking for prosecutions, and then attacking the Justice Department if they don't bring prosecutions, even though there was no evidence of wrongdoing to substantiate any kind of criminal actions. I think uh, people have power, but they need to restrain their use of that power and act in a, a sense of fairness and decency. If there's a criminal act, let's prosecute. If something's been done inappropriately, let's criticize it. But I don't think that these unsubstantiated allegations and smears ought to be tolerated. I yield back the balance of my time. I will take my time, but I'm going to yield it to Mr. Hutchinson in just a moment. L let me just say that Mr. Waxman once again has covered the waterfront. The campaign finance scandal is of great interest to people all across the country. Communist China gave money to the president's campaign. Uh, money has been returned from the DNC. Taiwan gave money. Egypt gave money. South America gave money. Uh, we know about the Shilai Temple. I mean, you know, he could say that this is just a waste of time, but the fact of the matter is people know that there was a scandal involved there. Uh, Mr. Waxman said, uh, you know, this email problem, we, uh, you know, they, they, they can get this done in six months. They've known about it for two years. They knew about it in 1998, and they kept it under wraps from the Congress. Why didn't they fix it back in 1998 instead of waiting now and saying it's going to take six, eight months so it carries past the election? Mr. Waxman also flat out misrepresented it, what the Insight Magazine article said. He said the article claimed Congress knew about the problem. It does not say that, and I'll read what the article says. It says, so why hasn't the White House come clean and inform various panels and star of the discovery? Insiders say there's a lively debate going on involving a fair amount of legal hair splitting. We did not know about it, and he ought to read the article clearly. And Mr. Waxman... May I ask unanimous consent no. that the full text of the article be on Ms. the record? Mr. Waxman belittled the Hootie B investigation. He didn't tell everyone that FBI Director Free said that he thought an independent counsel should look at this matter. This observation was made in a memo that the Justice Department will not make public. That's the FBI director. I yield to Mr. Uh, Sir Hutchins. Thank the chairman. Uh, trying to uh, uh, take my mind and sort of analyze where we are and, and what the relevant issues are before this committee. First of all, I think it's clear that there were subpoenas issued by this committee and perhaps others uh, for information and those subpoenas were not properly honored in the sense that records were not retrieved for compliance with the subpoena. Secondly, uh, another point is that critical information has not been revealed to Congress that because of a computer problem, uh, there was not a total review of documents that were under subpoena. Thirdly, uh, whether the missing emails contain pertinent information to proper investigations being conducted by this Congress and other investigative bodies. And of course, the final question is, if there was a failure to comply, was it intentional? And that's, these, we don't have the answers to all of these questions, but we do know that these are important questions to ask. They're important issues for this Congress to deal with because I believe that when subpoenas are issued, uh, they need to be complied with. And if they cannot be complied with, certainly the subpoenaing authority needs to be aware of the problem and the reasons for it. Now, I was listening to the testimony of Mr. Lyle, and it's uh, uh, putting this back together. Of course, the uh, email problem uh, became known in May or June of 1998, and it became known to the administration during that time frame. Congress was not advised of the problem, and that we could not retrieve, uh, uh, review all of the subpoenaed materials for compliance. 
And then, Mr. Lyle, you indicated that you learned of the problem in April of 1999. Is that correct? Of the uh, email two problem, sir? Correct. Yes, or, uh, in that and, time frame. And that you had meetings with Beth Nolan uh, during that time frame as well and talked about the... No, no sir, I'm sorry. That I had a meeting with uh, Ms. Nolan in January of this year. January of this year? Yes, sir. Well, you indicated in response to the questions of Mr. Waxman that you were wanting cost estimates as to uh, what it would take to uh, do the records retrieval. The uh, records reconstruction of the email to and the letter D um, backup tapes. Yes, that was in this year. This is in order to reconstruct the records and review them for compliance with the subpoena. Well, it's, it's for reconstruction of the records. Um, one of the things that we'll you will be able to do is do an, an automated records management ser search, but it will also uh, allow for the for those documents and those records to be transmitted um, to the archives and to the presidential library. As well as com as reviewing the ARM system to retrieve any records that would be pertinent to a subpoena. Yes, that's what I said. Well, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, I just wanted to add that there's there's other components. There's two purposes. To yes, it. sir. One is for your your archival purposes, and the other one is for compliance with the subpoena. That's what I'm interested in. Right. You can put, you can search the automated records management system to um, comply Thank with you. subpoenas or information requests or whatever you. Yes. We understand each okay. other. Okay. I just want to be clear, sir. Uh, and, and so that was the purpose of it, but and that was important. But the question is, uh, whenever it was known in. May or June of 98, the problem. No one was advised of it in terms of Congress. And secondly, you never went to the appropriators in 1999 uh, to ask for money to assist in the uh, hiring a contractor to retrieve these documents and to get the system corrected. Is that correct, Mr. Lyle? As far as what was conveyed to this committee in the May or June of 1998, I can shed no light on that for you. With respect to the appropriators in 1999, during um, our fiscal year 2000 um, appropriations hearing, um, um, the email to uh, project was one of those projects that I discussed earlier um, that we had to set aside for Y2K as our focus and our number one priority. Let me ask you a question. In yes. 1999, mm -hmm. did you go before the appropriators and ask for money to correct the system and to retrieve the records and hire a contractor for that purpose? Our purpose was the Y2K crisis. I'm asking so we a simple did, question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you yes. answer it yes or no? No, the answer is we, we did not ask for funds to do the email to reconstruction in the fiscal year 2000 budget submission during the year 1999. Which would have been calendar 1999. Year 1999. In, 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 that, in that, our, uh, that our, as I said, our singular purpose was Y2K compliance. In other words, you had to prioritize. If you have a if you have a computer system that doesn't work, period, okay. yeah, your, uh, your 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 systems will not operate. You can't you can't okay. serve. Your, you can't prior function. your priority your priority was Y two K compliance. Yes, sir. And so you did not put it as a priority, advising the appropriators that you also have a problem in the retrieval system, and uh, that would allow you to comply with subpoenas of Congress. Well, the subpoenas of Congress in 1999, the time frame that I was operating under, I'm not aware, and I don't know what, and I believe my staff is not aware, of any subpoena compliance issues. We, we have no knowledge of whether or not what communications took place between White House Counsel's Office and this committee in respect to your subpoenas or any other information requests. That uh, my, my time has expired. I, I will come back to you in just a minute. Uh, you can pursue that further. Uh, Mr. Ford? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I don't really have m many questions. I really just sort of had a comment. I, I'm, I'm frustrated like all of us. Uh, I, I would imagine all of us in the Congress that we're continuing to, to sort of pester these people. Um, from the White House and the Department of Justice. I appreciate you being here this morning and appreciate you responding uh, to some of the questions, as ridiculous as some may be. Uh, I, I would hope, um, Mr. Chairman, that, that this same zeal that we're applying to, to today's hearing, that we could apply to some of the more constructive things that people would rather have us doing. I think if we just sort of take a second to step back and listen to some of the questions we are 
actually posing with uh, almost a serious tone in our voice. It's, it's somewhat embarrassing. Um, I understand tomorrow we're going to invite folks who no longer work at the White House, who did work at the White House, back up to talk about these issues. I, I, I share your belief, Mr. Chairman, that people do care about campaign finance reform. They do care, care about allegations of campaign finance abuse. Uh, but they also would <clears throat> probably be interested in us doing something about it as opposed to continuing to investigate, investigate, uh, and investigate. I think it's important to note that all of the, the witnesses, I think, have answered questions as efficiently as they can, and regardless of how we seek to frame them, uh, I don't believe they're going to provide different answers because they're, they're, they're trying to answer truthfully. So I would hope that we would cooperate uh, with them as well, and particularly when we ask questions that require more than a yes or no, that we at least allow the witnesses to, to elaborate. Um, lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I would hope that, that after we, we complete this, and I, I thought that we would probably be finished uh, investigating after some point, I thought the president said it very well the other night when he said we only have seven months left to investigate him, uh, and hopefully we will get all the questions answered. I shouldn't say we. You guys will get all the questions answered that you want. Uh, quite frankly, I'm satisfied with the answers that I've heard I say the panelists, and I would hope that you would express to your colleagues back at the White House and the Department of Justice who are working tirelessly on a whole range of issues uh, that some of us in the Congress actually believe you're doing some decent work, uh, and we look forward to working with you on a whole range of other issues to try to improve the lives of, of most Americans, even or all Americans, including those represented by my Democratic colleagues and Republican colleagues. I want to apologize on behalf of this committee uh, for, for the White House and for the Justice Department and others. And don't get me wrong, there are legitimate times when I think you should come here and answer our questions, but I think at some point um, it's safe to say that we have gone completely overboard. Uh, and I think that we have become obsessed and intoxicated with the notion of investigating. When we can't think of much to do, we invite a few Justice Department officials and White House officials to come and answer questions about fantasies and concoctions and fabrications that some of us in this committee may have. So on behalf of the committee, I apologize for some of this question you're receiving. I, I appreciate you coming before the committee today. And with that, I yield Gentleman some time yield. to my friend from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, I'm going to try something here to, if it, on an explanatory nature and see how I make out. If you can explain it to me, I'm not particularly computer proficient, maybe, then everybody can understand it. Go back over some of the time frames that Mr. Hutchinson was referencing. Uh, apparently, it was November of 1998 uh, when the system was fixed, at least prospectively. Yes, sir. Right. All right. In 96 was when the problem actually occurred. So you've got a two-year period from 96 to 98. It's my understanding that it was 96 to 1998 with respect to the email two issue. Yes, sir. In June of 1998, the White House counsel uh, discovered that the um, that there had been a problem. I'm sorry, in June of 98, 98. Um, uh, Mr. Lindsay uh, notified the White House counsel uh, relative to the email two problem. But also notified them that, in fact, um, they were working on the problem, and then in November of that year, they would have determined that it was fixed, or at least White House counsel would have been told it was resolved. That's the information that's been provided to me. Um, and it's not uncommon, I would guess, for lawyers in the White House counsel office to talk past the technical people in terms of who understood what aspect of uh, the situation. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of technical people who work for me, and I'm not the most technical uh, of them, and yes, that, that happens even to me. So that around April of... Uh, of the year when uh, the White House counsel was supposed to be responding to subpoenas, it's uh, very likely or, or it seems very clear that they thought, thought the matter had been resolved and that all of the materials that had been requested had in fact been submitted. It, it, based on the information that, that I know of, um, I can't shed any more light on in terms of what was communicated to White House counsel's office by Mr. Lindsay um, or not. And then after that, once the, the issue was resolved and the technical people told them that in fact there may have been some old emails incoming that might not have been actually uh, determined. You've been on that effort in the case to try and ascertain those emails and discover them since that time, is that right? We're trying to reconstruct them as we speak. I think that's pretty clear. Thank you. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I do, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The, the one thing that needs to be made clear is that the uh, time frame that we are very concerned about regarding the campaign finance investigation was from September of 1990. 6 to 1998 when this whole problem arose. That's very relevant to that investigation, that particular investigation, and that's why it's uh, so important. Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And 
uh, I certainly want to agree with my uh, colleague from Tennessee and Mr. Lyle. I do not want to cut you off. I just think that we were reaching an agreement. We were, many yeah, we were. Questions. I'm, and again, I'm doing that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know we were trying to get to we, where we understood each other, and I appreciate that. And, and because of the five-minute rule, I try to move fairly quickly, but uh, I certainly want to be fair in the questions to you. And I think what you were testifying to is that you were concentrating on the Y2K problem, and it was not your responsibility to comply with subpoenas. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish your question. Well, I mean, if I'm incorrect in that, but uh, I was trying to give you a, a, a way out here <laughs> that uh, the point I was making is that, again, this was in May or June of 98, when it was first learned about by the White House. Uh, Congress was not advised of it. No requests were made for money to help retrieve the records that were under subpoena. Uh, that was uh, over uh, right at almost two years ago. We still have not retrieved the records. And it was during that time that there were some very important investigations going on in which this Congress was being pressured to wrap it up, to wrap it up. And the White House said, how long are we going to do the investigations when, in fact, they knew that there were records that were being stored at the White House that had never been reviewed and, turn, and, and uh, turned over to this Congress, and we were never told of the problem. And so you, I think that those are legitimate frustrations. Now, do you want to respond to what I just said, Mr. Lyle? I, I can't tell you um, in terms of, uh, with respect to subpoenas, we have a process in place that is used to respond to subpoenas. The Office of Administration, like any other executive office of the president, uh, agency is responsible to provide information to the White House Counsel's Office so that they are able to uh, respond to subpoenas that they receive or information requests that they receive. So they, we do participate in that type of process. Uh, so the Office of Administration, in that capacity, and as an information provider, and the Office does of Administration did its job by telling the White House Counsel's Office that there was a problem. Yes, Mr. Lindsay uh, advised me that he had done so. Um, and so it was the White House counsel's responsibility at that point to advise the appropriate uh, congressional subpoenas or anyone else who had something under subpoena as to the problem. The White House counsel's office is the uh, point of contact for the uh, discussions and communications uh, with this committee and the other in inquiring bodies. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Heisner, uh, did you ever see any subpoenas? Did that come within your responsibility to actually uh, know the information that was under subpoena? To the best of my recollection, the uh, process would uh, involve receiving a, uh, an email document that would be uh, sent to the Office of Administration and its staff that would require uh, responding to subpoenas. I may have seen some physical subpoenas, yes. And and sometimes you would know where the subpoena came from and sometimes you would not? That's correct. Uh, and many times it would just be uh, a request, we need these records. Uh, they're under subpoena, but you might not even know who the subpoena came from. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And who would customarily send you that email? Uh, the current process uh, involves uh, the receipt of a, uh, of a broadcast of an email to all staff by uh, White House counsel, and then there would be a separate email, a copy of that same separate email be sent out by uh, ISNT management, uh, someone in the, uh, in the front office would send it to all staff, and that person would then collect the responses to the uh, request for information. This is the current process. In but the it, past, it, uh, I collected information, but it would be process. funneled back through channels. Was that the process that existed back in 98? In 99. That was a similar process. It would be funneled to us through uh, White House counsel. We would respond and then send the information back to the White House counsel. I might add, those requests were taken very seriously. Uh, we took all diligence in making sure that the request was understood to analyze what the information was, was, need, was sought and then to develop the uh, software to give us the answers. It was very s serious from your standpoint in the Office of Administration. You That's don't know what happened once you gave the information to the White House Counsel. That's correct, sir. And you did your job, or Mark Lindsay, someone else in your department gave, 
the information to the White House counsel that there was a glitch in the computer system. They're not able to review it. And uh, uh, you knew that was important information that the White House counsel should know about. That's correct. Now, I want to go to Exhibit 81. It's been referred to uh, previously. And I just need to get a better grasp of this. This is uh, 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 a document that you created, correct, Mr. Heisman? Correct, sir. And uh, what the first sentence says, while I'll be glad to write up something related to the information request channeled to us via White House counsel in response to various requests from Congress, et cetera. Uh, who is this being, who, who are you responding to? Uh, I was responding to uh, Mrs. Cleo, who was my supervisor at the time, who had made the request by telephone. And the request by telephone was uh, work up how many hours you're devoting to this. This might be some information we want to give to Congress. Uh, the request was to uh, address the issue of uh, information requests and the impact it would have that had on us at the time and uh, to provide some information that might be suitable for uh, submission to uh, Mr. Lindsay in his uh, presentation. I'm sorry, Mr. Hutchinson, your, your time's expired. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. Uh, who, who seeks time on your side? Mr. Konjorski? Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis, you seek time? Mr. Konjorski, do you seek time? <coughs> Mr. Konjorski. <coughs> um, there's an article that appeared in uh, the uh, Washington Times today about certain involvements of email of Mr. Blumenthal. Are you familiar with, uh, who's familiar with that? I, um, I am familiar with that article, sir. Okay, Ms. Lyle. Could you, could you basically, did you read that article at all? Do you? Uh, y yes, I did. Could you tell us uh, what basically happened there and what's the answer to that story, if there is answer, if there is, is an answer? Uh, the information that I have uh, right now on that is, is that there was an email that was sent um, to Mr. Blumenthal from the U.S. Embassy in England. And uh, the email ended up in what my technical people tell me is a loop. And what that means is, is that the email was sent over and over and over again. And as a result uh, uh, of that loop uh, that occurred, a great volume of that e same email ended up being repeated over and over and over again, and it, it, and it grew into a large uh, mass, I guess, the best way to describe it, of data. As, as a result, Mr. Blumenthal's computer failed. It could not take that uh, massive amount of information. So uh, he called over, and our IST people uh, worked with him to correct his system, and the issue then arose we have this email that had been sent over and over and over again. Um, what do we need to do about it? And the information that I was uh, provided was is that it, the, the email's substance was uh, in that mask identical. Duplicates of this email were created. Uh, the director of the office of administration made a determination in consultation with counsel's office, White House, uh, office of uh, general counsel and the office of administration that. Uh, the email should be uh, preserved, and it has, it has been preserved, uh, and uh, the duplicates, the same email over and over and over again, that mass of, of information um, has been uh, deleted so that it doesn't jam uh, the system and cause system failures. Um, that's what we have, that's what I, I the information I have. Yeah, that came from uh, the English or the uh, American Embassy in England? Yes, it, um, the um, U.S. Embassy in England is, is, is the source of that looped email that sent those duplicate emails over and over and over again. You, you don't think that perhaps <clears throat> it was an attempt by the United Kingdom of terrorist attack on the White House uh, computer system? I, I, I don't believe that the United Kingdom launched uh, a terrorist attack on the United States uh, in the form of this. Don't email you think group. we ought to have a congressional <laughs> investigation on that? <laughs> no, sir, I do not. <laughs> it, uh, it's one of those things that happens. Well, I, I, I was suspicious because the other night I, I watched a program of the president in the executive office building 
riding a bicycle and there was present uh, another individual on a bicycle and I think it may have been the Prime Minister of England and I was wondering whether there's a seizure going on at that time. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I have no knowledge on the bicycle uh, episode uh, sir, but I, I can say that I hope that the floor was cleaned after he was done. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. <laughs> there is damage to the hood of my car, however. Uh, <laughs> who's next? Mr. Uh, Mr. Shays. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, my challenge is when you don't have an honest president, you wonder if those who work for a dishonest president are telling the truth. So. I start out with that basic question mark. I still want to know who hired Craig Livingstone, the young man in the White House who had possession of over 800 sensitive FBI files, almost entirely on Republicans. And um, I want to know who he allowed to see those files. Now, the interesting thing is Inside Magazine suspected that the First Lady hired him, but I wouldn't make that um, determination based on what Insight Magazine said. So I'm not even at the level of trusting, uh, but verifying. I have a lot of suspicions, and I have little trust that this White House is telling us the truth. And I realize that you are, for the most part, career people who work for the White House, <clears throat> but I know other career people who work for the White House. They worked for the travel office and they were fired and then the FBI and the IRS were <clears throat> forced to look at them because I don't know why. Um, and then you have this email mess at the White House, which only heightens my suspicion. So, you know, have a little patience with me and I hope Mr. Waxman will as well. Um, I know 120 people have basically taken the fifth or fled the country. 79 people have taken the Fifth Amendment. They don't want to answer questions. So there hasn't been much cooperation. Now, what I do know is that two years ago, in May of 1998, uh, it was discovered that we had a missing emails problem. And I do know in 1998, on the 18th, we had a test. And I do know almost two years ago, on June 19th, the White House counsel, Mr. Ruff, was told of the problem by Mr. Lindsley. Now, from June 19 to November 20th, the problem wasn't solved. So we still had a continuation of the problem. And I do know this, that no one from the White House told this committee. Now, we have Mr. Ruff telling us in 97 that we had all relevant information and that we had a complete document of the emails. So he was on file before this committee telling us we had the documents, and then he knew in June 19th. Now, I realize that's not both of you, but I just want you to have a sense of, of the challenge we have. Now, then there was the Insight magazine in November 98, but, you know, Insight has made accusations that, pretty incredible accusations about the president that none of us would want to believe. Then we knew in the 20th of this year from the Washington Times, it got to be a little more credible, and then Northrop Grumman on March 23rd came and testified. And then, in my judgment, the White House came clean. Now, what happened, what happened during that time? We have 246,000 emails that we don't know about, that weren't transmitted. Now, some of them may not be relevant, but there are 246,000. And they're interesting people. They're Betty Curry, they're Ira Magaziner, they're uh, Phil Kaplan. Now, why would I be interested in what Phil Kaplan has to say? He's the gentleman whose office, he's the special assistant to the president and deputy staff secretary, office of the staff secretary. His job is the conduit in which all messages to the president come. And this is one email that we happened to discover because it didn't disappear in these 246,000 emails that we can't find, that you can't find. And this is a memo informing the president that because of a failure to comply with the law, they're going to be fined $1 million potentially in fines, uh, campaign fines. This was from Ira Mag this was, excuse me, from Harold Ickes, but it's under Phil Kaplan. Now, Phil Kaplan has 944 potential emails. I want to know how many other potential emails like this we haven't found. 
And then you have memos from Mr. Lindsay, 17. You have Ira Magaziner, 3,693. You have uh, Bill Clinton, too. You have Betty Curry as well. So, no. The problem is, we need to know the truth. And what I'm hearing is that you all told the White House counsel everything you know. The question I have is, were you surprised that the White House counsel, given what you knew, didn't notify us of the problem? I'll ask you, Mr. Heisner. I guess I would not be privy to the uh, communications between White House counsel and uh, this committee. Is it your testimony that um, we knew about this problem? I have no knowledge. With I want you to be real careful with this one, okay? I want you to be careful with my question. The question is, did you have any understanding that maybe this information had not been made public and forwarded to the committee? Was this something that the public knew about or did you know about? Um, the question is, did I have any knowledge of the communications between uh, the White House counsel and this committee and of information that we provided? And is the answer correct? is no, correct? Uh, the answer is, I have no knowledge of the information that was forwarded. Or Let me just ask this final question then, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you're aware that this was called Project X, and you're aware that you didn't like that term. Um, it is your knowledge, isn't it, that you knew that the public didn't know about this? I can't say that, sir. I don't know that for certain. So you never suspected, you thought, you never suspected that this was information just kept within the White House? and and it wasn't made public, you're, you're going to be on record as saying, given your response about the Project X, you want to be on record as suggesting that you don't know whether or not the public and the press were aware of this issue? I would have to speculate, sir. And what uh, is your speculation? My speculation with respect to what do you term Project X? It's difficult, sir. It's difficult to say whether that information was made public or not. Um, Did you think it was made public? It's possible that it was made public, yes. Did uh, you think it was made public? I don't know, sir. Are you we don't know what you thought? Well, if it were my speculation, uh, I would uh, suspect that it would become public uh, perhaps through, uh, perhaps indirectly through, uh, communications between uh, individuals and the press, uh, I really don't know. Don't you think that a reasonable person like you would have come to the conclusion that if there were 246 potential emails that hadn't been forwarded to the committee um, and there was no public discussion of it, that the public probably didn't know about it? It was, it was my responsibility to pass the information through channels. Uh, after it left that sphere, uh, I did not follow up on what actually was made public or not. It was not something that I was... I'm I sorry, was I'll just issue. end with this question then. Did you object to this being referred to as Project X? Yes, I did, because it gave a sinister uh, connotation to uh, what I consider it was a uh, mechanical, yeah. technical failure, and it deserved to be uh, named properly as an arms... So you can understand failure. why I would be cynical yeah. when I saw that memo. Sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Davis, I think we have time for you, and then we'll head for the vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, Mr. Heisler, would you say that your basic responsibilities are technical in nature or analytical or policy analysis? I mean... That's correct, sir. I think I view our responsibilities as being uh, technicians that provide the uh, information systems technology to deliver that uh, technology to the policymakers and administrators. 
So the analysis of public opinion, public awareness, uh, public scrutiny, public involvement, that's not a part of, of what you're expected to do? That's correct, sir. All right. Mr. Lyle, um, let me just ask, are you satisfied that you've complied with the basic responsibilities of your office uh, relative to compliance, given the technical problems that have existed or the, the technical difficulties of generating the information? Yes, sir. Um, do you feel that you've been involved in any way, in any stonewalling, delaying, circumventing, denying, unwillingness to come forth with, with information that you could provide? No, sir. In fact, just the opposite. I, I believe I have been cooperative as well as my staff. Thank you very much. I have no other questions, Mr. Chairman. We have a series of votes on the floor. We will stand in recess. I'll ask you gentlemen to stick around. We're sorry, sorry we have to hold you for a little while. We have a few more questions for you, and we'll be back shortly. We stand in recess to follow the gavel. bring you more of yesterday's hearing in just a moment. This note, testifying today before the House Government Reform Committee, former White House Counsel Charles Ruff. Our cameras will be there to cover that, and we'll show it to you tonight. Check our schedule updates for airtimes, or click on cspan.org. Uh. Coming up, more from yesterday's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. And following the hearing, live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the U.S. Senate, with more debate on the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Oklahoma Congressman J.C. Watts will be on this morning's Washington Journal. The GOP conference chairman will discuss legislative priorities to be debated in the House, including tax reform, prescription drugs, and free trade. He'll also take your questions and comments by phone, fax, and email. Other guests on today's program, political editor for the London Evening Standard, Charles Rice. Also, Thomas Blanton from the National Security Archive. He'll talk about previously classified government documents, ranging from the Bay of Pigs invasion to CIA activities in Iran and Chile. Washington Journal gets underway live at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific, on our companion network, C-SPAN. Saturday night on American Perspectives, former Senate Majority Leaders Robert Byrd and Bob Dole talk about the history and significance of the Senate. Then Jason Natsky, the youngest mayor in America, elected at age 19, discusses youth and politics. You ever drive down a street and the street's so bumpy and you say to yourself, gee, I wish they'd fix that street? Or you look at an old building that's falling down, and you say, gee, I wish somebody would, I wish they would rehabilitate that building or it's so bad, you say, gee, I wish they'd just knock it down. Absolutely. But don't you ever wonder who they are? <laughs> Who's they? We always say they, but we never know who they are. Well, I always, as growing up, I always wanted to be they. I always wanted to be a guy that could get something done. American Perspectives, Saturday night at 8 o'clock, Eastern and Pacific, on our companion network, C-SPAN. Now more from yesterday's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. The House Government Reform Committee is examining a computer glitch in the archiving system at the White House and why some email was never turned over to investigators. Testifying from the White House, the director of the Office of Administration and a computer specialist. Coming up later, you'll hear from Assistant Attorney General Robert Rabin. This portion of the hearing is about three hours.
while we're waiting for uh, Mr. Barr, Congressman Barr, and a couple others who have some concluding questions, uh, we'll go ahead and yield to the uh, council who has some questions regarding the uh, uh, appropriations process and uh, the appearance of the White House before that committee. Mm -hmm. Mr. Heisner, good afternoon. Mr. Lau, good afternoon. I just wanted to try and establish one thing, Mr. Heisner. Uh, from our perspective, you were in charge of, or one of the people in charge of fixing the email problem. It was a problem that was discovered in June of 1998. Uh, the email we were talking about earlier, you, you wrote in February of 1999. That's over half a year after the problem was discovered. And from our perspective, you were supposed to be one of the problem solvers. Now. If you didn't have the people or the money to fix the problem, from our perspective, it seems you had to know that there wasn't going to be any progress, that the problem wasn't going to get solved. One of, our, one of the questions we really want to have answered is, what did you do to fix the problem? Uh, I became involved in the resolution of the problem uh, very late in 1998. Uh, the environment in which we worked, uh, there was a great deal of ambiguity about roles and responsibilities. The uh, recovery of uh, Mail2 server uh, had not been uh, given to me until then, and then it was a meeting uh, with Mr. Berry and uh, somebody else that we mutually agreed that this is a responsibility that would fall within the systems integration development branch. So this was maybe December of uh, 1998. Uh, at that point, Mr. Berry was uh, taking the responsibility for uh, uh, reviewing the processes that were going on that, uh, to make sure that what he called the bleeding stopped. I, mean, I, I don't want to cut you off here. I don't have a lot of time. What I'm looking for is the affirmative steps you actually took to solve the problem. Did you ask for money? Did you ask for more people? Did you complain to your management that things weren't going forward? What, what affirmatively did you do to make this problem go away? Okay, I reported to my management the need for mediation. Uh, I was aware of that. In fact, the uh, documentation you have shows that I uh, provided the new director uh, of OA, of uh, ISNT, with uh, details as to the situation that was involved. I made some recommendations about our mediation. Uh, the process had to go through proper channels, would go through a uh, COTR, contracting right. officer, representative, to Northrop Grumman, uh, whose staff was performing the day-to-day -day operations and were also looking at a way of uh, correcting the current problem. Right. Now, now we've seen the documentation, and, and I'm very sympathetic to the career people that were involved in the process because it appears they were very frustrated. Mr. Barry appeared to be frustrated. You appeared to be frustrated from looking at the documents. But what we're trying to find is, is there, is there a tangible expression of somebody moving forward before uh, February of the year 2000? And that's what we're trying to find here. I, we, we, we know all the explanations, but you know, we, we haven't seen a request for money. We haven't seen a request for people. And we're, we're hoping you can help us out of that dilemma. Did you ever ask for money? Uh, it was implicit that we would need funding to perform that work because there was no funding under the current contract with Northrop Grumman to perform that work. Now, let me just stop you there for a minute. Mr. Lyle came in for an interview last week, and he told us that money was not an issue. Money was not needed. That was not the problem. You're sitting here today telling us that it was implicit that money was needed to move forward, which makes perfect sense to us. It seems that if you had a problem to fix and you didn't have the money and the people, you had to get it. And so our, our, our issue here is you just told us that, that you needed to get money. Is that correct? Uh, the issue was that we needed to receive uh, funding to proceed with the mail to uh, server uh, remediation uh, task. Okay, now the, the simple question, I guess, is if you needed to receive money to proceed, did you ever ask for it? It was implicit in the, in the uh, request, in the uh, uh, statement of work we received from Northrop Grumman, which indicated uh, that the cost to develop a system uh, to uh, 
correct the, uh, to, to restore, to retrieve and restore the data uh, would be on the order of $600,000. And that went through proper channels to my management, at which point I was awaiting authorization to proceed. Okay, now, but I understand it was implicit in, in what Northrop Grumman is uh, giving to you. In fact, we've seen letters saying that they weren't going to proceed or do anything unless they got formal authorization. We understand what Northrop Grumman did. What I'm looking for is somebody on the other side, on the White House side, saying you are to move forward and, at the same time, asking for money to enable them to move forward. Because if they weren't going to be funded, it's clear to us from the documents received that they, they were not going to move forward. And so I, I, I have not seen. Did you have a document where you signed something that said, I would like congressional funding to move forward? Not to my recollection that there is, is there a document that requests the funding, but uh, there are documents that indicate that uh, ISNT was waiting for obtaining approval to proceed associated with uh, funding being made available to us. And waiting, who was supposed to be, who are you waiting for? Okay, well, the issue went through channel, proper channels. It would go to the director of, uh, of ISNT, and from there would go to the director of OA and perhaps general counsels to be addressed. Right, those are the channels. Correct. So you were waiting for directions from your superiors. Is that That's a fair correct? I was waiting for direction to proceed along with the funding that was required okay. to do that. Did you ever get direction from your. Let me interrupt. You knew about the subpoenas, though, because you said earlier in your testimony that you were aware of subpoenas and you had seen some of the subpoenas. So you, you knew about the subpoenas and you knew nothing was being done and you didn't make a request for money to get the problem solved so that the subpoenas could be satisfied from the independent councils and the Congress? I have a document here. It has a uh, bait stamp number E3877. I think it's their number 92. And it would be your number 92, exhibit 92, if I might uh, point your attention to that, and it might help understand, perhaps, or explain. As you see, uh, this is a document which describes the uh, current uh, state of the mail shoe reconstruction. And uh, at the very bottom, it says current status, awaiting funding and management decision to proceed. And that's where I stood. I was waiting for that to happen. I might have had informal conversations. I don't recall having any formal documentation that would show that I would keep on asking uh, how soon may we proceed with this. So, I mean, just to, to, to make sure we're fair to you, it's, it's fair you're waiting for directions from your superiors on how to proceed. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Did you ever get directions from your superiors to move forward? No, sir. At any time before the year 2000, did any manager of yours ever come and say, you must do something to get this fixed? No, sir. Okay. Now, Mark Lindsay, who testified before us is going to come before us tomorrow again. He told us under oath a few weeks ago, quote, my first instruction and my first belief was to do whatever was necessary to fix the computer problem. Now, did Mark Lindsay ever come to you and say, this is what we're going to do to fix the computer problem? No. Did he ever, and you're, you're the person that's managing this problem, did he ever come to you and ask you for work product to, uh, uh, a comprehensive plan as to how you're going to move forward? Uh, this was one of many tasks that we were involved in, and it was kept open until direction to proceed and funding would be made available. That's the status as it to state, and uh, that's how we operated then. But the question was, did he ever ask you to do anything? No. Not okay. Uh, he told us a couple weeks ago, my number one objective was to make sure that this problem was resolved. And again, you've just told us that he didn't actually ask you to do anything. Um, how, how does your inaction square with what Mr. Lindsay told us? Well, Mr. Lindsay and I would 
not be speaking on a uh, regular basis on business like this, the, the communications would go through channels. It would go from Mr. Lindsay to the director of uh, ISNT, and from there it would be funneled down to me. So this is not, would not be a topic of discussion that we would, uh, would uh, be engaged in, nor is it something that I would not see Mr. Lindsay all that often, and it would be usually just in a hallway, uh, would not be a conversation dealing with these issues. Sure, and I, I can understand that, but from our perspective, we're, we're trying to decide if this was a priority for Mr. Lindsay, as he told us, it, it, it seems fair for us to assume that at some point over the course of nearly two years, he would seek out the person who's in charge of the problem, and he would say to that person, you know, you must do this, and you've just told us that you did not receive directions from your superiors uh, to actually move forward with the project. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Now... We'll come back to the council in a minute. He has about 20 minutes left on his time. Mr. Barton. Uh, Mr. Heisner, going back, please, uh, to Exhibit 81, uh, which was the subject of some earlier discussions. Uh, the 5 February 99 uh, email. Uh, turning your attention, as we uh, had discussed uh, earlier, one paragraph above the, above the let sleeping dogs lie comment is the break in the, in the text. Uh, the text says, we may not want to call undue attention to the issue by bringing the issue to the attention of the Congress because, and then it just, it just stops and then picks up a, a subsequent paragraph later on. Uh, why, why is there material missing uh, there? The uh, assumption that there is some material missing is not correct. Uh, the original presentation of this paragraph, as I'm looking at this, it looks like it is one sentence that starts with while and ends with a period after declining. So there's a clause while. And, and ends where? Uh, at the bottom of the, uh, just above the leads, let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, once no, I, I, I don't think that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, the last three lines begin last year's with a capital L. Uh, that's a new sentence. Not, no, sir, that's not the way I communicate. Uh, in the original, there is a bullet there, and uh, it's my practice uh, that, uh, to capitalize the first word following a bullet. The bullet does not show, that, show this. You can see because, then it has the first line. There's a but comma. When you, say, when you say a bullet, you mean... Uh, what's found at the bottom of the page? Uh, yes, uh, the bullet that's at the top would be would have been a graphic. That's what's inserted when I typed in the text, and it would be uh, a circle that's fully filled. It's a graphic which does not uh, reproduce apparently in the uh, records managed uh, records that are restored. The uh, bottom part came from a uh, an. Uh, Word document where I actually entered to the bullets by using lowercase o's, and there they show. Right. Uh, as I see that, that uh, issue information request, to me, that's one sentence. I could have said one, two, three, and if I had said that, it would have saved all of us a lot of uh, speculating and questions. Uh, the intention was because one, two, Three, and you can see the punctuation there. It's a comma at the end of the first line, a comma, and an who, and. Who, who typed the, the bottom half of the page be, below the double dashed line? Who typed that? I did, sir. Uh, you're a very precise typist. Uh, I, I commend you for well, that. Thank you. You use proper uh, grammar. You start sentences with a capital letter. You end them with a period. Uh, you have a paragraph break where there ought to be a paragraph break. Uh, so what you're telling me basically is you use two entirely different, to believe that you use two entirely different writing styles. The writing style at the top, uh, where, you, where you have the word because, unlike every place else, you don't have a colon there before you list bullet items. Uh, and unlike every place else in the document, uh, where you,
begin each bullet item with a capital uh, uh, letter and end each one with a final punctuation, a period, for example. You don't do that here. Uh, and you're saying that that's simply because some of the graphics didn't get picked up? That's correct. In the first uh, case, uh, I used what's called an unordered list, which had three clauses. This, this is one sentence with several clauses. Uh, in the second part, uh, there is a list of items, and I use a colon, and then you see the items that are listed are full sentences. They stand by themselves. Uh, the, the first information request uh, part is essentially one sentence. And it's just like saying, because one, two, three, or A, B, C, or item, 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 uh, period. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and I suppose that's one explanation. It just, so what you're saying is, you have this break in the first paragraph, not because there's any information that's not there, but because there was something different about this first paragraph that had graphics that weren't picked up as they were in the bottom? That's correct, sir. Uh, in the first paragraph, the, uh, the method of entry was different from the method of entry in the second paragraph. Uh, when you use, uh, when I use uh, the uh, Lotus Notes email software and I provide lists of items, I can go and highlight those three sentences and specify that I would like to have a bulleted list. And the uh, software inserts uh, graphics that cannot be normally that were not retained in the uh, in the records management uh, software. Let, it, let me interrupt. The, the gentleman's time's expired. I'm going to yield him my time. But I just want to ask Mr. Heisner a question uh, that's consistent with what you're asking. Have you conducted a manual search of your emails in response to the committee subpoena? And uh, did you find a copy of your Let Sleeping Dogs Lie email? And if you did this manual search, did you find the bullet points? And why don't we have them? Uh, I performed the search, I printed off the documents, and uh, I submitted those documents through proper channels uh, as the process uh, called. Through proper channels? You mean through the... It would be through uh, someone, Krista Moyle in, in uh, OA, in ISNT, collects the uh, documents. Okay, so, so, so you, you, the bullet points were on there then? That's correct. And you they, submitted them through the, through the White House through proper channels? I submitted them through proper channels. And so why don't we have them? I have no knowledge. Uh, so the proper channel, someplace along the way, there was a block as far as those uh, bullet points were concerned because we don't have them. All I can think is that the, there were two copies of the same document, and this copy came out of records management of the ARM system. It was this copy that was submitted rather than the paper copy that I provided. Yeah, well, I the think paper the, copy I provided, sir, looks exactly like this, except it has those graphics. Those I, I understand, but the point is you ran those through proper channels so that they would come to the committee. That's correct. And we never got them. And uh, you don't have an explanation why, and I'm not saying it's your fault, but somebody along the chain of command evidently felt like they shouldn't be given to the Congress for some reason. We'll try to find that out tomorrow, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lyle, uh, turn, if you would, please, to Exhibit 6. I'm sorry, Mr. Barr. Turn, if you would, please, to Exhibit 6. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that Exhibit 6 is a set of briefing papers that you circulated uh, in a meeting in January of this year uh, with uh, Beth Noel and Council of the President. Is that correct? I believe this was circulated, um, if you look at the top, um, it was provided by, on the 13th of January by Kate Anderson to Beth Nolan. Uh, so that these, these were, this was a, a paper that was circulated at, at, at that meeting? Yes, it, with, was, with it, was, Nolan. it was used at this meeting, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did Ms. Nolan at that time ask uh, how these problems, that is the mail to and letter D problems, affected subpoena compliance or compliance with subpoenas? Uh, in the course of the discussions of these anomalies, um, Ms. Nolan asked something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing um, when I say this, but something along the lines of, um, uh, how would this affect a, a prior search um, relative to a subpoena? 
something in that, um, as I recall it, in that area. And what was your response to her inquiry? I said that, um, that the issue was relative to the uh, subpoena question that she was asking had been dealt with uh, prior by um, Mr. Lindsay and, and Mr. Ruff, and that I didn't know the extent of what those discussions were because I wasn't there or privy to them. Was that the end of that discussion? Um, I, no, I mean, this, relative to the question about subpoena or about the briefing? Subpoenas. Uh, I believe that we offered to check uh, with Mr. Lindsay. I believe that was uh, something that Kate Anderson had said uh, to check with, with him on did he in fact have that discussion with Mr. Ruff. And what follow-up did you undertake? After the meeting, um, Kate Anderson and I went to meet with Mr. Lindsay. Who, who, who did? Kate Anderson and myself, Catherine Anderson, went and met with Mr. Lindsay uh, and confirmed that he had, in fact, handled that uh, with Mr. Ruff prior. Okay, Mr. but what you mean by that is Mr. Lindsay, uh, I presume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, assured you that, it, that the matter had been handled? That he had, yes, that he had had discussions with Mr. Ruff relative to the, uh, the anomaly. Do you, know, do you know anything further about those discussions between Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Ruff? No, sir, I do not. Did he relate any details of it to you? No. But you left satisfied that it had been taken care of? Yes. One of, one of the problems, Mr. Chairman, that, that I see here, and, uh, and it, these two lines of questioning are, are, are related, you can have a subpoena, Mr. Chairman, and as counsel knows, certainly uh, come in uh, asking comprehensively for all documents and records and exhibits and so forth. And what we're seeing here is if you pull different, the same information out in, in different formats, you get somewhat different information. Now it can be explained in a way so that maybe it has the same stuff, but of course, as the chairman knows and as the council knows, there can be very important subtle differences simply by uh, the way information is formatted, uh, the way it is punctuated, the, it, the way it is broken, the way it is highlighted, and so forth. Uh, and this also goes to, I think, your concern expressed earlier, Mr. Chairman, uh, that uh, if a subpoena comes in and only partial information is returned, uh, that can create a problem. Uh, whether or not that's obstruction certainly is something that uh, the authorities would want to look into. Even, uh, uh, even Mr. Waxman indicated that certainly if there has been obstruction, he would want it looked into. But these are the sort of nagging questions that I think are very relevant to, uh, to this committee, to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, probably to the independent counsel as well, and certainly would have been relevant to us in our impeachment inquiry, uh, asking for full, accurate, complete, information, uh, and if we were getting, as now uh, is obvious, uh, at best, only one version of information, and there are other versions still out there, uh, that raises some very, very substantial questions in my mind as a former prosecutor and as a member of this and the, and the uh, Judiciary Committee, which I think are shared by the Chairman and the Council. Chairman uh, yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Wagner. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman doesn't have any questions. The uh, council has 20 minutes on his time, and uh, Mr. Shays has said that he'd like for the council to continue questioning for a while. So, uh, council. I'm going to go into a new, um, slightly different area of questioning. Let me tell you what it is before we go there so you understand. Um, we discussed your memorandum earlier, the, the sleeping dogs or the email, the sleeping dogs law email, and you explained that um, this, was, this pertained to information requests. Well, there are other documents we have, and I'm going to ask both Mr. Lyle and Mr. Heisner about them, where it seems that uh, there were indications about this problem, the, the problem being the email problem, and the information was taken out of documents. And from our perspective, and I want you to help me work through this, it seems that when information is taken out of a document, whether it's a briefing material or some type of uh, uh, memorandum for a superior, then that makes it difficult to move forward with a solution to the problem. Now, Mr. Lyle, if you would, please take a look at Exhibit 84 in the book in front of you. It's an email from yourself to uh, Joseph Kuba. My understanding, Mr. Kuba, is a, a budget 
uh, person at the Office of Administration. Now, in this email, you say, uh, it's very short, it's very succinct, Joe, please correct the budget materials, uh, re-OA, by removing the bullet point relating to mail to reconstruction. And you came in for an interview last week, and you explained to us why you sent this email. And your explanation was you wanted the bullet point removed because it was incorrect. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to ask you, instead of removing the bullet point, why didn't you correct the bullet point? Why didn't you make the information accurate? Well, let me ex explain to you, give you a context so that you understand what this was. This is a... Uh, series of emails that uh, occurred in connection with a internal presentation that the budget financial management division was preparing for the assistant to the president for management and administration. Um, on a periodic basis, uh, financial management division professionals would brief the assistant to the president for management and administration with respect to the executive office of the president accounts, each appropriation that exists within them the burn rate in terms of the funds that are available, what the expenditures are. With respect to the Office of Administration's appropriation, um, a email was sent around by Mr. Kuba, who is uh, one of our budget folks in the Financial Management Division, very hardworking uh, individual. And he uh, had included in there a discussion, uh, a possible bullet point for the assistant to the president. Uh, that uh, said uh, that was relative to the Armstrong resolution account. That Armstrong resolution account is, is the funding source that is used with respect to the automated records management system. Right, but, but if I may, let me, let, me just, let me just get to my question because I, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have an awful lot of time. The, the question is that somebody wanted to communicate something about the email problem, Mr. Kuba did, and you know, Mr. Kuba is not here. We'll talk to him at a later date. Right. But um, he wanted to communicate something. You thought what he was communicating was wrong, but nevertheless, he wanted to communicate something about the email problem. And and your response, rather than saying, "Why don't you correct your bullet point because it's wrong?" Your response was, "Why don't you delete the bullet point?" So it seems like you had opted to delete instead of disclose the information. And let, let's, I want to move on to another document. The reason I uh, instructed that is because it was flat out wrong. Right, but that's what I've, I've admitted and, to that. And there was no, in other words, I didn't want to leave anything in a, a briefing to the assistant of the president for management and administration that came out of my office or folks from my office that had incorrect information. Right, so this, this goes to my the question. Best, the best way to eliminate any confusion about it is to say it's wrong and correct it. Simple as that. That's why I did it. But and that's, and that's, also that's, the best way that's not how to you correct this information. That's how I corrected it. No? And it Fair made perfect enough. sense to do so because it was wrong. Okay. No, I understand. I mean, I, I understand your concern, but our concern is that, you know, well, there's a document here that talked about the email problem. You had an opportunity to communicate something, and you, you chose to do what you did. And we but understand why you did. Mr. Wilson, that, that information was an internal document between my office, my agency at the time, I was the general counsel, but my agency and the assistant to the president, Virginia Puzo. And it was, it was in the context of a briefing for that budget preparation. She, she was aware of the email to Anomaly, as you know. So what we were correcting was, dis, in, was incorrect information because it, it stated a conclusion that was flat out right. incorrect. Is it fair to say that the ultimate document had no reference to the mail to problem in it at all? The ultimate, the ultimate document that was prepared had no reference to the mail-to problem at correctly all. Correctly so, that, that, that it should not have any, there should be no indication in the Armstrong Resolution account relative to email two, which, by the way, is a conclusion that our appropriators have acknowledged and agree with in a correspondence that we just received to them in connection with our request to use funds to do an email to reconstruction out of the Armstrong Resolution account. L so, let, me, let me interrupt, because I'm not sure I understand this. When, when the White House went to the appropriators to ask for funding, they did not ask for any money to correct the email problem. Is that correct? No, sir. On March 20th, we requested Mr. March Lindsay March 20th wrote, of when? March 20th of 2000. Mr. Well, Lindsay. No, no, that's of 2000. I'm talking about prior to that. Prior 
prior to March 20th of 2000. Yeah. I'm, I'm not aware of I any. I mean, we're talking about this the problem occurring back in September of 1996. Uh, uh, and it was discovered in 1998. Did anybody ask for any money to correct the email problem or to go through and reconstruct everything and bring it up to date? Not starting there and going forward, but going back to 1996 and, and, and getting all the information that was relevant to all these investigations, getting to the Congress. Did anybody ask for the money for that? The, there were two components to the uh, email to anomaly. There was the first component, which you have been talking about, which was the I, I just uh, correction. Need a yes or, I just need a yes or no answer. Well, but Did it, no, let, let me I, I'm, I'm sorry. A yes or no answer. Did they, in 1998 or thereabouts, ask for the money to reconstruct all of the emails instead of starting there and going forward? Did they ask for the money to go back and correct the, the several hundred thousand emails that were missing? The portion of the problem that was corrected in November of 1998 did not require additional funds. That's, that was stopped. In other words, that the, the Armstrong failure to capture income so emails they did was not stopped. Ask for any money to go, they did not ask for any money to go back and to get those emails that had been missed since September of 1996. You're talking about the reconstruction from the backup yes. tapes? Yes. The, f the first request that I'm aware of was by Mr. Lindsay on March 20th of 2000, okay. where we asked, that, that, where he no, asked. That, that answers my question. They did not ask for any money to reconstruct that prior to the year 2000. That's correct. Thank you. Now, Mr. Heisner, I wanted to ask you about a different document. And again, I don't want to just come out of the out of the blue on uh, on this issue, I'll, I'll explain to you what my thinking is, and hopefully you can help us, you can educate us here. You tell us what documents so that he can. Well, I'll, let me let me explain the issue first, then you'll have an opportunity to re re review, review it. You know, fr from our perspective, there there seems to be a simple proposition: either the White House had the money and the personnel to fix the problem, and it simply decided to ignore the problem, or the White House didn't have the money or didn't have the personnel and it chose not to take the steps necessary to get help. Now, a couple of weeks ago, one of your former colleagues, Paulette Sichon, was asked if the Office of Administration didn't have the money and it didn't have the personnel, how could it fix the email problem? And her answer was very, very instructive. She said, we couldn't do it. Now, that's easy for us to understand. If they didn't have the money and they didn't have the people, they couldn't fix the problem. It, seem, it seems to us, and I'll get to this document in a moment, that if you, if you needed help to solve the problem, and if you didn't ask for help to solve the problem, the only possible explanations are you didn't really want to solve the problem. Now, if you would, please take a look at exhibit number 94 in the book in front of you. Here we have a, what appears to be a forwarded email from you to uh, another Office of Administration employee named Chris DeMoyle. It's dated February 24, 1999, so it's fairly close to the beginning of 1999, again, about six months after the problem was first identified. Uh, the, the subject line of the email is draft hearing preparation paper, and when you, when you read this email, it appears to us that someone was trying to inform Congress of the email problem. Now, in this email, you have two versions of a bullet point about the, two, the mail to problem. One is labeled current version, and the other is labeled, quote, more nearly accurate version. So the, the threshold question is here, did you draft the, the more nearly accurate version of the mail to bullet point that's in this document? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, so that was something that you prepared. Correct. All right. Now, I'd like to go over to um, Exhibit 134, if I can, please. It's, it's a multiple-page document. Uh, it appears to be a draft uh, hearing preparation paper. It says draft at the top. The date is February 24, 1999. So again, 
early 1994, but it's, it's dated the same day that you, you drafted the more nearly accurate version message in the email that we looked at a moment ago. And what I really would like you to do, if you, if you would please, is, is look at the very bottom of page four and the top of page five. Now, there's a bullet point in this draft document. It's a hearing preparation paper. Uh, and it, it's, it's got an underlined heading. It says, Mail to Reconstruction. And the interesting point from our perspective is that it's crossed out. There's a wavy line that goes through the entire bullet point. Now, apparently, it was crossed out by Katherine Anderson, who's a lawyer in the Office of Administration. Now, I guess the first thing I want to ask you is, is this the, the language that you drafted in the uh, email where you wrote you know, more nearly accurate version? Not exactly your language. It's close. It seems to be uh, the uh, contents or a paraphrase, a perhaps slightly modified uh, version of the information I provided in the more and nearly accurate version of the uh, February 24 email. Good. Well, we appreciate the fact that you provided accurate information in a paper that was for draft hearing purposes. And what we see is something that's crossed out. Do you know whether this uh, section was removed because someone did not want Congress to know about the email problem? Uh, I don't know anything about this. This is the first time I've seen this document, sir. Yeah. So it, it's fair to characterize. You wrote something that you thought was accurate. It was put in a, a briefing paper document. It, and I'm not saying you have to have contemporaneous knowledge of this, but you're looking at something now that was removed. And uh, you have no further knowledge about it than that. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Who is this draft memo to? Can you identify it by a number? Well, the one we were just talking about. Who was that draft memo? The one he's never seen or the one he, he made? Exhibit one. The one that has the crossed out part. Exhibit 134, I don't know. It's not clear from this document to whom it is written. Don't and we have our, the cover yeah, page? Our, I mean, our understanding is it was a, a memorandum prepared in anticipation of congressional hearings. Do you have any reason to know that that's not correct? That seems a very reasonable assumption, sir. But to whom would it be addressed? I mean, who would this go to? Wouldn't just go in a dead letter file. Who would it go to? I, I don't know. Uh, again, this is the first time I've seen this, and normally I'm not privy to uh, documentation. But you, but, but you prepared this document, you said? I prepared one, one paragraph, sir. The oh, end. the one paragraph yeah, you prepared? Just at one item at the very end. I see. It includes okay. text that I prepared in an, in an email. Okay. Mr. Vile, do you know, that, do you know that whether this was a uh, document prepared in advance of hearing? Yes. Thank you. It, it was. Okay. It's a draft Thank document that was. Now, um, do you know whether the final version of this document uh, ended up with no reference whatsoever to the mail to reconstruction problem? And to answer your question, Chairman Burton, this um, would be used to prepare the director of the Office of Administration to testify for the Appropriations Committee, which at the time was Mr. Lindsay, who was fully aware of this email to um, uh, anomaly that's included in this draft. Um, and then to answer your question, the final version did not uh, contain um, reference to the email to uh, So, so the, crossed, the crossed out uh, 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 paragraph there uh, was not in the final uh, version. Now, who prepared the final version? Well, the final, ver final version uh, was prepared jointly by me and my staff in preparation for uh, inclusion in the book. Well, why was that paragraph left out? The reason that um, the paragraph was left out is because the information that's being included was in preparation for the fiscal year 2000 appropriations hearing, um, which occurred in 1999. And the issues in this paper, if you look through it, discuss either ongoing projects or 
uh, the future um, requests for funding uh, that uh, we would be seeking from the appropriators, the office. But of why were the emails? Why was that paragraph on the emails left out? Because uh, the the request for appropriations was uh, not going to be requesting um, funds for the email to reconstruction. Why? Because a decision was made uh, that uh, that the project had to be deferred in lieu of the Y2K crisis that but we But Congress were. Has, sub has submitted subpoenas for these documents as well as the independent councils and the Justice Department and everybody else. And so you're saying action was deferred intentionally absolutely because of not. the Y2K problem? No, sir, absolutely not. The, the, as I said earlier, the people in the Office of Administration, myself and my staff, were unaware of any issues in terms of the uh, uh, subpoena compliance one way or another. Those communications had taken place earlier. We were, we were working um, without any indication one way or another that there was any issue relative Didn't to subpoena see, compliance. You, you, Mr. Heisner, who put that in there, he was aware of some subpoenas. He said that earlier in his testimony. He put that paragraph in. Didn't you ask him why he put that paragraph in? I, I wasn't aware that Mr. Heisner put the paragraph in, but I can tell you that in terms of what I believe Mr. Heisner said earlier, that he wasn't aware of, of what goes on in terms of the subpoena compliance. As I said before, issues relative to subpoena compliance are handled in the White House Counsel's Office. We provide information uh, on those. Mr. Wall, when we interviewed you last week, we asked you why no one was no one informed appropriators, congressional appropriators, before March 2000. And this was your answer, and we wrote it down verbatim. This is the quote. When you go to appropriators, they ask a lot of questions. Just read that again, because that is the verbatim quote. When you go to appropriators, they ask a lot of questions. Now, we didn't follow up, and I, I, I admit we were amiss. First of all, what, what's wrong with appropriators asking a lot of questions? I don't know what context you're referring to, sir. Well, we're talking about uh, a question put to you as to why, before March of 2000, uh, no one asked appropriators for money. Could you show me the question and then my answer? Well, well, we'll go back to that. We can put that to you in the form of a letter and go back at that point. Um, but I will ask this question. Why not? And this is a question that we want, we legitimately want you to help us here. And I am why, endeavoring why to help you. Why did you not look upon congressional testimony as an opportunity to tell Congress about this issue and inform them of the problems you faced, the money and personnel that you needed, and simply to tell Congress what the state of play was on this matter? I mean, we've got documents where bullet points are getting removed. They're, they're not going up the chain of command to people higher. It, it, from our perspective, and this is what we're trying to work through, it, it appears that you had an opportunity. And I know Mr. Barry wanted somebody to move forward, and Mr. Heisner appears to have done the right thing, and he's drafted this, the bullet point that got crossed out. It looks like a lot of the people were trying to do the right thing at the Office of Administration. Good career people were trying to do the right thing. And our simple question is, why did you not think, this is an opportunity, I can go and get help? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. All right, let me try it again. You're going to go before Congress. You're going to go before congressional appropriators. You had a problem. You had people who wanted to fix the problem. You had Mark Lindsay that said it was a priority of his, a first priority to fix this problem. You had people that knew that unless you had money and unless you had people to, to work on this problem, you weren't going to move forward. So why didn't you think this is a good opportunity? As a public servant, as a lawyer, an officer of the court, I can go to Congress. I can tell them about this problem. I can make myself right with the law. I can get help. And then we'll be able to fix the problem. You have to look at the context uh, in, at the time in terms of what was happening in the executive office of the president. There's a lot of things that you said in, in, in your preparatory statements. But you could to have told question. Congress the context. I'm sorry. You could have, you could have in, given Congress the context. Is that, uh, do you want me to answer that question or the question you asked before? Which, which, please. which, which question? Please continue. Please answer the first question and then I'll ask the okay. second question. The, the context that the Office of Administration was in at the time was the Y2K crisis that I discussed with you at length during our interview. That project was the number one priority.
priority. And it, it wasn't just in the number one priority within the executive office of the president. It was the number one priority government-wide in terms of information technology, nationwide and worldwide. I don't think that there's any dispute about that. The executive office of the president's computer system was in an antiquated condition and it needed to be taken from that state into a modernized Y2K compliant system. That was the number one priority that our appropriators and I believe this committee, Mr. Horn, I believe, was also keenly interested in our progress on how we were doing. Um, as you will recall, the goal was for government-wide uh, compliance let, let in March. Why didn't you at least put it in there and at least bring it up before the appropriators? Why not at least tell the appropriators we've got this problem, why 2 k is a priority, but this is a problem because Congress has subpoenaed documents, the Independent Council has, uh, the Justice Department has, and we can't get this without, uh, without additional personnel and money. Why didn't you just at least bring it up instead of crossing it out? I understand, Mr. Burton, again, the Office of Administration people and myself were operating without any knowledge of any concerns or issues relative to any subpoenas that this committee or any other source You knew about the email problem and you knew that it was we important. We knew that we had the backup tapes, that they were secure. Why didn't you at least ask for the, the, the money and the personnel to solve that problem, even though you had the Y2K problem? And again, as I explained to Mr. Colby, our appropriators, and as I said earlier, the Y2K issue was the top priority. I understand. I understand that. No, I understand that. But you could have you could have also put this in there. There wasn't one or the other. Well, it, why, it, why was it taken out? The project, the email to reconstruction project had to be deferred like a variety of other non Y2K projects because we had limited resources available to solve the number one crisis facing. But doesn't Congress have a role to play in the decision-making process on what priorities are? You were supposed to go before Congress and tell them what the, what the problems were. Y2K was a problem. The email was a problem. But you didn't even mention that. Why? The, 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 the Congress is certainly, uh, on a variety of issues, a place where we go, uh, and we have a very good relationship that we've forged with our appropriators. The request was submitted on March 20th. No, but why didn't you ask? Why didn't you have that in there? Because of the Y2K problem. The Y2K problem. Mr. Heisner, if I may go back to you for just a moment. If you go to Exhibit 94 again, it's the exhibit we were looking at a moment ago, the uh, email from yourself to Chris Moyle. Down the, down the bottom of the page, the very bottom, it says, current status. And it says, and I quote, awaiting funding and management decision to proceed. Is it fair to say, is it correct to say that this, the, the management decision and the funding decision was finally made in February and March of the year 2000? You didn't have any decision in 1998 or 1999. Is that fair? That's correct, sir. I think time's expired. Uh, we'll try to get back to those questions. Mr. Waxman's time now. Mr. Chairman, we'll take our half hour of council time. Okay. On this side, I want to yield to Mr. Shalero. If I were watching this on TV, Mr. Lyle and Mr. Heisner, I'd be confused because there seemed to be conversations about the same problem, but two separate applications. We have one email problem where in the ARMS Lotus interface, a number of emails were, were not captured by the system. As I understood Mr. Lindsay's testimony in a previous hearing, it was a priority for him to fix that prospectively. That was not your responsibility, was it, Mr. Heisner, to do the, the actual fix of the interface problem? That's correct, sir. That was the responsibility of the Northrop Grumman employees. So right. council was asking you questions before about whether Mr. Lindsay talked with you about that, because that was a priority of Mr. Lindsay's to fix it. But it would not have made any sense for Mr. Lindsay to talk with you about fixing that problem prospectively, because that was not your responsibility. That's correct. And when we look at the missing emails, we're re really looking at two different issues. And Mr. Lyle referred to this. There's a subpoena issue, whether emails were not produced in response to subpoenas. And then there's the issue you focus on, 
which is the archival responsibility. And is that why you wrote what you referred to before as Exhibit 92 and Council referred to as Exhibit 94? I believe the intent of the nearly more accurate uh, version was to describe the uh, status of the mail to reconstruction, the reconstruction of uh, mail non records managed email that was still residing on tapes but had not been uh, uh, recovered and put into narrow. But your focus wasn't on that issue in response to subpoenas. Your focus was because there was an archival responsibility to reconstruct these tapes at some point. That's correct. So when the chairman and others have asked you, have been asking questions about subpoenas, that wasn't in your mind at all at that point. You just had a responsibility to make sure the archives were correct for the future. That's correct. Uh, the responsibilities I saw had to do with the technical uh, issues in, number one, assuring that all the tapes were maintained, number two, to getting a system designed that would uh, enable the recovery of these records, and then number three, to perform the recovery eventually. And it would not have even been within your responsibility to be concerned with subpoenas when it came to this issue. My responsibility with re respect to subpoenas was to respond to them as I received them. So, again, in the context of reconstructing the missing emails, it was not presented to you in the context of responding to previous subpoenas. That's absolutely correct, sir. And when you wrote that email, and then it got picked up in the, in the briefing memo, but your responsibility in writing the email was not to inform Congress. Is that correct? You weren't, you weren't told you, you're writing this because you have to inform Congress of the problem. No, the intention was to uh, uh, clearly state the uh, problem as it uh, existed. Um, the uh, document that you're seeing, Exhibit 94, is must be out of it. Is uh, uh, part of Exhibit 92, and Just it shows the context in which this response took place. It seems that uh, Ms. Moyle asked me to explain what uh, Tony was Tony uh, was talking about. Uh, and so this is the uh, explanation, I believe. Because in the, uh, on, on the E3878, which is the second page with Exhibit 92, uh, Mr. Berry uh, described the situation and gave the information. And I was asked to uh, explain that. But again, I don't want to be redundant, but the yeah. context of this was not for you to inform Congress or for anyone there to inform Congress of a specific problem. It was for you to try to estimate how much it would cost to do this reconstruction for archival purposes. That's correct, sir. Mr. Lyle, was that your understanding as well? There are really two buckets of issues here, subpoenas and archival issues, and that when you came on board, your understanding, in fact, it's the understanding I think Mr. Lindsay had, was that the missing emails had no relevance to subpoena problems, because the White House Counsel's Office, had to, Beth Nolan had testified at this at the last hearing, had run a test in June of 98. Pursuant to that test, they concluded the missing material had already been provided to the independent counsel. And so th as far as they were concerned, there wasn't missing information. The operative thinking then became, we don't have a subpoena problem in terms of compliance. The problem was fixed prospectively. And so when we get to 1999, looking at the appropriations process, the question being faced is, do we need to provide, do we need to ask Congress for money to fix the archival problem, not anything in relation to subpoenas and information we may not have produced? That's right. We were asking for funds um, in our budget submission um, uh, for all kinds of, the, as I said, the Y2K issues. That uh, other aspect in terms of the email two project was one that had to be deferred, and it was only relative to, okay, we've got the backup tapes. They're, they're available. We've got them in our data center. They're secure uh, for the anomaly. The question then is, for purposes of arch archiving, for federal records, for presidential records, all of those purposes, 
that was the focus of the project. There were no issues in terms of subpoena compliance whatsoever that we were operating uh, under. And it was in that vein that we viewed the project at that, at that, at that time, which is why it was deferred with a variety of the other non-Y2K projects. And we focused all of our energy and efforts on the Y2K problem. We had the, the, the backup tapes secure in the data center, as I said, for the email two anomaly and for the letter D anomaly. Uh, and now, once Y2K had passed, we were in a position to go to Congress and provide them with information about the costs associated with a, with a reconstruction effort, possible contractors to do it, um, and, and how we were planning on, on proceeding, which took our uh, significant involvement from our uh, information technology experts within the Office of Administration, who had previously been dedicated to the Y2K problem. Now they were free to focus on the reconstruction project, which is exactly what we uh, have been doing and, and are currently uh, doing. And that would explain why that paragraph was crossed out of the briefing memo that they, you asked about before? Exactly, that, that uh, funding was not being requested at that time for uh, the email to uh, reconstruction uh, effort. We've asked for it in March of this year. Without any of that explanation that you just provided or Mr. Heisner provided, if someone were just looking at the paper evidence we have, one could speculate, well, maybe something was happening here and people did not want Congress to know because there's material crossed out. But neither of you are aware of any sentiment of doing that. Mr. Heisner, you were never in a position where you felt you had an affirmative duty to inform Congress and someone came to you and said you could not do that and you had to keep this quiet. That's absolutely correct, sir. Mr. Lyles, absolutely. With you. And you never heard any discussions in the White House, anybody in the halls talking about any effort to keep this quiet or keep it away from Congress? No. Mr. Heisner. Well, I'm pleased that we got that clarification because the chairman seemed very frustrated with the knowledge that we now have that some of those emails that had not been captured might not have been turned over to investigators, this committee and the independent counsel and other investigators. So he wanted to know why you didn't ask for this uh, capturing of those past emails as a priority for funding. But your explanation is you didn't even know anything about past emails not having been uh, 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 not made available to uh, all the investigators. That's right. Those matters were simply not handled in the Office of Administration. Now, Mr. Lyle, I want to ask you some questions about these several versions of talking points, some of which are dated February 24, 1999, which were produced to our committee. Uh, these documents are not, uh, numbered E4382-4406. Could you explain to us the purpose of these talking points? Who were they for and why were they prepared? Yes, sir. These are various drafts. It, 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 what you have marked in the book, Exhibit 132, it looks like through 132 through 134 is what I can see. These are draft uh, documents that um, were prepared by the Office of the General Counsel and the Office of Administration in preparation for the, the director of the Office of Administration's testimony before uh, our appropriators. Um, it is various iterations, as you can see. It, it's for inclusion in materials that the director um, will review in preparation for his testimony. In this particular case, the director of the Office of Administration at this time was Mark Lindsay. Uh, and uh, these drafts were simply put together by me and my staff to prepare him for that testimony. These are internal documents. They are not documents that are intended to be conveyed in their form to Congress. They are to impart information to the director um, in, 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 as best we could anticipate in terms of what he would need to testify. Um, so these are internal uh, documents. And the, the, what you see are the various iterations that went through uh, until a final version was submitted for uh, Mr. Lindsay. But these are 
talking points, not for the Congress, not to be s put into the public record at a hearing by the Congress, but simply to inform Mr. Lindsay of the different issues when he goes before the Appropriations Committee and asks them to continue to fund for the next fiscal year the activities of the Office Administration. That's, that's quite right. And, and the focus, as you can see in reading these, is the appropriations before him at the time, the fiscal year 2000. Now, there are several different drafts of the talking points. Were you involved uh, in drafting the talking points? I have no memory of, of reviewing uh, these at the time, around this time, um, that they were being drafted in the March, I'm sorry, in the February 99 time frame. But I have seen them uh, since then in connection with producing documents here um, for this uh, committee. Do you have any personal knowledge of how the talking points were prepared? No, I do not. Um. I mean, I should say that I know that they were prepared by my staff, that they gathered information from a, a group of a variety of materials that were provided by the information systems and technology uh, uh, branch within the Office of Administration. And then the, infor the, the, the concepts and the uh, bullet points that were provided um, focused, as you can see, on the SIP, which is the Capital Improvement Capital Investment Program or plan, and then also on the Y2K implementation, which was the main thrust of where we were at that particular time. Have you had any subsequent conversations with uh, Office Administration or OA personnel about uh, the drafting of these talking points? Subsequent to? The time they were given to Mr. Lindsay. These, uh, the, the, the final draft would be the one that would be given to Mr. Lindsay. Um, the, I was shown these in connection with the document production that was being done to this, for this committee, for this and committee. I had conversations with um, my staff um, in the context of, of, of those uh, at that time. One draft numbered uh, E4392 through E4396 is labeled Kate's comments. Who's Kate? Um, that would be Catherine, Catherine Anderson. We call her Kate. And who is she? She is uh, an attorney in the Office of the General Counsel and the Office of Administration. And this is the draft of the talking points that Ms. Anderson reviewed with her notations, is that correct? Yes. Uh, there's a bullet point referring to the Mail 2 reconstruction project in this draft that has been scribbled out by hand. And that same bullet point does not appear in what seems to be the final version of the document. Do you know why Ms. Anderson scribbled out the bullet point? Based on my discussions with her, these, uh, that particular issue was uh, removed because the thrust of, these, of this information and the thrust of the purpose for which it was being prepared was an appropriations hearing for fiscal year 2000. And the projects and the issues and the discussions in here were the capital improvement, um, cap I'm sorry, the capital investment plan uh, for fiscal year 2000, and also the Y2K implementation um, issue, which was an ongoing, it was the, we needed to move into the year uh, 2000. It was the discussion of those current issues relative to the budget submission. The email to reconstruction project was not relevant because it was not, the funds were not being sought for the email to reconstruction project in this appropriation that was the subject of this material. And also bear in mind, as I said earlier, this is being prepared for Mr. Lindsay, who is the director of the Office of Administration at the time. And he, uh, as, as you all know, um, knew a great deal about the, the mail to reconstruction uh, project. Well, the, the, then let's pin it down uh, even further. D did Ms. Anderson remove the mail to bullet as an attempt to prevent the Congress from finding out about the mail to problem? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, returning to the point you made earlier, did you or Ms. Anderson view the mail to issue as a problem affecting the White House's ability to comply with document requests and subpoenas? No, sir. And so to your knowledge, the decision about whether or not to include the mail to bullet had nothing whatsoever to do with the issue of notifying Congress of problems in subpoena compliance? No, it had nothing to do with that. 
to sum up, Ms. Anderson did not think mail to reconstruction was an issue for this particular appropriations hearing, and she further thought that if the issue did come up, Mr. Lindsay was well equipped to respond as he had been the one who handled the mail to problem originally. Is that right, Mr. Lyle? That's right. Ms. Anderson is a very capable, hardworking lawyer, and, and that is exactly the reasons that uh, she was proceeding. Um, when you come in and ask for money, you could ask for everything you might possibly want funded, but you ultimately have to make some decisions on priorities, and this was not a priority at that time to get funds to go back and examine the, 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 the backup tapes, as you saw it, for archival purposes and for no other reason. That's right. So it's really not fair for people to come in and say, well, you should have known that subpoenas were not being complied with. You had no knowledge of it. That's exactly correct. We had no knowledge of, of the issues on subpoena, so we were making prioritizations based on the needs at the time, and the paramount concern was the Y2K issue, the other information technology types of projects that were non-Y2K needed to be deferred. Could you imagine what this committee would do if your computers failed the Y2K because you were trying to get the archives ready for the future historians? If, if our uh, computer uh, system had failed, it, uh, I think that this committee and uh, I dare say a variety of other committees would have been uh, very displeased with our, including my boss and my boss's boss and all the way up in the White House, there would have been uh, great displeasure and thankfully uh, we didn't have to face that. I, I'm pleased that you've clarified this issue because it seemed like some of the other questions were trying to confuse it. And so it, it's clear now what, what we're talking about. There are different issues, and I mean, they're all mixed together. You can try to paint a, a picture to fit in with preconceived notions, but if you look at the facts as they were, uh, I, I, I now understand your position. Yes, sir. Uh, I. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Schlero. Mr. Heisman, I just, it's my last question. It's one I asked before, but I just want to make sure we're completely clear on this point. Your only involvement in the email reconstruction is as it pertains to the archival responsibilities. Yes, sir, that's correct. It's not because you were asked to inform Congress, and it's not because you were asked to comply with subpoenas and there was some information that wasn't provided. That's correct, sir. Thank you, Mr. Heisner. Uh, I'm going to, uh, even though we have more time allotted to us in this period of questioning, I'm going to yield it back, and uh, I think Mr. Shays is probably waiting for his turn, and then if there are other issues, we'll, we'll get our opportunity to go to it further, but um, I, I very much appreciate the testimony both of you have given. This has been a useful clarification. The ranking member yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Lyle and Mr. Heisner, uh, concealing subpoenaed or requested information is a crime. Um, and the bottom line is, in my judgment, the White House obstructed justice. And we're just trying to see who did it. So that's the challenge. Um, I want to make sure uh, that I understand your point, Mr. Heisner, that you clearly stated the problem as it existed. What does that mean? In response to Mr. Waxman, you clearly stated the problem as it existed. What was the problem as it existed? And who did you state it to? In, in the sense in which the question uh, was asked, I believe it refers to the mail to server failure. Let's start with that. Yes. How did you clearly state the problem? How do I clearly state the problem? Yeah, you, you told somebody. Oh, there is documentation in which I described the problem and... Uh, and that there were in the email, on the mail to problem, there were 246,000 potential emails that were uh, not discovered in, in the site. That's the, that's exhibit one. That's what we learned from Northrop and that's what you learned from Northrop in June of 18th. I've never seen this before, I'm sorry, but uh, what is the question, sir? You've never seen the, the um, 
document from um, Northrop that talked about the different, all the different people that potentially uh, had emails that might be relevant to the impeachment hearings, relevant to this committee, relevant to Mr. Starr. You, 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 you may have a problem, uh, Pardon Congressman, me? because uh, document one in our Exhibit book 62. Okay, thank you. It's exhibit one in mine, I'm sorry. Is it just redone? Exhibit 62. I'm going to need another five minutes when we're done here if we're spending all the time looking here. Why is this such a mystery to you? We were not provided any documents prior to the hearing, even though we requested that we... Oh, these aren't them. documents that we... That these are White House documents. Miss, but this witness has not seen these documents in okay. preparation for the hearing, is what I'm telling you. And that's why he needs to read it now. Uh, if the, if the, the answers to the question uh, would come from the witness, uh, we'd appreciate it, please. That's in yeah. keeping with standard procedure. Certainly. Uh, as I'm looking at this document, it looks like it's a record of processing uh, of uh, updates. Isn't this a document that describes the potential emails that were not uh, captured? A potential communications that weren't captured? From the document as I see it now, uh, I don't see anything that indicates that these were individuals whose email wasn't captured. I see a, uh, This was done on June 18th. Wasn't this part of the test? I was not familiar with the test, and I didn't participate in this. My involvement began in late of 1998, sir. Uh, after this was done? And why, why is that? Why did your involvement happen then? Well, the, in other words, how, how can you tell me that you forwarded on the extent of the problem? You clearly stated the, uh, the, clearly state the problem as it existed. It sounds to me like you didn't know how the problem existed. I mean, is that your testimony? I had been asked to provide a summary of the events to the then director to get her updated. Uh, I went and inquired from some of my colleagues. To, Can you put the uh, mic a little closer to you? Yes, I'm sorry. I, would, uh, I then inquired uh, from uh, Northrop Grumman staff and other technical people to obtain an, a description of the problem as, as it was understood at the time and uh, then provided that information in a memorandum to uh, Mrs. Cleo. Right. And uh, is it your testimony that you weren't aware that there were hundreds of thousands of potential emails that had not been captured? My understanding was that there were somewhat uh, over 400 accounts whose uh, information uh, relating to the server, the mail server that would contain that mail, had not been encoded properly. It was an upper lowercase I problem. I That's what I understood. Yeah, How many emails there were, uh, I was not aware of and I didn't know. I had no knowledge of that. You had no knowledge. So really what you're telling us is all the information you provided was almost irrelevant because Northrop had uh, known and the White House had known, others in, your, in the White House had known since June of eight, June 18th that there were thousands of emails that hadn't been captured. There were... There are two uh, numbers we are looking at. There's the number of accounts affected and the number of messages. Uh, the number of messages was not known. The number of accounts was uh, an estimate given to me by Northrop Grumman staff. Okay. Now, um, under uh, Carol Lieber, at the top of the first page, um, the handwritten note uh, talks about the number of rejected by arms. If, uh, if I might interrupt, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we'll go to the other side and then come back sure. to the, chair, the, the gentleman from Connecticut. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Let me uh, straighten out again. Your job was to uh, find out what was wrong and to try and correct it for archival purposes. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so, my job was to find out what was not working and to find out what could be done to make the corrections. And, and uh, so for purposes of 
subpoenas, whether they be by special counsel or any committee of Congress, that was of no significance to you. And therefore, the numbers of emails lost was of no significance to you. It was to find and identify what the problem was and how could it, it could be reconstructed. That's correct, sir. The focus was on making sure that the backup tapes were being maintained, they were not being recy recycled, and that the data could be reconstructed. Right. Uh, probably the general public watching this hearing are not as familiar with as complicated a computer system as exists at the White House. But um, do you have, uh, over the years, an experience that it's a perfect system that works all the time, or is it... Uh, not unusual that a computer system crashes. Well, I guess uh, it's a truism that to fail, to fail is, is human, but to really follow things up takes a computer, sir. All right. Uh, I'd like the record to reflect, Mr. Chairman, that in my uh, congressional office here in the House, in the last seven weeks, my computer system has crashed about seven times. And I, I, I would be hard pressed to uh, identify what materials have been lost because we're reconstructing what was on that. That is not unusual, is it? And anyway, uh, the computer contractors for the House of Representatives tells me that happens all the time now. Maybe my friends on the other side could tell me their computers are absolutely perfect and have never crashed, and therefore they've never lost any material. But then I, then I would tend to think there probably was a conspiracy uh, in the House, at least, to have this happen. This, this was just an occurrence of, of the weakness of our reliance on a computer to receive and assemble material, whole material, et cetera. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And, and your job was not uh, to assemble information or evidence for anyone. It was merely for archival purposes to get this problem straightened out as best you can and to do that in a prioritized basis uh, to uh, 2000 issue being the most important. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Heisner, Mr. Lau, you're both aware of the fact, I presume, that the White House computer system is not just any computer system, is that correct? Correct. There are special laws that pertain to the White House computer system as the computer system that is officially designed to and required by law to maintain uh, communications, data, records, and so forth of the executive branch, and therefore very special laws apply to the retention of that information and to ensure its integrity that might not apply to other computer systems, such as the gentleman alluded to. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And that's your understanding, too, I presume, Mr. Lyle? There are uh, rules, Federal Records Act, Presidential Records Act, Armstrong, those types of, of rules apply to um, data on, uh, at least uh, on the Executive Office of the President's systems. So if somebody w tried to imply that what we're looking at here is irrelevant simply because some other computer system somewhere sometime break down or don't maintain records properly and therefore that's an excuse for what we've seen happen here, that would certainly not be an accurate or a legal interpretation or implication, would it? Are you referring to Mr. Congressman Kaczorowski's statements? Certainly not. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that uh, what other system, whatever happens to other systems, um, I focus on the executive office of the president. And you understand that there are very special laws and regulations that apply to that that make it very different from other systems. The there are there are there are legal obligations that relate to the White House computer system, records retention system, that don't apply to any other systems, isn't that correct? I know that the, we, the Executive Office of the President, are subject to the Federal Records Act, the Presidential Records Act, and related cases, including the Armstrong case. What goes on for other agencies or other branches of government, I'm not in a position to comment on, sir. Nor is it relevant, is it? I, I have no idea, but I, I have no idea what the rules are which would mean it would not be relevant for these proceedings here today. I have no way to s say one way or another. I, I, I have no basis to state. Uh, well, I, sus I suspect you do, uh, because you just uh, uh, cited to me special laws that relate to the White House uh, records system. 
I understand that they apply to our systems. Uh, that is correct. The applicability of other of those rules and, and what other cases are applicable to other systems, I have no idea. Which makes them irrelevant for our, our process here today. They, well, they, it, they really, they, all I'm saying is they really have no relevance. And if somebody tries to say that uh, inquiring uh, inquiries by the Congress into lapses into the records uh, management system and retention system at the White House uh, are inconsequential because these sorts of things might happen to other systems really is not relevant because of the special laws that apply and the requirements that apply to the I'm not asking a question I'm making a statement so you don't have to worry about it uh, for purposes of our inquiry here today uh, and I think you understand that and I think Mr. Heisner understands that too. Will the, chair, will the gentleman yield? Uh, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, if I may, uh, I happen to have the occasion to be in the White House the third day after the inauguration of President Clinton, and I recall something that was astounding to me, and that is that every computer that I was that I saw in every office of the White House was gutted under court order. It had a sticker on it, and all the insides and all the materials were taken, and no backup systems or computers existed in the White House the third day that this administration took office. So I'd ask the question, how could you possibly reconstruct what happened archivally for those three or four days or two weeks before an entirely new system was implemented in the White House. I think we are dealing with two kinds of systems. The uh, desktop computers uh, that individuals use uh, use two kinds of storage. They use storage that resides on that machine's hard drive, and they also use network storage. The uh, email systems are more centralized systems. And so anyone that can, that has an account, that can access email, and I think at that time it was not, uh, it wasn't uh, Lotus Notes, it was another system, All-in-One, I believe it was called. Anybody that could uh, connect with All-in-One from any terminal who had a good account could send email. However, any records that they would have created during that, those first few days and that were then removed because the hard drives were removed from their system could not be reconstructed, no. So in fact, the laws that uh, Mr. Barr refers to about this tremendous uh, 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 obligation that the executive has, branch has to keep records, we know for a fact, and I think you are aware of the fact that the computer materials were extracted from the White House at the end of the Bush administration and didn't exist for several weeks, then all those archival records are basically lost. Is that correct? That's very likely true, sir. If, uh, if, if you all feel comfortable operating on that basis, you all feel free to, but I think you're going to find real problems if you rely on that sort of legal reasoning. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Heisner, I, I made some assumptions that, um, given that this was your area, you would have been aware of this document, and I really apologize, but that in itself is news to me uh, and news to the committee. This is a document, uh, this is Exhibit 62, which you have in front of you. This is the document that was supplied by Northrop and prepared by Bob Haas. Do you know Bob Haas? Yes, I do, sir. Okay. And it's your testimony you have never seen this document before? That's correct, sir. Okay. So um, wouldn't it have made sense for you to see this document? This is, and let me, just, let me just clarify one point, because I think it's important for you to know that. Look under the first person, Carol Lieber. And it says in writing, five, these are rejected emails. It gives the number. Each one of those numbers are the numbers of rejected emails. 209, 441, 647. I mean, I accept the fact that under oath you haven't seen this document. I think it's astounding. Uh, we added them all up. They're over 246,000. I've never seen the documents. Okay, sir. I, I this happened before I became involved in this process. And I'm but, looking... but, but, but the, part is, the point is... <laughs> You then wanted to recapture and provide some meaningful information to somebody, and it's almost like you were set up. Like you were providing information to someone else and you weren't being provided all the information, which I think is curious. And again, with my suspicious mind, given all that's transpired in the past, I think it was purposeful. But, you know, we'll probably never be able to prove it. 246,000 emails that weren't captured just under, just under the mail two problem not to mention
the letter D problem and the vice president problem. The vice president used a different system, so we don't have his. So you go with 246,000, and then you say, those are the all in, uh, incoming emails, not in arms. And then we subtract the emails found in individual PCs. Then we subtract the emails found attached to sent emails with history. Then we subtract the emails found in printed files. Then we subtract the emails retrieved from backup tapes. And then what you do is you take the, you subtract all, the, uh, all these undisclosed emails, these 246,000, you then subtract the not relevant, and then you get the subpoenaed not produced. And right now we have potentially a lot of subpoenaed not produced. Now, Mr. Lyle, you blow my mind because you wanted us to believe that somehow uh, the fact that you have the Y2K problem, that they're mutually exclusive and that this problem can't be dealt with, that you can't hire someone else to deal with it, that you can't I ask Congress to provide more information, that you can't say to Congress, you know, we have a Y2K problem, but by the way, by the way, we, we can't find 246,000 emails and let Congress know about it. And what really amazes me is that even if you've made a decision on your own and others, maybe not you, not to abide by the law to hand over all subpoenaed or requested information, let me make this point and I'll let you respond. You, you and others chose not to at least publicly explain that there were 240,000 emails that we hadn't yet found. And I suspect in my suspicious mind that it might have something to do with impeachment. By the way, I voted against impeaching the president. But I suspect it might have been, you know, because of that and because we simply didn't want the story to come out. What else am I to expect? Because nothing prevents the White House from explaining to all the relevant um, jurisdictions that we had this problem. Mr. Shays, as I have said previously, I'm aware of no effort by anyone not to be responsive to your request for information. I certainly was not, and I'm aware of no one who, who was. Uh, the information exchange between this committee and the White House Counsel's Office is something I simply do not know. I have no knowledge of whatsoever. Um, I cannot, I cannot tell you. So you didn't know there were any um, emails missing? I did not know one way or another no, no, what information you had sought and no, that's what had not been the issue. provided. The issue is, did you not know any, let's just go through the way your mind thinks. You didn't know <laughs> there were any emails missing from I, the arms. No, 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 I'm not saying. No, no, just tell me, yes or no, did no, you know? No, no, I, I am not saying that I was not aware that emails were not captured in the automated records management system. I want to be clear on that. I'm not okay. saying that. What okay. I'm saying is, is that the information about those anomalies was not information that I was charged with or anyone on my staff was charged with providing to the committee. Those matters were just all the Office of Administration was, was a conduit of information should to I the be appropriate people. Should I be surprised that implicitly you're telling me you didn't know that we were subpoenaing information? We, uh, the Judiciary Committee, the Government Reform Commis Committee, Mr. Starr's uh, investigation, you weren't aware that any, uh, there weren't subpoenas out there to look at emails? Remember, I joined the executive office of the president in November of 1998. November 1998, right. right? I I have never seen any of the subpoenas. That Where did you, you live remember? before you you weren't aware that there were there was an were you aware there was an impeachment? I'm not saying I wasn't aware that there was right. an impeachment. <laughs> I hope I'm so. saying that I wasn't aware of the subpoenas or the information in terms of what was being sought and what was being provided. It simply was not a function that was within the office of the administration. I understand it wasn't you, you're saying it's not your line of responsibility. I just want to understand you. Yes. I want to understand the mentality of the people who worked in the White House. I want to understand why we didn't learn about this problem until two years um, after, basically. And um, it's just helpful to know, because ultimately somebody knows. Um, 
It's like, it's really, it's the same kind of problem I had when I just want to know who hired Craig Livingstone. Craig Livingstone didn't know who hired him and nobody else knew. He just happened to work at the White House. Um, I think almost any American knew there were hearings on the president and knew that information was being subpoenaed. I, I didn't say that I didn't know uh, that there okay. were hearings, and I didn't say that I didn't know that information was okay. being sought. So we were that far. was being provided. What I'm saying is, is I don't know what that was. I don't know what the, right. I never saw the subpoenas. Were you ever I, in, I'm sorry. I have no idea as far as the communications between this committee and the White House Counsel's Office. I wasn't in the White House Counsel's Office, never have been. Right. I was in the Office of Administration, which is a, a different, it's actually housed in a completely different building. It's in Are you the, aware of the problem? Uh, the, sorry. You were aware that there was a problem, that there were these missing emails. The, as I said earlier, I learned of the email to Anomaly. Yeah, but, to the best but what, what did it matter that there were missing emails? What did your mind say? So there are missing emails. You thought, well, big deal. There's this e missing emails. Nobody wanted any of them. What, what is was in your mind? In April of 1999, when I learned about the email to anomalies, I was learning about it um, in connection with the letter D anomaly, which I've discussed. Okay. And in the context of those discussions, right. we, we, a number of things had to happen. Look, w okay, what do we do about the anomaly? What do we do? The email to was a guide. But what, what we need to do matter? a couple of things. Oh, sure. We need to do a couple of things. We need to make sure we've got the data. Our, on, on the backup tapes, which we did assure ourselves of. And so that information um, was put and it was secure and it, to, it, it is, is tucked away now under lock and key on the backup tapes. It's all there. So the Federal Records Act, the Presidential Records Act, all those the, the laws that Mr. Barr was asking me about, you've got the backup tapes so that you can have them for archival purposes. The other thing that needed to be done is, okay, we need to advise um, um, White House Counsel's Office. Uh, yeah, let me just say. Uh, well, look, uh, 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 what we needed to do was advise White House Counsel's Office of the issue. Mr. Lindsay had previously handled the email to Anomaly. He had communications with the White House Counsel's Office. So those two ad components were the things that were going on. So uh, but, but we had you, done, what, we had elevated it. Mr. Mr. Shays, yeah. let me interrupt briefly. Uh, I yield to Mr. Kajorski, and then I'll give you my time. Yeah, just yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm going to be very patient, but I'm going to take a little more time. I'm, just, I'm happy Mr. to answer your question. Mr. Kajorski, you have questions? If, if I may, on, the, on this document, maybe I could ask uh, uh, counsel for the committee to explain. Is the number of emails missing on the extreme uh, left-hand column of the page? Is that the numbers, or is it the number under the name? It's the number under the name. Uh, the council will be happy to explain if you choose. What, what's what's the number on the right hand, on the left hand column? Well, let me put the council, Ms. Uh, our, our understanding, uh, this the test was conducted by Mr. Haas, and he determined two things. First of all, all of the individuals who were then employed, uh, who were served by the mail to server. So these are all the individuals whose accounts were affected by this computer problem, by the email problem. So he printed out a master list of all of the individuals uh, who were affected by the problem, and then he determined two types of information. One, the number of emails that were then on their system. So on, on that particular day, June 18, 1998, for example, Carol Lieber, there were 158 emails on her system that you know, many could have been erased. The, previous month or week, but on that particular day, there were 158. Of those 158, five emails had not been captured by the ARM system. So the, the first column represents the total number of emails that were on the person's system at that particular time. The second column indicates the number of emails that were not captured by the ARM system. The total number of that second column is slightly over 246,000. If you go through the entire document and total it up, the second column, 246,000? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now that you're looking at that document down there, it strikes me, I've just gone through this in a cursory manner, but I see some of the most important people in the White House, the chief of staff and the president's assistants, uh, they get very few emails and very few were lost. Do you, do you notice that? If you go to Erskine... Uh, 
bowls. Is that correct? Yes. He, he uh, that day only had a, he had uh, 1,108 emails, and 161 were lost, about 10 percent or 15 percent. These aren't on backup tapes. No, these are not on backup tapes. These are, though. No, they, they exist on people's hard drives, and they just didn't make it into the little hard drive. Are they retrievable? They are retrievable. They are retrievable. They are retrievable. Everything's retrievable. They, they should have already been retrieved in response to any time for the the case. So there's any problem. We're going to be able to see all the emails. All these ones they're talking about here, yes. We're going to be able to see them. We, we should already have They should already have been reduced. They are. Should have. Uh, Council has just explained to me that uh, all of these are retrievable. Is that correct? Uh, Bill Erskine's bowls, uh, 161 were lost. He had 1,108 on his uh, computer that day. Yes, the uh, purpose of the reconstruction design of the system design is to design a system that allows the retrieval of these uh, unrecords, managed records subject to the ability to read the tapes on which the backups were created and the presence of those tapes. And you have the tapes. We maintained, when, when the problem was discovered, uh, the directions were given to Northrop Grumman to retain all the tapes. Uh, this is sort of uh, the three blind men and the elephant kind of a problem, <laughs> because as you ask different people, you get different answers. It appears, but nobody can tell for certain. There was a short time period, somewhere between 1996 and 1998, uh, where these backup tapes were actually being recycled, which means after a tape had been created and had been maintained for maybe four weeks or six weeks, whatever the retention period was, that same tape was used again. That practice was stopped as soon as uh, Northrop Grumman became aware there was a serious problem. So I cannot say for certainty that everything that ever went on a mail to server, uh, there was an email message, can be recovered. But to the extent that the tapes exist and they can be read, and we believe we, we stopped the bleeding, which means we corrected the problem. We also made every effort to make sure that the tapes, the backup tapes that were created, were kept. To that extent, these records that appear here should be recoverable. And at some point, we're going to be able to have them, and, and you're working on, on, on reconstructing them now. Is that correct? That's correct. And the objective so is to recover them. As these we hours we're spending here talking about, we're eventually going to be able to read these things. That's correct, sir. Uh, maybe I, uh, maybe I, I think we, we have too much time. We don't have anything to do in the Congress. We're going to rehash this because uh, we can't wait or we're trying to find out why they aren't here. I don't, I'm not sure I understand the thrust of the issue at this point, why we're beating you three gentlemen to death over something that's going to be reproduced. It wasn't your responsibility. You weren't involved in the subpoenas. You're technical people. You're doing the best you can to reconstruct well, them. The gentleman's correct? time has expired. Perhaps I can shed just a little bit of light on it. Subpoenas were issued by the Congress, a number of committees, and the independent councils asking for all documents that may be relevant to these various investigations. These emails were part of the subpoenaed material. And from September of 1996 through 1998, we don't have them. And we think that they may be very relevant to what we were looking into. And that's why this whole issue is so important. I, I, I agree with the President, Mr. Chairman. We ought to find out what happened to those 10 pounds he lost. <laughs> Let me just ask one question, and I'm going to yield uh, to uh, Mr. Shays, and that is uh, go back to uh, Exhibit 134, and that's uh, 
uh, Mr. Uh, Lyle, that's the uh, document where the mail to reconstruction was crossed off and that was not put on the final draft that was prepared for the, uh, for the appropriations committee. And you said it was because of the Y2K problem that you had so much, you had to focus so much attention on that and the email problem was of not that significant importance at that time. And so you, and so you, didn't, uh, you didn't pursue it. I'd just like to ask you this question. At the same time, the White House was installing Palm, Palm Pilots for the White House staff. They were creating new fax cover sheets for the White House staff. And they were working on the White House Christmas card list. Now, that was going on, and you thought that was important enough to pursue it, but the emails that were important and relevant to all of these subpoenas and these investigations wasn't as important as the Y2K. Can you explain the difference there in the, in the priorities? The, uh, my understanding is the system that you talk about, the Christmas card system? Well, and the other two, yeah. Well, the, the other two are the day-to-day -day operations that our staff was, uh -huh. was doing. Those were ongoing. I mean, uh -huh. you still had to service customers. You still had to provide service. You had to the fix palm, their the systems. Palm, the Palm Pilots and all that? Yeah, those are customer service types of things. Those are always ongoing. You have to do that. I mean, I you, see. So those were projects that were ongoing. And and the facts, uh, the, the facts cover sheets for the White House staff? Well, again, those are on, ongoing customer service initiatives. We have to have um, a day-to-day -day operation capability that allows people to do their jobs, which would include... Why, why wouldn't subpoena compliance be ongoing. I mean, it seems to me that would be pretty important. Subpoena, compliance, why wouldn't that be ongoing? I mean, if, the, if the, 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 the fax cover sheets and the Palm Pilots are important, why weren't the subpoenas an ongoing? Subpoenas, uh, responses to subpoenas are always done. I and mean, we do respond to subpoenas. We've, we've gotten subpoenas from this committee. We've gotten subpoenas from the Office of the Independent Council since I've been there. We respond to those. Uh, accordingly in the same process that I've described uh, uh, in my prior testimony. Mr. Shays, I, I'm Mr. Lyle, yes, sir. I'm a little confused and I apologize if it's my fault and I realize Mr. Heisner you are a career employee of many years and have served with distinction so this is a real unusual circumstance for you to be before the committee but I think you understand the challenge. I mean the challenge is that information was subpoenaed by STARS investigation, by this committee, by the Judiciary Committee, and for two years, from basically September 96 to November, November 98, the problem existed. Um, but people in the White House, and we just need to know who, knew the extent of the problem, uh, knew in June 18th. And, but you didn't know the extent of the problem, because, for one thing, you were never supplied the document that described how there were 246,000. And that's telling, because, you know, this is an area that you should have been. And then it strikes me you were asked in the fall, later in that year of 98, to describe the problem to others, and you were not given all the relevant information. Am I off track a little bit? I mean, were you given all the relevant information? The, to know uh, the extent of the problem? The collection of the information involved discussions with other technical staff to uh, get a, uh, an overview of the problem and to uh, get an order of magnitude of the problem. And uh, it is very likely that I was not given full details uh, to the infinite degree. And one of your testimonies is that you weren't given this document that was provided by Bob Haas of Northrop to someone um, you were not given, and it was provided on June 18th, 98, you were not given that document, and this document shows 246,000 emails that weren't captured, just under the mail two problem. And you did not have that document. No, I did not have and that document. And you did document. not have that document when you then tried to, to clearly state the problem as it existed um, in the fall of 98. You did not have this document to refer to. That's correct. Okay. Um, 
I don't know whose who's clock this is now, whose time that is. Is that, uh, is that my time now, or? Now you can get, uh, Oh, I, did I use five minutes or what? You, 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 you and Mr. Barr are, are, are both next. Uh, who, who, Mr. Barr, do you want to go next? Do you want to, Mr. Shays, you have five minutes. Uh, that you. was my time. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, um, thank you. Mr. Lyle. Yes, sir. Um, what I'm trying to wrestle with in your explanation is you just proceeded to say that you have provided subpoenaed information to various committees. Is part of your responsibility to provide subpoenaed information? It's, it's part of everybody's responsibility to provide information responsive to subpoenas. Let me just say, the problem is with everybody, when everybody's responsible, nobody is. Uh, so I need a little more accuracy. If when, I it, when is it your responsibility? Each, uh, when, a, when a request for information is received and information internally needs to be provided to the White House Counsel's Office. Right. A notification is sent throughout the Executive Office of the President complex for individuals to search their files okay. and their materials and then um, in a fashion just like what Mr. Heiser described, but submit let me that up the chain to make it to the White House Counsel's Office for them uh, to review. So you, your information was only to provide the information you personally had or in your capacity as the director of the executive office of the present office of administration, you would have a more uh, expanded task to make sure others complied with subpoenas. When, when it comes into the executive office of the present, into the office of administration, it's, it, it goes through the general counsel's office right. who sees to it that everyone responds back, it's all gathered up, and then a certification is sent up to the council's office wherein they were. But what I'm trying to clarify is, when you get requests, it's not just for your own specific email, but it can be other emails that are in your system. It's whatever's uh, under my control. Right, under your control, which could include a number of the people on this list, correct? I have, I don't know. Well, I mean, the press, yeah, the, I mean, just some of them. I mean, look, just, just take Ira Magazine, or if there was a request for Ira Magazine or information, they might make that request to you if, to provide if, information that would be in your system. Whatever information is sought in the notification that we receive in the first instance is what we endeavor, what, what each person is required to endeavor to respond to. Mr. Lyle, could you look at this uh, Exhibit 62 and just tell me if you've ever seen it? Uh, I have looked at it, and um, I don't believe I've seen this before. You, you don't believe it, or you, you haven't seen no, it? No, I, I, I don't believe I've seen it. Okay. So it's a pretty strong statement that you haven't seen it, to the best of your knowledge. That's right. To the best of my knowledge, I've not seen this. This was okay. in June of 1998. Yeah. And, and this includes 2,460,000 ,000 emails that slipped through, and they, they are, you know, different personnel. Uh, Ira Magaziner, um, Betty Curry, Bill Clinton, um, the list, Lin uh, Bruce Lindsay, now, would you have some, heard some of these names come through you as requested subpoenaed information? Some of these I, people? I don't recall what I've responded to in terms of subpoenas. But that lots, of, lots of names of people, uh, certainly more than just a handful. The subpoenas that I responded to um, could include both names and, you know, it, types of uh, but lots topics. Of, but lots of names, correct? I don't know. Lots of emails? I'm sorry? No, you mean you were requested to turn over emails, right, that, that were in your system? That, well, there's, again, there's a couple of ways that you proceed. Again, there's the automated records management search portion of the request, which is coordinated by the counsel's office. And then, yes, you search your files, your emails, you search your hard copies, you search what's in your office. But you have the central file system, correct? I mean, you have the, the names of a lot of people in your system. In our automated records management system, yes, yes in I'm arms, to, I'm sorry. there's a there's a, a a good number of people in the arms. System. Right, and I'm just trying to get beyond the point of your own little individual computer. You are in charge of the system. No, you I see. I I think I understand okay. uh, what you're you're trying to get. Each person searches their space or their office right. or their documents right. that are in there, and then a request is submitted for an automated records management search to be done. Correct. That request is generated out of the council's office. 
Right, to you. No, no, not to me. Yeah. It goes right into the um, IT people, information technology people in the automated records management system. But it's fair for me to assume that you were aware, because the White House kept, frankly, criticizing all, uh, so many committees in Congress that we were requesting too much information on lots of different names. So, I mean, you, you weren't in the dark ages on that. I mean, you were, you know, you must have heard complaints about all the emails that we wanted and all the records we wanted about so many different people. Well, that's, that's something that Mr. Heisner touched on earlier in this hearing. Yeah, right. So you were aware of it? I, yes. Okay. So what I'm trying to establish is what you were aware and what you weren't. So you knew that Congress was looking at uh, a lot of different people that worked in the White House and wanting a lot of different records, and that's one of your points, too. It was, an, it was an, a, a costly effort to comply with that. Yes, it was costly. But besides having to fix the problem. So, but you weren't in the dark ages about that, and I feel better about knowing that. But what I don't feel good about is that um, you would then make an assumption that I think is, blows my mind that some of these emails would not have been subpoenaed emails. Some of which emails? Some of these lost emails. I don't know what's on the backup tapes. I don't know what was sought in the subpoenas. But I, have, you, I'm I, have so no, I have no basis to know. You have know. a little basis. You have a basis that the correct deposit was going to cost $600,000, that this was a big job and, and involved a lot of people. And what I'm hearing you saying is that notwithstanding, you made an assumption that this didn't involve any subpoena records. No, I did not. I did not make an assumption. Uh, two points. First, the reconstruction is not going to cost six hundred thousand dollars. It's going to cost eight to ten million dollars. Okay. The. Uh, well, I'm just going on the memos that you provided. That, we that was an earlier statement of work that you're referring to, but and that was just a cost for an assessment. Well, you're just even making the point. So the problem was even bigger, and it involved a lot more people. Okay. It, it's going to take a long time. It costs a lot of money. We are working as quickly as we can. No, I understand that part. Okay. Trust me on that. That's the other portion. With respect to the subpoena issue that you keep asking about, right? When, when I was briefed in in um, April of 1999 about the letter D problem, we were discussing in that in that meeting. Okay, what what has to happen? And. And you didn't know about the mail portion. two problem then. Sorry. And you didn't know about the mail two problem then. No, th as I said, my most, my best recollection is that I learned um, what I know most about the email two um, project in the um, in the April '99 meeting, and it was because it was a it, it served as a historical framework as far as how to deal with this letter D issue. Yeah. And. During the course of those conversations, Mr. Lindsay, who I worked for and who was my predecessor, ha had explained the process in terms of, listen, we need to notify the council's office, which is exactly what took why, place. Why would we need to notify the council's office? Because, because you had this anomaly. Why, why would the council's office have to be notified at all? Because council's office was responsible for responding to subpoenas. So you did know there was a subpoena problem? I did not know that there was it, the email to subpoena problem, as I understood it, based on my conversations, had been resolved prior by Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Ruff. The letter D email problem was a, was a new issue that had just come up. It had just occurred and it was discovered in April of 1999. The same notification had to take place, and Mr. Lindsay worked to, take, to, to make sure that that happened. On Office of Administration side, what we needed to do is be sure that we had all the data in on the backup tapes for the compliance with the other the what, what federal you, records. Could I, could I make a request, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I really, this is the last line of question. I, it'll take me more time to come back afterwards. Okay, we'll, we'll come back, but let me just follow up and ask uh, one, one quick question. When, when, did, when did the White House go to before the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee for the year 2000 budget? When did we go? Yeah, what month was that? I don't remember. It was in early 1999. Was it in? April, May, June? No, I believe it was in February, March time frame, somewhere in there. I'd have to look. But you knew about the second email problem, and you said that you were... I learned about that in April of You were kicking that up to Mr. Lindsay because you knew that there was a subpoena, and that had to be given to him. He had to be, he had to be aware of that. 
I didn't and know of a particular subpoena. You knew there were subpoenas per pertaining. I mean, you knew about the previous subpoena on the previous email problem. Right. You, you certainly, certainly. You didn't connect the two. I'm sorry. You didn't connect the two that there was a that the subpoena was relevant to the second email missing emails as well. I didn't say that. I said that we, in the context of discussing the April in the April 1999 meeting, yeah. when we were discussing the letter D issue, right. we needed to make sure that information about that anomaly was conveyed to the council's office because... I understand, but during this entire time frame, you were crossing out or they were crossing out information that was uh, going to be conveyed in the final document to the Appropriations Committee about uh, uh, the need for funds for the, uh, for the uh, missing emails. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I just can't understand how you, 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 could, you could miss all this when you were kicking things up to Mr. Lindsay, who was kicking them up to, Mr., uh, to, the, to the chief counsel's office at the White House. As I said, Mr. Burton, I, I have no recollection of having seen these drafts in the February uh, mm -hmm. time frame. I told you that earlier. Uh, I learned of them more recently when uh, we were producing documents for this committee. Mr. Barr, do you have any uh, further questions? Uh, just uh, a few here. If I could engage uh, counsel just to uh, in a colloquy here, just to ask him a few questions. Going back, uh, uh, counsel, to uh, Exhibit 61, which is the list of various names and uh, numbers of emails, the handwritten numbers, the larger numbers, on the very left uh, of those pages. Uh, again, there's a number for each name, and that would represent the total number of emails in that individual's computer on that particular, on, on the day of June 18th? Correct. And the number immediately under the user's name would be the number that were not captured as of that day? That's also correct. Uh, thinking back, if counsel would, on counsel's uh, legal training and understanding of the law, uh, if you have, for example, as at the top of page NGL 00309 that the gentleman from Pennsylvania referred to earlier, Mr. Erskine Bowles, uh, where you have the number of 1108, which is 1,108 emails uh, in Mr. Bowles' system that day, and 161, which would be the number that were not captured, if in fact counsel had been advising that individual on that day to comply with the subpoena that required all of those emails, uh, would he give Mr. Bowles an A because he was able to capture 90 percent? Uh, no, he would not. Uh, in other words, a subpoena presuming it is lawful, whether it is from an independent counsel, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, uh, the Government Reform Committee of this Congress, or the House Judiciary Committee requesting certain documents, including emails, uh, it does not presuppose, nor does it excuse, that simply because uh, a certain number of documents are not captured that day that they do not have to be produced or that they are not covered by the subpoena. Correct. Uh, that's correct. And, and just to fill in on that, it was the understanding of the committee, uh, through representations made by lawyers for the White House, that uh, we had received all information that was germane to our subpoenas. We had not at any time been told that there was a universe of documents that had never been searched for responsiveness to our subpoenas. We were laboring under a misapprehension at that time. Uh, and we now know that, uh, that we have not been furnished full, accurate, and complete information pursuant to those lawful subpoenas. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And uh, is, we, we also know from not only this document, but subsequent to the discovery of this document, or at least the furnishing to the committee of this document, there have been uh, other problems presented to us. One in particular that implicates the entire office of the vice president, where information uh, and the extent is still not entirely clear, but information from the Office of the Vice President has not been searched for responsiveness to committee subpoenas. Uh, is it also counsel's understanding, uh, based on his knowledge of, uh, of federal law and the law that pertains to enforcement of uh, subpoenas, that 
the cost of compliance with the subpoena is not a defense for a failure to comply with that subpoena in whole or in part. Is that correct? No, it is correct, yes. The cost should not be a factor. Uh, also, I would, uh, I would uh, urge the witnesses to review their understanding in light of some of the statements made earlier by some other members of the committee. Uh, in light of what counsel has just said, that when a subpoena is issued, whether it is by an independent counsel, a committee of the Congress, or some other legal proceeding and judi or judici judicial officer, uh, that uh, full compliance is uh, presumed, required, and will be enforced uh, uh, either by um, a, uh, an, an order of a court uh, or uh, a finding of contempt or a case of obstruction of justice for a subsequent uh, knowledge that uh, a subpoena has not been honored. And the fact that there may be certain federal laws that relate to retention of certain records for archival purposes, that does not dispose of the issue. If, in fact, a subpoena has not been complied with, uh, if, in fact, as we now know, that uh, the White House Counsel, the Office of Administration, and indeed probably the Department of Justice knew that these uh, subpoenas were not being complied with, uh, then subsequent action uh, certainly is a relevant inquiry for, for this committee, notwithstanding the fact that there may be technical compliance with the Presidential Records Act or the Federal Records Act, for example, because these records are maintained in some way, in some place, in some form for archival purposes. And that is the heart of at least part of the reason why this committee is, is very concerned about this. The subpoenas have not been complied with. Uh, apparently, no efforts have been undertaken to secure compliance with those subpoenas. And the best that we are being told by this administration, by this Department of Justice, uh, is uh, that in six to eight months, maybe something will happen. Uh, that will not, uh, and in my experience as a former U.S. attorney, and I presume counsel uh, in your experience as well as an attorney, uh, that certainly would not get one off the hook in a legal proceeding, nor should it. Uh, so I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding these hearings, uh, and I know there will be further because some very important principles regarding the rule of law and the prerogatives, the lawful prerogatives of this committee, of the House Impeachment and Judiciary Committees, the Independent Counsel, uh, and uh, legal parties entitled to their day in court, such as in the Alexander case, uh, have a great deal at stake here in ensuring compliance with uh, lawful subpoenas. And we have not seen that in this case, and that's very disturbing. Thank you, Mr. Parr. Uh, Mr. Shays, did you have more questions? Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Lyle. Yes, sir. When uh, Beth uh, Nolan, the counsel of the president, testified on March 23rd, in her statement she said, when the counsel to the president, Charles Ruff, was told by OA, that's your organization before your time, in 1998, but OA is the Office of Administration. OA, as I understand, is Office of Administration. So when the, when the then counsel of the president, Charles Ruff, was told by OA in 1998 that there were emails that may not have been captured in a previous search because of a technical glitch, and by the way, I buy that as a technical glitch. I don't debate that. He understood that OA would be collecting those emails so that any responsive emails that had not been produced could be produced. Now, responsive emails means request for information or subpoenaed information. Now, what Ms. Nolan is telling us is that, Ms. R um, that Charles Ruff, the previous counsel, was told that all these emails would be provided, and it's, then you're hired later, and you're not providing those, uh, that information. You're not providing the um, re so-called responsive information, so I mean information, emails that were subpoenaed. So it's kind of like you both are like ships passing in the night here. I mean, Ruff's saying you guys are going to provide it, and you're saying you made a decision uh, that you saw this as an archive problem, not a subpoena problem, and therefore you decided <coughs> that you would focus on other issues. I, I, can't, I cannot shed any light for you, Mr. Shays, on the communications that took place between Mr. Ruff and Mr. Lindsay. Right, I understand that. But what I'm just sharing with you is the fact that Mr. Ruff was told according to Ms. Nolan, and she was under oath, that, um, that these emails had been 
uh, captured and that they were uh, would be collected and that uh, all responsive emails, in other words, all the subpoenaed emails uh, that hadn't been produced would be produced. So, excuse me for, you know, just being a little cynical. His argument is, I was told it was going to happen. You're hired, and you don't even know that there's any subpoena problem. And that's relevant information, and I accept it. Uh, under the basis you've said it. But what am I supposed to think up here as a member of Congress when I know these were subpoenaed information and it wasn't provided and Congress wasn't told and STARS wasn't told and the courts weren't told. So um, I guess we'll just keep trying to figure out who hired Craig Livingstone and we'll try to figure out um, who knew what when. Uh, and I just wish someone would help us out. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, if I might on this question. Yes, uh, gentlemen from uh, California. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I had to come in late, but it triggered me on the question of who hired Mr. Livingstone, because I asked that question, and Mr. Klinger, then the full chairman, sent it to the attorney general and made it very clear that one of our witnesses, which was counsel to the president, had committed perjury. And so I wonder if any of you have any information on that. I don't think that the, uh, this committee uh, has ever received a reply from the Department of Justice. And there's no question. The question I asked was, was it Vice President Gore? Was it the First Lady, et cetera? And uh, I think they knew and they lied. So I'd like to see an answer to Mr. Klinger's letter to Mr. Purden, Burton sometime. I'm advising my client take the Fifth Amendment on that. <laughs> Does this gentleman have any more questions? That's it, because I'm, I'm tired of lies. Well, I, I, I want to thank you both for being so uh, patient, and uh, we'll now go to the next panel. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Mr. Rabin, we're glad that you're with us. We're sorry you had to wait so long. While you're standing, did you take the oath? You swear to tell the whole truth, it's nothing but the truth, so I'll be gone. I do. Be seated. Do you have an opening statement, Mr. Rabin? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Get to it right now. All right. Take your time. Proceed, Mr. Raven. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm here today in response to your request by letter of April 26th. As the committee understands, many of the questions posed in the chairman's letter of April 26th relate to matters and activities in which I've had no personal involvement, but I have prepared as best I can in the days since the chairman's letter to answer the committee's questions consistent with the department's and the public's fundamental interest in effective law enforcement. More than a month ago, the department's criminal division acting through the Campaign Finance Task Force, began an investigation into whether the Executive Office of the President complied with subpoenas issued by the task force and this committee. In conjunction with that inquiry, criminal division attorneys conferred with representatives from the Office of Independent Counsel because the Office of Independent Counsel had commenced its own investigation into nearly identical allegations surrounding the White House email retrieval issues. Thereafter, on March 22nd, the Office of Independent Counsel explicitly authorized the Department of Justice to continue its investigation pursuant to the Ethics in Government Act, which provides in pertinent part that whenever a matter is in the prosecutorial jurisdiction of an independent counsel, the Department of Justice shall suspend its investigation regarding such matter unless the independent counsel agrees in writing that such an investigation may be continued by the department. 
since last month when the independent counsel authorized the department to continue its investigation of, of the email retrieval issues the independent counsel and the campaign finance task force have been working in coordination conducting many joint interviews and reviewing numerous documents and other evidence this criminal investigation is active and ongoing several of the questions in the chairman's letter of april twenty sixth relate explicitly to matters currently under review in this criminal investigation as I have explained in my letters on this and other committee requests, disclosure of matters involving an open investigation can compromise the efforts of prosecutors and FBI agents to enforce federal law. Experienced prosecutors tell me that it would undermine law enforcement if defendants or prospective defendants learn the government's factual or legal theories or what information the government had gathered and from what sources. Even neutral witnesses can have their recollections influenced or confused by public disclosures of statements or speculation from other witnesses. The disclosure of raw or preliminary investigative information that has yet to be fully investigated or substantiated can also damage unfairly the reputations of innocent individuals and mislead the public about the underlying facts. Finally, Congressional inquiries into ongoing investigations create the added danger of undermining the credibility of law enforcement by injecting or appearing to inject political considerations into the criminal justice process. Therefore, at this time, the department cannot comment about any particular actions that have been undertaken or may be undertaken during the course of the ongoing investigation into the email retrieval issues. Nor can I comment on who at the White House or Justice Department may have known what and when about the email retrieval issues as that is part of the ongoing criminal investigation. All I can do is convey the assurance of the Campaign Finance Task Force that the prosecutors, working in coordination with the Office of Independent Counsel, will follow the facts and the law wherever they may lead. You have also asked why the department has agreed, has not agreed to make the civil division attorneys working on the Alexander case available to the committee for interviews. My letter of April 12th identified several reasons why the department declined the committee's request as I stated in that letter, the committee's proposed inquiry relates directly to the ongoing criminal investigation now underway by the Campaign Finance Task Force and the Office of Independent Counsel. In the Alexander case, the department asked Judge Lambert to defer consideration of the email retrieval issues precisely because multiple investigations of the same conduct and multiple interviews of the same witnesses would interfere with and undermine the ongoing criminal investigation. Just last week, Judge Lambert agreed to continue deferring consideration of the email retrieval issue. The court's judgment that this investigation should proceed before a public airing of these allegations also is applicable in our view to the committee's request to interview the civil division attorneys assigned to the Alexander case. In the department's view, committee interviews of these attorneys would interfere with and may undermine the ongoing criminal investigation. In addition, the committee's proposed inquiry of the lawyers in the civil division runs counter to the department's view that line attorneys and agents should not be required to answer questions from Congress about the conduct of litigation or a pending criminal investigation. We try our hardest to ensure that the department's line attorneys and agents can exercise the independent judgment essential to effective law enforcement and litigation. That independent judgment is seriously threatened when Congress seeks to question department attorneys or agents about the actions they took and the litigation decisions they made in an ongoing case. There have been bipartisan objections to congressional inquiries of department line attorneys, even when those attorneys have been sought to explain matters that have concluded. Former Attorneys General Barr and Civiletti have argued against subpoenas to line assistant United States attorneys, as has former Acting Attorney General Stuart Gerson. The American Bar Association has also argued against it. The Bipartisan National Association of Former United States Attorneys sent a letter to Assistant Attorney General Robinson last month making the point that the effect on morale and the prosecutorial process would be devastating if career prosecutors were called before Congress to explain and defend their decisions. Similarly, Mr. Chairman, we are not in a position at this time to answer your questions or provide documents about the recent interviews of the President or Vice President conducted in furtherance of the ongoing campaign finance investigations. As I mentioned in my letter of December 30, 1999, the prosecutors and agents assigned to the Campaign Finance Task Force continue to pursue actively any and all criminal violations of the campaign finance laws. The questions asked of the President and Vice President, like those addressed to other recent witnesses, 
pertain to ongoing campaign finance criminal investigations. To date, these investigations in which the President and Vice President have been interviewed a total of seven times have produced 24 prosecutions with 16 convictions and six cases awaiting trial. Producing witness summaries and documents about recent interviews would risk compromising the ongoing investigations and undermine the confidentiality that is essential to effective law enforcement. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the committee's oversight interest in this matter, and I understand the committee's frustration with the department's pending matter policy. But I also know that the committee respects deeply the responsibilities of the Attorney General to enforce the law, and I know the committee has tried to avoid any action that would jeopardize the effectiveness of this or any other criminal investigation. I continue to hope that we can work together to accommodate the committee's legitimate oversight needs while protecting the integrity of our law enforcement efforts. I will continue to try to do everything I can to make that possible. If I could have that introduced into the record. Without objection. I had two, there are two uh, small but important mistakes in the written testimony, but not in the oral that I know, that I just said. Uh, in the first paragraph on page one of the written, it says in the few days since the chairman's letter was sent, but it has been seven days, and I appreciate your, your forewarning of the mm -hmm. questions. Also on page four, the written testimony says there that the investigation has produced 22 prosecutions. I'm told this morning it's been 24. Appreciate that. Well, we were uh, going to, uh, did you want to, you want to make uh, some opening, you want to you have some opening questions on your side? We're going to go to our council. Okay, we'll go with our council, but let me just say as I yield to our council, you can start at, uh, at, at the time. You talked about the record of the uh, Attorney General of the Justice Department. Charlie Tree, who fled the country and was in China for some time, uh, got virtually a slap on the wrist, no jail time, and a very small financial penalty. Uh, John Wong, likewise, got some community service time, slap on the wrist, and a very small financial penalty. And that's the administration of justice that we have seen. And when you cite all of these convictions and all these people being brought to justice, it rings hollow, at least with this chairman, because people who were very, very instrumental in bringing millions of dollars into the DNC and the President's reelection committee were never really brought to justice. They just got a little slap on the wrist, and uh, we, think that's, uh, we think that's an aberration of uh, what justice is all about. We don't think that's what uh, the administration of justice should be. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Raven. I will try and be as brief as possible on these questions. Um, and indeed, your opening statement and the letter that was furnished to this committee early this morning uh, answered some of the questions that we were going to ask. So thank you for providing the answers, albeit at a late date. We're aware that the Campaign Financing Task Force and the Office of Independent Counsel are conducting a joint investigation. And indeed, in your opening statement, you said that uh, the OIC and Justice Department have even conducted joint interviews of individuals. Do you know whether there's ever been a joint investigation like this between the Department of Justice and any Office of Independent Counsel? It's a good question. I don't know. I'll find out for you. And the reason I ask, it's one of the questions we posed to you in our letter last week. We're, we're interested in knowing whether it's appropriate to conduct such an investigation. Is indeed it appropriate for uh, the Department of Justice and the Office of Independent Counsel to engage in a collaborative effort? Thank you. It's the view of the Department of Justice that we have the legal authority, and it is appropriate. I can't and wouldn't speak for the Independent Counsel, but the Independent Counsel explicitly authorized um, uh, the Department of Justice to pursue the investigation, and the authority under which uh, that authorization was exercised was uh, 28 U.S.C. 597A. Right. Now, I, I read your statement with interest, and I, I know 28 U.S.C., um, Section 597, and it, it allows any Office of Independent Counsel to authorize the Department of Justice to investigate a matter, but that's a different issue than we're facing today. It is certainly true that the Office of Independent Counsel could authorize the Department of Justice to uh, investigate the same matters that it itself is investigating. The statute provides that, but is it appropriate, is it indeed legal for uh, 
the Department of Justice and the Office of Independent Counsel to engage in a collaborative effort. Right. I think it's a, it's a very fair and interesting question. I can only speak for one of the parties engaged, which is the Department of Justice thinks it is appropriate to coordinate and has coordinated with the OIC on this matter. I don't know if joint investigation, I'm not quibbling with you, I don't know that joint investigation um, is a term of art. I don't, I don't, and I, I'd be very hesitant to overcharacterize or undercharacterize for that matter. That is, I don't want to say anything inaccurate. Well, just the I extent mean, of my, let me tell you, the extent of my knowledge is that, that we are, that the Campaign Finance Task Force is coordinating in a way that they think is appropriate with the Independent Council. Again, I can't speak for the Independent Council. I do know that Judge Lampert um, has been um, hearing from uh, the Campaign Finance Task Force. I don't know. I assume he has been hearing from the Independent Council, but again, I don't know about that prong. But Judge Lampert uh, himself has been hearing from the Campaign Finance Task Force about the pace and substance of their investigation. Okay, well, let's let's leave it that I'll, I'll put a request to you now that uh, you provide an answer to the committee as to whether uh, it is indeed uh, provided for in the statute that there can be a collaborative effort. And I, I don't want to get theoretical here. It's my understanding that the Office of Independent Counsel and members of the Department of Justice are sitting in the same room interviewing people at the same time. And one concern is that that um, undercuts the very nature of independence that is in, in the title of independent counsel statute. So that's something perhaps we can't resolve today, but if you could provide for us the legal analysis that allows that to happen. Um, if you could, tell us what the safeguards are that would insulate the, the task force and this and the independent counsel investigation from political influence or supervision at the Department of Justice. What, what special um, safeguards have you built into this particular collaborative effort? Um, I can't speak to every one of them because I don't, I, the j demands of my job are such that I can't participate in every conversation or every meeting on all of the important things going on at the Department of Justice all the time. That being said, I know that the department and the individuals who are charged with doing the different components of what I, what we all know to be a multifaceted issue here um, are careful to respect the lanes and um, it is not uncommon for the department to find itself in a position where in the normal course of representation of an agency or in this case executive office. Right, I, I respect that but I'm, what I'm asking is is there anything special that's been done in this particular case to, to set up a firewall? Do you know of anything different in this case than any other case? I'm, I'm, I need more information to answer you properly because I don't, I haven't participated in other cases, so I don't know if this one is different. And no one has said in this case we have to do well, it unlike every other case. Well, but leave that I, then. I, I won't labor it now. But well, I can tell you what I witnessed. Up. I can tell you what I witnessed, which is a, a division, and it's a, a division and a, a a reminder that there are different lanes and that the divisions need to respect those lanes. And that division, uh, as I say, has been monitored uh, by Judge Lampert. Okay, well, I'll, I'll turn from that now. But I will ask that if, if, if you would please, in the not too distant future, if you could provide for us the analysis of what uh, has been done, if anything. If it, perhaps it's the same situation that's been set up for the task force. Maybe there's nothing different. And if there's nothing different, that's the answer, and that's acceptable uh, in terms of the answer. Um, on March 27, which is now, I guess, five weeks ago, uh, the chairman of the committee made a request to the Department of Justice to appoint a special counsel to investigate the email matter. As of this date, there has been no response to the request. And now that you're here, perhaps you can provide us a, an official response, if there is one. Yes, the official response is that we continue to work on it, that it's a serious request and that it's being taken seriously at the, at the risk of not being seen as a team player at the esteemed Department of Justice, where I'm very happy to be employed. I would have hoped that we could have provided an answer even to ourselves um, earlier than now. I know that we said in a letter to you of April 12th that we would get you an answer promptly, and I continue to hope that it's promptly, and that's the best I can do. From, from the perspective of the committee, we've asked this question because an awful lot has happened in the last five weeks. And 
Now, I, I'd like to give you a, a real-world example. Of course, I'm, I'm reminded by folks, and I, I clearly this is not on all fours, but I am reminded that under the then existent independent council statute, the department had 90 days to determine. But I, I would fully hope that, that we'd get you an answer long before 90 days. Well, let me, I mean, I'll, I'll work into this. I'll work into this slowly, but do you, do you know when the okay. Justice Department Excuse me, let me just interrupt here. I, I don't know what kind of time frame would be allowable, but we would certainly hope it would be quicker than 90 days. In fact, it doesn't seem like it's that difficult a decision to make. We're talking about the Justice Department being on both sides of an issue. You've got one division of the Justice Department on one side and another one on the other side. How can the Justice Department, you know, work against itself? That's, that's the issue, and I don't think that issue should take 90 days or 30 days. Right. We need to have an answer back, and, and uh, the Attorney General and her, uh, her, her top aides over there ought to be able to uh, sit down and resolve this in a matter of a few hours. Right. It's, it's not the uh, Department of Justice working against itself. I know that that characterization has been said before, but there are, as I understand it, a group of career employees in the civil division about whom allegations have been made. Allegations became sufficient such that the campaign finance task force thought it appropriate to open a criminal investigation. Once that occurs, the ordinary course of business is to stay or defer that aspect of a civil litigation, in this case the Alexander case, which might be implicated or interfere with the criminal investigation, which we think takes primacy. We think that's the most important thing. And I appreciate the characterization that's been made that it's the Department of Justice working against itself, but I have learned that, in fact, it is not uncommon for so the... I, I want to make sure I understand. So what you're saying is the civil case is, in essence, being put on hold while the criminal case proceeds? Um, no, I don't mean to say that, and if I did, I apologize. Those aspects of the civil case, the Alexander litigation, which are implicated by the criminal investigation, are deferred, but they're only deferred through the approval of Judge Lambert. We can't do that on our own. But the, the campaign finance task force folks go to the judge and engage him in the progress of the criminal investigation, and the judge makes a decision at what pace, the, what aspects of the civil litigation should be deferred or not. But the request has been made that uh, he defer action on the civil case until the criminal uh, uh, case has been resolved. That's what they re requested of the judge, right? I'm with you 92 percent of that, I think. I have to go look at the, the filing again, but I think So in essence, what the Justice Department is asking for is a deference of the civil case while they run out the clock on the criminal case. They're asking for a deferral of those aspects of the civil case. There are aspects of the Alexander case which proceed, and there are aspects which we've asked to defer, and the judge has... has taken that under advisement. Take it under advice. Thank you. There are, there are two real-world problems that have come up, and maybe they're not of great significance at the end of the day, but help, help me work through these. One, um, it has come to our attention that when the, when the mail two problem was discovered, individuals at the White House contacted a Department of Justice attorney named Jason Barron, and we have no idea what that contact entailed, but the White House reached out to a Department of Justice lawyer named Jason Barron. Yesterday, late in the afternoon, we were provided documents by the White House that had been kept from us subject to claims of privilege. And on one of the documents, there was the name Jason Barron and his telephone number. Now, we have not had an opportunity to ask people what happened, and we'll do that in the future. But um, we have been asking to talk to Department of Justice attorneys, and you have 
very respectfully declined our requests and said we cannot do that. Uh, I am wondering whether you know if the Department of Justice has or has not authorized Mr. Barron to talk to anybody in the White House. Ooh, I don't know that. I would very much like you to find that out if you could. Whether, whether the Department has authorized Mr. Barron to talk to yes. anyone in the White House. It's my understanding that uh, Mr. Barron, who, who may not be employed by the Department of Justice now, but falls under the same constraints that you apply to us when we request line attorneys to testify, uh, we, we are prevented from having line attorneys to talk to in this particular case. And yet we were very surprised by a contemporaneous notation of Mr. Barron's name with his telephone number on top, uh, written by somebody who is employed by the White House. We do not know whether there's been a contact or not. But this is one of the real world problems that we face. We ask for a special counsel because we're concerned by the types of appearances and, and problems that uh, occur when the Department of Justice is investigating, first of all, its own lawyers, and second of all, people in the White House Counsel's Office. Um, that's one thing. I'll return to that slightly in a moment. Second thing is, w documents were withheld from us temporarily by the Department of Justice under claims of privilege. Do you know whether the White House consulted with the Office of Legal Counsel regarding claims of privilege? I, I don't have any information about that. That's another question we'd very much like you to answer, because in the past, when the White House has decided to embark upon considering claims of executive privilege, as has indeed happened in this particular case, the White House has gone to the Office of Legal Counsel. Now, this committee obviously would have a, a particular concern with the White House going to the Department of Justice, which is already on both sides of the same case, and getting a reading as to whether the Department of Justice concurs with a claim of privilege. And this is another conflict that we've seen just in the last week, potentially. So again, if you could provide an answer to that specific question. Yeah, there's two prongs to that. I'll find out, and then I have to find out what the restrictions are on revealing when I find out. OK. Um, what's the, I mean, help me out. And if, what's, the, what's the conflict in, I don't know that they did. Well, and I'll try to the, find out. But what's the, the conflict, conflict in the this. White House asking about the uh, the the legal aspects of asserting a privilege, which is the White House's to assert, which I understand they didn't right. assert. This this you know I don't want to be mysterious here. Congress wants documents, just as we would have liked to have had full searches of all this this universe of emails back two years ago, and not have had to wait all this time. Congress has asked for information, and the White House decided to take an approach that would have denied the committee access to certain documents. And one of the questions we would ask is whether the Department of Justice was at all com complicitous in preventing documents from coming to Congress. That's part of, again. But they didn't assert privilege, right? Well, again, but there was a Spokesperson delay. Spokesperson mentioned that they were there, thinking about it? There was a delay. Documents were, were not produced to us immediately. Right. They were, I'll, they were I'll subject find to out. privilege. So we'd like to know whether the Department of Justice was providing legal services. I mean, this is the question. Did the Department of Justice provide legal service to the White House in a case that it's already on two sides of the issue? Let, let me just clarify a question or ask a question for clarification. The gentleman's name that was in the margins on this document that was delivered to us and his phone number, is he a member of the Department of Justice? Uh, Mr. Barron was the Department of Justice attorney. He apparently has been uh, teaching at a, a university in Canada and is on his way back to the United States. He's going to be taking up a position, apparently, uh, in, in the United States government. We do not know his current... Is he on a sabbatical service. from the Department of Justice or on leave or what? We do, we do not know his I'll name. I'll find out his status, right? sir. I don't, I don't know. But I, I do know, and I'm, I'm glad his name... I'm not glad his name has come up, but since his name has come up, I under-answered, I was told yesterday, you had asked me the last time I was here, uh, the civil division attorneys that worked on the case, and I ultimately was able to provide, at the, toward the end of that hearing, a list of four or five people. Apparently, Mr. Barron was one of them. Is one of the attorneys who worked on the case. He was not. His name does not appear on the pleadings, apparently. But he's one of the attorneys that worked on the civil case. Yeah. And what, those documents that we received were those regarding the civil case, with his phone number on them. The documents we received. Uh, appear to be documents that relate to members in the White House trying to find out what's happening in this matter right now. So it appears to be 
the White House gathering information. And so, you know, we might say they're doing their, their homework right now. And the simple way of putting it is, has the Department of Justice helped the White House do their homework to prepare for these hearings? And we will be hearing from former White House and current White House employees tomorrow. Um, the, the simple question is, has the Department of Justice, notwithstanding this potential right. conflict, helped the White House prepare for the hearings that right. we're putting on right now? Yeah. I have no knowledge of that. I have not. I have, I have stayed away from that, but, I have, but I'll find out. If you could follow up on that, that would be yes, very sir. helpful. Now, just, just to um, stay on the line attorney policy for just a moment, uh, I worked at the Department of Justice. I'm extremely sympathetic to the Department of Justice's line attorney policy. As I pointed out to you and associates who are behind you, uh, the committee has a conceptual problem with the way the department has handled the line attorney policy. Um, we are well aware that line attorneys have been made available to um, Chairman Dingell's subcommittee in the Rocky Flats dispute. They've testified to us in Waco investigations we've conducted. Uh, Senator Specter recently had line attorneys testify before him in the Senate. There appears to be a unifying factor in, in all of this, and that is when the line attorneys have been able to tell a story that's helpful to the Department of Justice, they have been provided for uh, questioning. Now, I, what I'd like, if you could help us with, is if you could distinguish the situations where um, line attorneys have testified before Chairman Dingell, before ourselves in the Waco investigation, before uh, Senator Specter, just in the last few weeks, from our request to have access to line attorneys that we would like to talk I to. Can, um, I can convey to you the distinctions that are conveyed to me. The distinctions are either fact witness, subpoena, or mistake. Those are the, those are the three basic exceptions that I, not exceptions, but those are the three basic defenses or justifications, if you will, that I have been able to discern distinguishing one matter from another. I, I hear your neutral principle that we serve it up when it tells a good story or not. I, I'd be eager to talk with you more about that. I, I, and I don't mean this flippantly, but I think we would serve up a lot more if that were the neutral principle. That'd be my sense. I am more comfortable as, as one of the spokespersons for the department, and my name goes on a letter, I'm more comfortable articulating the policy along the lines of the following. We try mightily, and we do almost everything we can to prevent line attorneys from testifying in public or responding, especially during an ongoing matter, to questions from Congress about how they're handling a case, both the strategy and the substance of the case. Sometimes those efforts are successful from our point of view, and sometimes they're not. And I'm well, I'm, I'm, and I appreciate that, and, and what you say makes sense to us. But in this case, we're not looking for a strategy in a case. We're not looking for the substantive uh, material that's that's being discussed in the case. The the conduct of the attorneys themselves is under investigation, both by the Department of Justice and the Independent Counsel, and by this committee. Right. Uh, let me let me just try and at least clarify one thing that's been now outstanding for for a year and a half, and that is, it was rep. It It, it was represented to us by the, the very colleague that's sitting behind you uh, 18 months ago that the principle that the Department of Justice was standing on was that if line attorneys had talked to the press, that was a deciding factor in making them available to testify before Congress. That was not one of the three factors you just cited a moment ago. And I'd like to know, and the committee would like to know, finally, whether that is indeed a principle that you hold out as having any relevance whatsoever to your decision making. Yeah. Well, oh, you asked an easier question than I thought you were going to ask. Does Try it have, to make it <laughs> Does it have any relevance? I think that every, I, I, I think that we treat every accommodation and every committee as sui generis. And the use of stare decisis in these cases has, has confused me from the moment I've gotten to the department. In that sense, um, it's relevant. I, I have disagreements with my superiors and people with whom I work and my staff on any number of matters, small and large, and 
Um, I think I need to continue to learn more about this one, but I would go so far as to say it'd be a relevant factor, um, but I wouldn't consider it dispositive. Okay. Well, let, let's just turn to another subject very quickly, if we may. Uh, at the last hearing uh, at which you testified, we had asked for your assistance in providing the names of civil division lawyers who had worked on the uh, email matter in the, in the uh, Alexander case, and you provided those names, and we are grateful for that. Um, can you tell us the lawyers who actually participated in preparing the, the affidavit submitted by Daniel Barry in the Alexander case? Not yet. I can't yet. That is a key fact. I presume it's a key fact. It's a fact in the ongoing criminal investigation. Who said what to whom and when, and whether or not there was anything inappropriate in consultation or action vis-a-vis -vis that affidavit uh, is a fact um, that is being investigated by the criminal investigation. So, so, so you, you, you know who it is, but because of No, I don't. Because, because I knew that I could not speak about it, I don't, I didn't, there was no reason for me to inquire. How long ago has it been that we asked for that? It's been a month, has it? About a month. I and appreciate unless that. it's and covered it's by grand jury or 6C or an ongoing investigation, we'd like to know who that was or who they were. Right. So and can, I, you, can you can I kind of speed that up for us? I mean, it's been a month. I can ask the criminal investigation to speed their investigation up. I absolutely, I think that... that, I, they, think that I mean, it can't be that hard to find out who participated in helping him with that document. Oh, no, it couldn't be hard at all. You're right. And that's, that's in for, but I wouldn't be able to reveal that information even if I knew it until the criminal investigation is complete. This morning we received a letter from the Attorney General that was helpful in explaining, in very general terms, uh, a decision that has been made. The committee has subpoenaed uh, recent interviews of the President and the Vice President. And this morning we learned uh, in a letter from Attorney General Reno to the Chairman that the Department of Justice would not provide those uh, the interview summaries of those two interviews. And, you know, I'd like to stay away. We, we understand the rationale of the letter. We, we, we understand your basis. However, the first question is, is, is it true to say that everything in those interviews pertains to ongoing cases? I, I don't know. I don't know. I presume th that that is the I don't think that's answered in the letter, and I don't oh, no, think it's answered right. in your it's statement, not. so it won't help to look back. But um, it, if you could answer that question as well, I mean, we, what, what, you, what you are representing to us is that we cannot have uh, these interview summaries. Now, we have been, for the last three years, very respectful of all requests from the Department of Justice to not interfere with ongoing investigations. In the, in the Johnny Chung hearing, we kept names off of the table. In the, in the tree hearings, in the Wong hearings, we did not ask certain questions because we were requested not to. And, and we have been respectful of the 6E policy, and we've been respectful of ongoing investigations. So simply put, the question is, if, if there is material that does not pertain to ongoing investigations, then we should at least have an expectation to receive that information. Right. I, I, am, I can confirm that the interviews were conducted in furtherance of an ongoing investigation. You know that. But you're asking a more nuanced question. Right. If there are two, three, four, five, eight, nine, ten questions that are clearly uh, relevant to a closed investigation, then... Not closed or not open. Now, let me get... Well, I'll give you a specific example because it helps explain what I'm saying. Um, the, the committee has been publicly very critical, uh, and the chairman has made many statements about the failure of the task force to ask the vice president about the Shilai Temple Buddhist fundraiser. Uh, many, many times the chairman has said not one single question was asked of the vice president. It is our understanding that questions were asked of the vice president at his recent interview about the Buddhist Temple fundraiser. Now, we have been told that the vice president is not under investigation. There's already been a prosecution of Maria Shaw. Um, it, it's difficult for us to understand what is ongoing about this investigation unless you were to try and uh, say that it was the, the contempt prosecution of the nuns or something else. But there appears to be nothing ongoing. Indeed, it would be manifestly unfair to question somebody after the prosecution of Maria Shaw if this issue was still ongoing. So what we don't understand is what is off the table, what is 
ongoing about the Buddhist Temple fundraiser. Right. You've been told in, in a variety of fora, orally and, and in letters, that the Campaign Finance Task Force is pursuing ongoing investigations, and that's a dynamic concept. Things close, and they learn new information, as would be the case, I assume, in many prosecutions, that may reopen something. Now, I that recognize... That I understand. Fair enough. That's I recognize that the independent counsel statute right. is done, but you can learn information from a witness that leads you to a new line of inquiry, and I think I, the Campaign Finance Task Force, I, I avoid asking too many questions of them. I don't want to politicize what they're doing either. That's a risk that I have to throw into the mix, but they remind me that they have interviewed the President and the Vice President seven times, and they've asked, they say, a lot of questions. So recognizing that investigations are dynamic, they close, they open, and that's a rationale for a prosecutor questioning somebody else. I'll ask you the specific question. Has the investigation of the vice president been reopened in the Shilai Temple matter? I don't know. Is it because you're not able to tell us or because you don't know? Uh, the latter. I don't know. Excuse me, uh, if I could, Counselor. Is this... Uh some, something's coming to my mind called deliberate ignorance. I don't understand. What I don't understand here is you're saying, gee, I don't want to ask questions because I don't want to interject politi politics into it. How would you're asking a question, an employee and official of the Clinton Department of Justice inquiring into the status of an investigation of another attorney in the Clinton Department of Justice politicize something? A, a political appointee confirmed by the you, Senate. You just, you just said a few moments ago that you don't ask too many questions because you don't want to interject politics into it. I want to be very careful about ongoing how criminal would, how, investigations. How, how, could, how could you possibly interject politics into a one Department of Justice official inquiring of another Department of Justice A political official? appointee asking questions of a career of a line attorney? That You don't think that has an inherent... Oh, I think there's a lot of politics with this administration. But this is the first time that I've heard that used as, as a defense to finding out information and transmitting information to Congress by somebody within the administration. Yeah, I didn't... I, I think I'm, it's thoroughly politicized. Well, your, your characterization of a defense is interesting. I didn't, I didn't assert it as a defense to anything. I said it's one of the considerations I have. I, I, I have to prepare myself and do prepare myself and try to prepare myself for your very valid questions. I think but, I have But to, yet he just asked a very valid question and you said... I don't know. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, you apparently haven't pursued. I, I think that was a very relevant question. And it's certainly the answer to it is not going to compromise any investigation, just asking, is, there, is the investigation still open? I, just, I don't I just know. Think I, we're will, getting, I will we're ask the run around. If, we can, if we can communicate that to you, we will. Well, but it requires we, you to ask a question, and you seem to be even hesitant to ask questions of your people at the Department of Justice. That's you've what asked me to ask a question. I will ask that question. The uh, Chief Counsel's uh, time has expired. We have uh, two or three votes on the floor. Uh, we will stand in recess to follow the gavel, at which time Mr. Waxman will have some time. We'll show you the last portion of yesterday's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. And in about 45 minutes, live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the U.S. Senate, with more debate on the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Join Book TV the first Sunday of every month for In Depth a new monthly series on C-SPAN 2 focusing on the life and works of a selected author. The picture on the back of you, you remember those days? No. Each month, we present a live one-on-one -on -one interview from our Washington studio to learn more about an author's career, body of work, and approach to the craft of writing. 
It's a pretty tough way to make a living. You can also participate in the three-hour program by phoning in your questions and comments. Go ahead, Milwaukee. That's In Depth, the first Sunday of every month at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, here on C-SPAN 2. This Sunday, In Depth, Joan Didion. Ms. Didion is a renowned essayist and journalist, as well as the author of several novels. Her works include Slouching Towards Bethlehem, Salvador, and The Last Thing He Wanted. Join us Sunday live at noon Eastern, when we'll spend three hours with Ms. Didion to talk about her life's work. We'll also be taking your phone calls. In Depth, Joan Didion, this Sunday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, live as part of Book TV, here on C-SPAN 2. Now the final portion of yesterday's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. Assistant Attorney General Robert Rabin met with lawmakers for another 35 minutes before the committee adjourned for the day. This note, testifying today before the House Government Reform Committee, former White House counsel Charles Ruff. I yield to Mr. Waxman for his time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rabin, is it Rabin? Rabin. Rabin. Yes, sir, it's Rabin. Okay. I got that right now. <laughs> Uh, the chairman has criticized the Justice Department for not allowing our committee to talk to line attorneys working in the civil division uh, about the Alexander case. Uh, that is the case brought by Judicial Watch concerning FBI files that were provided to the White House. Uh, the department has responded quite reasonably, I believe, that it has a clear and consistent policy of not providing the line attorneys to Congress to answer questions about department litigation, particularly when the litigation is still ongoing. Now the committee could subpoena those same line attorneys and force them to come up here and testify. The issue, however, is not whether we have the power to do that, but whether that would be a wise, prudent, and exercise of our subpoena power. It may be helpful for us to consider an affidavit filed by Robert J. Conrad, Jr., the head of the department, department's campaign finance task force in the Alexander case. And I'd ask unanimous consent that uh, this uh, affidavit be part of the uh, record. Without objection. In that affidavit signed on March 23 of this year, Mr. Conrad notified the court that the task force had launched a criminal investigation into the missing emails and that he asked the court to postpone any inquiry into the emails until the task force had concluded its investigation. Mr. Conrad stated emphatically that allowing civil attorneys to investigate the email problem quote, would interfere with and potentially compromise the task force's own investigation of the pending allegations, end quote. Now, the chairman has suggested that this was simply a ploy to prevent the court looking into the email problem. He's free to make whatever allegations he wants. But let me point out that the Office of Independent Counsel, Robert Ray, supported Mr. Conrad's request. Mr. Conrad says uh, just that in paragraph 10 of his affidavit. What's more, the judge in Alexander, Royce Lamberth, who is not known to be particularly partial to the White House, agreed with Mr. Conrad's request. So apparently the department's task force, the Office of Independent Counsel and Judge Royce Lamberth, all agree on one thing, that the department's civil division line attorneys should refrain from investigating the email matter further until a criminal investigation is complete. By the way, of all three of these people, Mr. Conrad, Independent Counsel Ray, and Judge Lamberth, are all in on this conspiracy to protect the White House, then this is perhaps one of the most remarkable conspiracies in the history of the Republic. Now, the chairman can subpoena these line attorneys and insist that they discuss their email investigations before this committee, but if he does so, he is going against a determination my, made by the department's task force, the independent counsel, and Judge Lambert that public testimony by those same civil division attorneys about their email investigation would compromise the criminal investigation. Given those circumstances, I think it would be inappropriate and imprudent to demand that those line attorneys appear before our committee to discuss their activities in the Alexander case. I wanted to put that uh, st uh, view on the, on the record and have that out there. Um, Chairman Burton recently subpoenaed the Department of Justice for interview summaries. These are known as FBI 302s of dozens of interviews concerning the DOJ's campaign finance investigation. My understanding is the department has given our committee access to these FBI interview notes, 
when the department considered its investigation to be closed. Is that correct? That's, uh, yes. All of the interview summaries requ requested by Chairman Burton involved investigation of Democrats. However, I understand that the Justice Department's campaign finance investigation has examined allegations relating to both Democratic and Republican fundraising practices. Is that correct? I don't have independent knowledge of that. I, I have read accounts of those. I presume that to be true. Some of the investigations into Republican practices are also closed investigations. If the committee requested copies of the FBI interviews relating to these closed investigations, is there any reason why the department could not provide copies of the interview notes? Our policy uh, for the provision of 302s has been uh, it, the uh, 302 uh, should be a summary of a closed case and it should be a request of the committee and then we would redact for the normal 6E and privacy redactions. If there are any others, um, I'll, I'll let you know, but that's the basic policy. Well, there have been serious allegations relating to the fundraising practices of former National Committee head Haley Barber. In fact, some of the most serious allegations involving foreign campaign money in the 1996 election concern Haley Barber and the National Policy Forum. According to these allegations, Mr. Barber solicited over $1 million in foreign money from a Hong Kong businessman named Ambrose Young for an entity called the National Policy Forum which was an arm of the Republican National Committee. These funds were then used in 1994 congressional races around the country. According to press accounts and other sources, individuals reportedly with knowledge relevant to the Haley Barber allegations include Haley Barber, Ambrose Tung Young, Benton Becker, Richard Richards, Mark Braden, Stephen Richards, David Norcross, Michael Baruti, Fred Volkensik, Donald Fierce, Scott Reed, Daniel Denning, Henry Barber, Joanne Coe, Kevin Kellum, John Bolton, K Jay Benning, Stephen S. Walker Jr., Ed Rogers, and Kirk Blaylock. Uh, Mr. Rabin, will you provide the committee with summaries of any FBI and DOJ interviews with each of these individuals, as well as any other FBI and DOJ interviews with witnesses with knowledge relating to allegations that Republicans raised illegal foreign contributions? Uh, we respond to these requests in a nonpartisan way. At the request of the committee, we will provide 302s of closed investigations redacted, as I said, for 60 and privacy. Yes, sir. Well, another area that I have repeatedly asked that... It, it would be. I, I, I should probably clarify that for you so as not to mislead you. It needs to be the request of the committee. Okay. Well, if, these are, if the committee has requested the 302 interviews from you of the closed cases for Democratic campaign uh, questions, then I see no reason why this committee shouldn't also request of you the uh, 302s of the interviews uh, relating to uh, closed investigations of the Republican National Committee, Mr. Haley Barber, and those that I mentioned. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask you to join me in requesting the DOG provide the committee with these interview summaries. I just uh, was made aware of uh, the uh, request by the uh, ranking minority member, and uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, check with the parliamentarian about the, uh, about the uh, justification of whether or not we should go ahead with this, and I, I will be happy to do that. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's not a question for the parliamentarian, it's a question for the, this committee. And this committee has routinely asked for the 302s when there was a, an investigation of Democratic uh, potential finance abuses. And when the Justice Department closed the cases, you asked that we get those 302s uh, because we wanted to evaluate how they've acted. Uh, there are, uh, have been investigations of Republicans, and these cases have been closed, and we ought to get the 302s from those cases as well. There's no difference, and uh, uh, there's no rationale that would say that this committee would want to get the, the 302s for uh, what the campaign finance investigation did for some of these Democratic uh, accusations when there are accusations against Republicans. We ought to get those documents as well. Uh, Mr. Raven, uh, another area that I've repeatedly asked the committee to investigate are allegations made by Texas businessman Peter Claren regarding the 1996 campaign of Republican candidate Brian Babbitt. 
According to these allegations, Majority Whip Tom DeLay and Mr. Babin knowingly participated in a scheme to funnel illegal conduit contributions to Mr. Babin's campaign through vehicles that included include an entity known as Triad Management. The delay Babin allegations are also some of the most serious allegations that have been made relating to conduit contributions in the 1996 campaign. In this case, there is specific and credible evidence that a senior Republican member of Congress and a Republican congressional candidate knowingly participated in a scheme to funnel illegal conduit contributions. According uh, to media accounts and information gathered by my staff's investigation of these allegations, individuals who purportedly have knowledge relevant to the delay Babin allegations include Peter Claren, Brian Babin, Representative DeLay, Robert Mills, Paul Pavito, Mike Lucia, Gail Averett, Robert and Don Cohn, Floyd and Ann Coates, Karen Malinick, and Walter Wetzel. Uh, Mr. Rabin, will you provide the committee the interview summaries for any interview DOJ and FBI conducted of these and other individuals regarding the delay Babin allegations? As I said, sir, our policy is at the request of the committee, we will provide 302s for closed investigations redacted for privacy in 6E. Well, every time I... Every time I've raised this issue uh, for our committee to investigate it, the chairman has said this is, issue has been investigated by the Department of Justice and they've closed the case. So I would like to ask the chairman if, if he would join me in requesting that DOG provide the committee with these summaries of any interviews with these individuals regarding the delay Babin allegations. And we We've been called many things, sir, but not DOG. Uh, after a while, even a J becomes a G with my speech impediment. Well, I'm hopeful, obviously, discussions are going on, that we can get these documents. There's no reason not to. Uh, we ought to get the, the, the documents from you for, for our committee to know what kind of job Justice Department's been doing investigating allegations of campaign finance abuses. Uh, and I would hope, Mr. Uh, Chairman, that we can have an agreement on this. Uh, if not, uh, well, you can do what you want to. Give me a chance. Give me a second. stop my time from running?
Uh, I've talked to the uh, staff about this. We have, uh, according to the staff, uh, a large number of 302s uh, outstanding. And if we agree to this, uh, the 302s relating to Peter Cloran and Haley Barber, we want the Justice Department to understand that we want uh, all of the 302 outstanding document requests that we're talking about given to us along with these. And if that's agreed to, how many of them are there? We should get, we've actually asked for those some time back, but we should be getting those, if not simultaneously, before uh, we get these. And if we get that agreement from the Justice Department, I have no problem in uh, joining with you on the point. Well, we've asked for, yes. What's that? Uh, I think the Justice Department ought to give us all, uh, our committee on both sides, the 302s of any cases that are closed. That has been their policy. And if you have requests out, that we ought to, you ought to get your request satisfied, and we ought to get our request satisfied. And we ought to have it for our committee's documents uh, so we can evaluate the job the Justice Department has done in this regard. We have... Uh we there have, there we, is a distinction between closed and open cases. I understand. I understand. The open cases. Uh, the, the one thing that concerns me about the 302s is that we, we believe, Mr. Waxman, that there's some politicization of the, of the Justice Department, as you know, and you may not agree with that. We do. And as a result, we believe that some of the cases may be kept open so we cannot get the 302s. Now, uh, that's one of the major concerns that we have. I don't think we have any big objection to you getting these 302s, but what we want to do is get the 302s that we've requested, and if we can get that, uh, since we've requested them some time ago, then we, well, I think we can work this out. We, uh, do we have a list of all those 302s we've requested? We're, we're talking, we're, we're, Mr. Waxman, we're talking not only about 302s, but other subpoenaed documents that we requested from the Justice Department that, uh, that, that, that the Justice Department has not given us. I mean, there's a whole host of things, 302s, documents that we've requested, the labella and free memos, which uh, we have never received, and, and we don't understand why in the world there should be a... I don't, I don't Chairman, sir, may I? If you'll excuse me, Mr. Ray. This committee has asked for 302s from the Justice Department on cases that have been closed. The Justice Department has furnished 302s uh, on some of those cases. The, the majority on the committee is asking for additional 302s for closed cases. We're asking for additional 302s. We're asking for 302s on the cases that I mentioned. Now, the committee majority may be asking for other documents as well that you may or may not be able to give them for one reason or another. That you have to deal with the committee uh, majority on. But for the 302s on cases that are closed, the Republicans ought to get what they've requested and we ought to get what we've requested. And Mr. Chairman, I, I would like you to join with me in making that demand of the Justice Department at this hearing. The, the, the problem that we have, and I have no objection, like I said, to getting these 302s, but when, when the 302 was requested, for instance, on Congress, former Congressman Solomon, that 302 was brought over to us in one day. Other 302s that we requested have been languishing for months and months, and we have not received them. And, and so what we want to do is make sure that the documents and the 302s that we requested, we get immediately. And we'll, we'll go along with the 302s that you request. They can get them to you as quickly as they want to, but we want the documents we've subpoenaed and the documents we requested in the form of 302s as well. Well, then let me join with you in making a joint request to the Justice Department that you give us all the 302s that we're asking for to which we're entitled and that they all come in together. And that uh, if the chairman's concerned that we'll get ours and they won't get theirs, let's, let's make a request that you give them all to us as quickly as possible. Well, well, why don't we do this? If you gentlemen would yield. The gentleman would yield. If the gentleman, there's no motion on the floor. If the gentleman would yield. The gentleman need help? Can we help you out in any way? The gentleman would yield. Yes. Why don't we issue a subpoena 
for the dot for the 302s that you have requested and in that subpoena we will request or we will issue a subpoena that includes the documents that we've requested and the 302s we've requested that way everything will be in one subpoena that way you'll get what you want and we'll get what we want do you have any objection to that Mr. Chairman, I think we have the makings of an agreement. I just want to clarify that what we want in the subpoena are the names that I read with regard to the Haley Barber allegations and the Claren allegations, all of those, uh, and you have the list we've given you, of uh, those uh, cases. And so all of those names ought to be subpoenaed for 302s that the Justice Department FBI would have. If you want to add to that subpoena other uh, documents, uh, I, have, I have no problem with that. What we want to do is make sure that all documents that we have previously subpoenaed, all 302s that we've requested and subpoenaed, uh, in addition to what you've requested here today, uh, all be given uh, to us in a timely fashion, and that we don't want, and I, this has to be spelled out so justice understands it, we don't want the 302s for Republicans given to the Democrat minority before we get the documents that we have requested and subpoenaed in the past. Simultaneously, that's fine. But we don't want this favoritism shown one way or the other. Mr. Chairman, that's agreeable with us. Is that agreeable with us? Hmm? Uh, the, the subpoena, uh, uh, how about uh, that in the subpoena it be specified that all the documents be given to jointly to both the majority and minority staff simultaneously? That's reasonable. I don't know how you put that in a subpoena. Sir, I, uh, if, 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 if you just hold for just a second here. All right. Is there, uh, uh, I, actually, we don't even need a motion, but if you care to make a motion. Well, let, let's, um, Mr. Chairman, but based on the agreement, Said, said a motion is not necessary. I will. Based on, on our discussion here, we have given, we will submit on the record list to you. We have the and, list. Okay, you have the and list. And the list is a matter of record. Okay, the matter. We, we will submit the list for the record today so that there's no doubt about what, it's cons what it consists of. So it will be a part of the record. It, it will be in there today. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for this agreement. And, okay. uh, and we will uh, go along with your request. The, 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 the subpoena in detail will be issued and we'll consult with both the majority and minority councils to make sure that correspondence going along with the subpoena is detailed thoroughly so that uh, there's no misunderstanding about it. Mr. Chairman, I would like unanimous consent that the record reflect that I object to this procedure. The record shall reflect that. Is there further discussion? Uh, Mr. Waxman, you still have time. I, I still have time, um, and I'll yield to any members who want to ask Mr. R Raven some questions. Otherwise, uh, I, I thank uh, members who come. May I, sir? Yes. Say what I've been trying to say. <laughs> I, I'd be eager to work with you, as, as we've tried to work in the past, to be responsive to all of the requests. If I heard part of your agreement to be that nothing would be produced until everything that was producible was produced. If I heard that to be the case, then I would need clarification on that. That would be inconsistent with what I think is a, is a relatively healthy protocol that we have been able to work out with the majority, which prioritizes among the list of documents and 302s they want. Now, we don't, we have not for, 
variety of production reasons been able to meet the priorities jot and tittle but the priorities have been useful i understood for both the committee and for us and i would hope that we would among the cohort of materials that you're going to identify in this subpoena with that we would hold open the opportunity to talk with let you about let me say on our part we'll talk to the chairman about that and decide how we're going to proceed okay the, the, that. The, the, the thing that justice needs to know, though, is that we, we, we are adamant about documents that have been previously subpoenaed and requested that we have not received. And if we're going to, and as, as we've agreed to, we're going to ask for these 302s in a subpoena for the Democrat minority, we want to make sure that the Justice Department gives us the documents that we are entitled to, legally entitled to, that we have not yet received in accordance with the subpoena. You will convey that to them. Okay, Mr. Do Chairman. You have, do you have any more comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have some time if anybody wants me to yield. If not, I yield back uh, the time. The gentleman yields this, back the balance of his time. The further discussion. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yeah. down, in the, down here in amongst the. Mr. Osi? Kitty table, thank you. Did I understand the comments from this gentleman to be that we would not receive anything until we received everything? We, we, it, it was my understanding, and of course this is uh, something that was sprung on us very late in the day here. It was my understanding that uh, there might be a rolling production of these things, but the minority and majority together would uh, would make sure that they were uh, were uh, given in a timely fashion and in a fair and equitable way. Are we going to have a date certain, a date certain, by which? these things will be produced? We will put a date certain on the subpoena. I think that's something that, uh, that should be done, but uh, uh, it has to be in a, in a, in a fairly reasonable uh, period because uh, we're talking about a substantial number of 302s. Should also the records to well, we, that, that is understood. That is understood. Is there further discussion? Any questions or any comments from any members? I apologize for hauling everybody in here, but we thought we were going to have a procedural vote, and uh, we didn't want it to be uh, biased. <laughs> Is there further discussion uh, to come before the committee today? Mr. Rabin? Rabin. I got that right. Rabin? No, Rabin. Rabin. I, I'm going to have a heck of a time with you. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, meet with you or somebody from the Justice Department to help. Mr. Barr, we, you have further questions, Mr. Barr? Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barr, you recognize the Thank you. Um, Mr. Rabin, uh, with regard to your statement, uh, I think it was contained in your April 24th uh, letter uh, that, uh, quote, no limits were imposed on the subject matter of the campaign financing task forces, interviews of the president and vice president, close quote. Where did that information come from? Where did the information that no limits were imposed come from? Yes. Let me find my... What's, your, what's your basis for making that statement? That letter uh, was written in part with help from the Campaign Finance Task Force, and the basis for that statement is that it's the truth that, let, let, I'm, I'm sorry, let me start again. Let me start again. We've had a, a subsequent correspondence after that letter. When we got a letter from the chairman on April 28th pointing out um, confusion about that statement, I agreed with the chairman that the statement um, is inconsistent with the factual evidence that we provided with that letter. That is letter, uh, an exchange of letters between, I believe it's the Campaign Finance Task Force and counsel to the President and Vice President, in which there appeared to be an agreement on the subject matter for that set of interviews. When I looked at that in response to the Chairman's response to my letter, I agreed with him that that is a record that seems to limit the questioning. I think the proper statement, and had I to do it over again, 
I would have said that there was, we have no information, we have no evidence of an imposed limitation that is from outside the campaign finance task force. I have the attorney general saying on the record in a, in a letter to the chairman March 21st that she has repeated, I have repeatedly urged the task force to follow the evidence wherever it leads. That's the closest sense of a statement from her that I have with respect to her involvement. Um, but what I should have written and what, I, what is accurate is that we have no, I have no evidence of an imposed limitation on the task force. But there, there, there were limitations on their questioning of the president and vice president. The farthest I know, the farthest I go on that is they seem to have engaged in an agreement, a voluntary agreement with counsel about the subject matter of that set of interviews, and we have records of that, which we provided, and, and if there are more, I've asked people to redouble and, and see did we miss something, given my too small view of what records means in that case. Um, and, and I am told, I've never prosecuted, I know you have, but I've never prosecuted, um, that it is not uncommon for prosecutors to consult with counsel uh, for witnesses or, or, or defense um, about the range of questioning that might come. But I, as I say, I have no, no sense that there was an imposed limitation from elsewhere in the department or elsewhere. Well, for example, there were no, at no point has the president been asked a single question about James Riotti, John Huang, or Charlie Tree. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. I know that I, I haven't, I, I know that well, there wasn't a question. That's a statement. Uh, the president was not asked. Uh, was this just the president wasn't asked in certain interviews that you've seen the 302s from? That that is true too. Yeah, I know that the president has been interviewed. The president, the vice president, has been interviewed a total of seven times, and and I have no, I don't know what the subject matter was of the last sequence. Well, Charles Labella has also uh, said that it was the attorney general's decision that the interviews would be. I think the word was focused, which means limited. Yeah, I don't know what he was referring to. He, he may, I, I read that as well, and he may have been referring to the voluntary agreements that were entered into by the Campaign Finance Task Force and counsel for the president in those interviews. I, I don't know. I know that the, pres that the Attorney General has written to you, to the, to the committee, I've repeatedly urged the task force to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Well, it, it may not be uncommon for prosecutors and attorneys for defendants to, or for deponents to have an agreement beforehand about certain areas, although it would be uncommon for prosecutors to simply not go into uh, fruitful areas of inquiry. Uh, that's certainly uh, not the case. But it is also very common that if there is an agreement between a prosecutor and the attorneys for a witness, to limit the area, the prosecutor is going to get something in return for it. I mean, I, good prosecutors don't just go in and say, oh, please limit the areas that I can question you on. Uh, they want to get something in return. Uh, and they then reduce that to writing. Uh, were either of those things done in this case when the decisions were made, as they apparently were, to limit or focus, whatever word you want to use, or agree to go into only certain areas, one, what do the prosecutors get in return for that concession on their part? Because that is a concession on the part of a prosecutor not to go, to go into certain areas of questioning. Uh, and was it reduced to writing? Two parts. You, you have prosecuted. I have not. I can't speak to the strategy, which sounds... I'm, I'm not asking. I'm just asking two factual questions. Well, when, well, you were... Okay. I may have misunderstood your question, but your premise was that give and take half, that it's you don't a have, you don't have to You don't have to respond to the premise. That's my premise. What I would appreciate you responding to is the two questions. Oh, okay, I only remember one. I, I have one question. I have to tell me what the other is. The, the question that I know is, that, you, that I hear you asking is, is there, is there documentation or evidence of such an agreement? The only thing of which I am aware is what we provided, the exchange of letters that def seems to define the categories for that interview. Uh, and th 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 those letters we have. There are no other letters. Yes. Well, I've read, I 
Yes, last night, last night after rereading the chairman's letter of April 28th, and as I said, I agreed with him, and I have asked staff and relevant campaign finance task force people to look again and see if we underinterpreted uh, the request the first time around. And will you be able, to, uh, we have another hearing, another day of hearing on this subject matter tomorrow. We do. Uh, could the chairman direct that we receive a final, definitive, absolute answer to that question tomorrow at least? So I directed? That, I can make that request. Uh, is there a ball I, bat in the house? Maybe I can make sure I get it. Is there a what in the house? The request that he's talking about. I, I just didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. What I'm saying is, yeah, I'll direct it ASAP. I think it's very important. Well, I think by, I'd only like tomorrow. to have it by tomorrow for hear hearing. You. And there really shouldn't be any problem because presumably there isn't anything because they've already been tasked with. I hear you. I, I hear you. Well, look, uh, we've you know. Hey, the other the other part to my question, premised as as on the same basis, is what did the government prosecutors get in return for conceding not to go into certain areas of inquiry with these two witnesses? I have no knowledge of that. I have no idea that anything of the sort occurred. I have wouldn't no it, knowledge. Wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it be common sense that if a prosecutor is going to go into an interview with a witness and not go into fruitful areas of inquiry that they at least get something in return, unless the witnesses, unless the all three of the parties, the prosecutor, the government, the witnesses, lawyers, and the witness are colluding, which may be what happened here. The three of them got together and said, "We are not going. We don't want these areas going into." The Department of Justice says, "Yes, sir. Absolutely, we will not go into these areas because you, the president, or your attorneys, don't want us to." Now, that's certainly possible, is it not? I, I hear you, sir. It's it, to me, it's a specialty. It's not about common sense. I don't prosecute. Does the gentleman have further questions? I, I've, <laughs> I've, I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> that there's no common sense in. No, you asked me, was, you asked me sir, was, wasn't it common something. sense that there would be a bargain like that? And I don't think that's a question of common sense. I think that's a question of professionalism and strategy about prosecution, which, well, and I don't do that. Professionalism is, one would hope, commonsensical. Gentlemen's time. It used to be. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there further questions by any member of the committee? If not, uh, this has been a very interesting day. I hope tomorrow is... Uh, as interesting but not as contentious. And we uh, stand adjourned. Thank you very Thank much you, for being with us. Today, the House Government Reform Committee will continue with another hearing on subpoenaed White House email. Expected to testify on Capitol Hill, former White House counsel Charles Ruff. Our cameras will be there to cover that and we'll show it to you later tonight. Check our schedule updates for air times or click on cspan.org. Just ahead, live gavel to gavel coverage of the U.S. Senate. Today, senators will continue debate on the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which reauthorizes